middle of a South American leg, there was a bit of trouble. Some of the percussionists left. Pushing everyone to play in myriad styles had its limits, and they were replaced by Oscar Salas, a great Cuban drummer from Miami. He knew all the grooves from the various regions, so it wasn't as crazy a swap as it might have seemed. I realized that by adding a kit drummer, I could possibly make some music that fused the muscle of the funk and other styles with the lilt and swing of Latin grooves. I didn't forget that insight, and for my next record, uh-oh, I continued working with Salas and brought in George Porter Jr., the incredible bass player from the New Orleans band The Meters, to work with us. Much Latin music has a framework referred to as the clave, the key, which sometimes isn't even played or audibly articulated by any one instrument. What a beautiful concept that is. The most important part is invisible. The clave divides the measures into a three-beat and a two-beat pattern. For rockers, it's like a Bo Diddley beat, or the Buddy Holly song, Not Fade Away. Rock and roll didn't just come from country and blues mixing. There was Latin flavor in there, too. All the other parts, even the horns and the vocals, acknowledge the clave pattern and play with awareness of it, even if it isn't always audible. I heard an undercurrent of clave in the New Orleans funk that the meters made famous, which isn't surprising, given that city's waves of immigration from Cuba and Haiti. I thought George might help me find a way to create a hybrid out of Latin grooves and the funk he was accustomed to. By now, I was a little more familiar and comfortable with some of those grooves, and I felt I could let things move into uncharted and undefined territory. The rhythms didn't have to be restricted to only one genre. I didn't feel the need to have Milton or Jose determine how a song would go on this project. I more or less knew when I was writing the songs what the rhythms would be. I asked the Brazilian musician Tom Zé to do the arrangement for one of these songs, Something Ain't Right. The groove was based on an Ije Shah rhythm, which is usually played on cowbells and is often associated with Condomblé, the Afro-Brazilian religion. The groove is featured in a number of songs by artists from Salvador in Brazil's Bahia region, so I knew Tom would be familiar with it. He did some wonderful horn arrangements, but then he surprised us all by pulling out some big pens, minus the ink cartridges, and passing them out to the horn players. Each plastic pen holder had a thin little piece of plastic taped to the end, which functioned like a reed on a saxophone or clarinet. He had an arrangement all worked out for these guys to play the pens in one section of the song. It wasn't just noise, either. He had them play a hocket pattern, where each player plays just one note, quickly, and by deciding which players played what and when, an intricate pattern resulted. It was brilliant. Only Tom Zé would have had the nerve to ask these New York session guys to play big pens. Back to the beginning. In 1993, I wanted to write some songs that were more stripped down and to foreground their emotional content. I sensed that if the horns and strings and multiple percussionists were stripped away a bit, then what I was singing about might communicate more directly. Maybe I had been getting carried away with the window dressing. This emphasis on a thoroughly personal kind of writing was a big change for me, and it was possibly as much in response to a recent death in the family as it was musical evolution. I wanted to jettison everything, to start from scratch. I had heard Lucinda Williams and my friend Terry Allen, and I wanted to write songs that seemed to come from the heart as much as theirs did. Writing from experience went against the grain for me, but I wanted to let the lyric content dictate the music a little more. I had the concept, though not the same instrumentation, of traditional jazz combos in mind. Musically, I might have been inspired by the recent rise of the improvisation scene around the old knitting factory on Houston Street. I liked the idea of a small ensemble that listened to and played off each other and whatever the lead instrumentalist or vocalist was doing. So I wrote the songs, and instead of going straight into a recording studio, I put together a small band and performed them live in small clubs. The songs and their arrangements began to gel as they were tested in front of live audiences. The plan was to more or less record the band playing live in the studio relatively soon, as I had an image in my mind of classic small ensemble jazz recordings, with all the musicians more or less in a circle in the middle of a studio, a recreation of a club stage or bandstand. 
a situation in which everyone could hear and see everyone else. Very old school. I hoped that after having done some live shows, the band would know the arrangements and would play each song as if it were second nature, an old friend. It didn't work out that way. A band member was fired, producers came and went, and the whole plan fell to pieces. But the core group, the rhythm section of Todd Turkisher and Paul Sokolow, survived. The fairly stripped-down and bared soul aspect of that David Byrne record managed to allow me an escape from the musical cage I'd made for myself. I'd just recorded and toured with two very large Latin-inspired bands, and as much as I loved that experience, I could tell I was being branded as the rocker who had abandoned the cause. This new record did feel like a fresh start, even though it was born out of death and thwarted plans. The Studio Comes Home By the late 90s, new audio technology had emerged that allowed musicians to make professional-caliber recordings in their home studios. I bought a little mixing board and a couple of DA88 machines, which used Hi8 video cassettes to record eight tracks of good-quality digital audio. Other companies came out with other machines. The ADAT devices used Super VHS video cassettes, which were cheaper than the Hi8 cassettes, so more musicians adopted these for their home studios. They often synced the recorders to MIDI devices too, so as tape rolled, the sampler or other devices could be instructed to play predetermined notes or drum samples along with the recorded tracks. Cheap Atari computers sometimes entered the picture as well. They had software that allowed you to make visual representations of these MIDI sequences, which would then be used to trigger beats, typically samples and synthesizers. A whole song arrangement could be created without actually playing anything and without the need for recording tape. With this gear, one could see that the need for an expensive recording studio was beginning to become superfluous. Tech Talk These days, I work in a home studio, which I've carved out of a large room. There's no professional sound absorbent baffling here as there might be in a professional recording studio, but the floors of this former industrial building are concrete, so sound doesn't really escape and bother the neighbors. I put industrial carpet down, and one wall is covered with a kind of sound absorbent sheetrock, so I've taken some precautions to prevent sound leaking out. Unwanted sound coming in can be an issue too, but unless a truck backfires outside or an ambulance goes by, I found that it's perfectly adequate, at least for recording vocals and guitars. There's no space in my room for drums or anything like that, but for writing, playing one instrument, programming and singing, it's fine. There's a good tube microphone, another mic for a little old guitar amp, and a nice preamp and compressor to massage the mic signals before they become ones and zeros. That's pretty much all you need to find out where a song wants to go, and I found even enough to record real vocals and some guitar parts. Serial numbers and security codes for software are pinned to the wall, along with a Tammy Wynette poster. The computer is tucked under the desk. It's a mess, but amazingly, this is how we make records now. Home studio recordings can now sound as good as the big-name studios, and the lower-pressure and less expensive vibe in a home environment is often more conducive to creativity. Home recordings can be used for more than just demos. This idea is somewhat revolutionary as far as recording and composing music goes, and the repercussions of these baby steps will be huge further down the road. By 1996, I'd written some new songs, which arrived in a wide variety of styles, maybe because I wasn't writing for a specific band anymore. It seemed to me that the songs would best be interpreted by either different musical groups or by a single group pretending to be a variety of groups. For most of this record, I chose the former, deciding to record the material by inviting a lot of musicians and producers I liked to perform and record specific songs. Judicious casting of these collaborators, who would also be creative producers, helped me get the variety I felt the songs were asking for. I worked with Morchiba at their studio in London, with the Black Cat Orchestra in Seattle, with Devo at their studio in L.A., with Joe Galdo in Miami with Han Rowe at my New York apartment, and with Camus Murray Selly and Andres Levine at a brownstone in Brooklyn. 
I racked up lots of frequent flyer miles in the process, but most of the time I recorded economically, as each group had their own home-style studio. The record, Feelings, was necessarily done piecemeal, a few songs at a time, rather than in a concentrated burst. This, too, was new to me. The record evolved incrementally, and I had time to think about where it was going, or where it could go, as bits of each song, and eventually the variety of song styles, became audible. This more leisurely approach opened up the risk of my becoming indecisive, because I'd now have the option to postpone decisions regarding arrangements, or which vocal take was the good one. However, I hoped by this point in my life I'd internalized a fairly rigorous decision-making process, and that I wouldn't leave too many options dangling. Although it was technically possible to pile up tracks and delay making most decisions, I knew that I did have some intuitive sense of where a song wanted to go, so I would make a commitment quickly whenever possible. Though visiting all these folks where they lived became expensive, one could sense that a whole new era of music-making was beginning. With the advent of relatively cheap recording equipment with studio-quality sound, not only would anybody with two turntables and a microphone be making records, but everyone else would, too, in an incredible variety of styles and approaches, everywhere and anywhere. Musicians didn't have to migrate to the big cities with their expensive studios anymore. If they were careful, they wouldn't get themselves in hock to the record companies, either. As the costs of recording dropped precipitously, emerging musicians all over the world were increasingly on an equal footing with professional and well-funded Western pop-alt-urban musicians. Amateur musicians have always been equal as far as playing and writing go, but now more and more of them will be taken seriously. The quality of the recordings will be virtually indistinguishable. Homemade I first saw a performance of Ultima Ves, the Belgian dance theater group led by Wim van de Kuybus in Seattle in 1991. I was knocked out. They were inspiring and inventive right down to the sets. I think that piece featured a backdrop of thrift store dresses all stitched together. Vim, the dancers, and I spoke after their show, and we more or less kept in touch after that. Some years later, we talked about me doing music for a film that Vim had in mind, based on a Paul Bowles short story. The film didn't happen, but the project managed to get us back together. I went to Brussels, where I watched an early rehearsal of the piece that would become In Spite of Wishing and Wanting. I liked what I was seeing, and I offered to try to do as much music as possible, even the whole piece. I said that if Vim and company would like a trial, I would send them rough musical sketches as test material. By now I had started getting the hang of recording with my home gear all by myself. I did almost all the recording for this project in my apartment. We recorded the strings, horns, and a few other instruments in a studio, but those sessions were generally fairly short. This was another big step away from where I had begun, that horrible feeling of not being in control of how things sound, the clock ticking, being at the mercy of strangers. The mixing, however, was still done in a real studio. A fresh set of ears at that stage can be useful, as one tends to fall in love with parts for reasons that no one else can actually hear. In Spite of Wishing and Wanting, recorded in 1998, was the first record I owned completely, so I began to sell copies at my concerts. I didn't sell very many, but it was satisfying to know that even that limited income helped offset some of the production costs, and it was equally satisfying that I had done so much of it myself. A new kind of music economy was coming into being, mostly facilitated by new recording technology. The World Around Us I go about my business, mostly here in New York, traveling from Midtown to my office downtown and back up again. Often I go to Brooklyn, less often to Hoboken or Queens. I live in an industrial neighborhood, but there's a family that lives across the street from me, and a sweatshop across the street, too. There's a police station next door, and farther down the block is a halfway house, a Chinese-Mexican takeout, and an off-Broadway theater center. Sometimes it seems as if writing a group of songs is like getting groceries or doing the laundry, banal things I do more or less on a day-to-day -day basis. We deal with the issues involved in our mundane activities as they come up, and songwriting might be viewed similarly as the response to specific and even pedestrian needs. 
It might seem that in our day-to-day -day activities there is no overall plan at work, no consideration of where things are ultimately going. So too sometimes with the process of writing songs. Little decisions are made invisibly every minute, and the cumulative effect, and the often unspoken principles that have guided them, define what appears to be, in retrospect, a conscious plan, with an emotional center and compass. What begins as a random walk often ends up taking you somewhere. Somewhere that you later realize was exactly where you wanted to go. During the time I was writing the songs for the record that became Grown Backwards, there was love, anger, sadness, and frustration in my life. There were two wars, one begun out of revenge and the second seemingly to consolidate oil interests. Huge amounts of money were expended in what seemed to be obviously futile and counterproductive efforts that many felt wouldn't only bring death to many innocent people, but would end up making us, as a nation, less admired and certainly less safe, both physically and economically, for the foreseeable future. Along with many others, I felt angry, alienated even, and I did my best to stop the rush into the second conflict, but it was inevitable. It seemed like a misdirected legacy of a nation still stunned, hurt, reeling, a fighter ready to strike out at anything that could be accepted as an enemy. I blogged and began a campaign that resulted in full-page ads in the New York Times and Rolling Stone, urging restraint. But it was hopeless. Recent studies have shown that people ignore facts that contradict what they want to believe. Even smart people I knew, and many others I respected, were convincing themselves we had to invade. It made me feel like I didn't know my country and its people, or even my own friends anymore. How does one react and respond to that? I felt lost and adrift in my home. What kind of music would emerge from living with those feelings? These were not simply abstract political ideas. I felt angry and fucked up every day. Protest songs? They can express what folks are already feeling, what they sense but haven't yet been able to articulate, but they're maybe not the best way of changing people's minds, or even encouraging a second look. Ultimately, it's an act of hubris to try to do so. Maybe, I was thinking, songs and music should instead present an alternative path. Maybe songs can make an emotional case for inclusiveness and openness instead of just being critical. Maybe songs can be that possibility, rather than just a rational argument for it. I didn't know if I could write songs like that, but I was thinking about it. I'd had a wonderful time performing the songs from my previous record, Look Into the Eyeball, so my instinct was to refine that approach and continue down that road. Musician and composer Stephen Barber had rearranged many of the string parts for the touring group, and I suggested that he do all the new arrangements on this next record. The string players on those North American dates were from Austin, Texas, like Barber, so he could work with them and iron out any issues on the next set of songs before we went into the studio. In keeping with the idea of presenting an alternative to what I saw as lies and the ugliness we were being dragged into, this set of songs was even more lush than what I had recorded a couple of years earlier. The opera arias I had been hearing and had been moved by not long before were signposts, in a way. I sensed that I wanted something that could be unashamedly pretty and full-on, so I covered a couple of those tunes as a way of making that point. I didn't try to sing with a typical opera voice. I wanted the songs to be understood as the proto-pop songs they once were. People used to sing the catchy arias as they worked and played. Everyone knew them. The closest I came to making an actual protest song was a cover of a lamb chop tune, but the lyrics for that came from an Egyptian poem dating back thousands of years. A cry against violence and alienation. Not a lot has changed. I recorded my demos of the songs at home, and now I was getting more accustomed to yet another technology that once again changed the way I worked and recorded. Bulky machines were no longer needed to record demos. Even at home you could now record into your laptop or a regular desktop computer using music software and some fairly modest gear. I'd had a revelation about a year previously after I'd been asked by British DJs Express 2 to write a tune and sing over a track they had. I had previously admired their work, so I said I'd give it a try. They sent me a track which I loaded onto my laptop, a black plastic Mac G3. It took a little time to learn the software and the audio connections, 
but once I figured them out, I recorded a vocal on the laptop and sent it back to them. They then made further changes to the music under my vocal. Whereas at first what they sent me sounded vaguely talking heads-like, hence their desire to approach me, I suspected. Now it was the same song, same tempo, same key, but as a stripped-down house track. The resulting song, Lazy, was released to club DJs in the UK and ever so gradually became hugely popular. In the UK and anywhere but in the United States, club songs can cross over and become radio hits. I was delighted, and no one ever complained that the vocal sounded like it had been recorded on a laptop. The homemade recording had quietly passed the litmus test. Now I knew that I didn't have to use real recording studios for my work unless I was working with a sizable group of musicians, or with strings or live drums. Not only were the demos for my newer songs all recorded at home, as they had been for years, but now various vocals, instruments, and electronic sounds could all be recorded at home too, often serving as the framework over which additional instruments were recorded in real studios. This didn't signal the end of the recording studio, lots of artists still use them exclusively, but most emerging artists do exactly what I've been doing. They use studios more sparingly than bands used to, and only when the need arises. The big studio era has ended. Most of the ones in New York have closed down. Although, in a weird reversal, the few that are left are now booked solid. There are still times when I need to use a fully equipped studio for a project, but increasingly we keep the costs down by doing much of the initial work at home. We still need the studios, we'd be in trouble if they all vanished, but we're not held captive by their costs and the prevailing recording orthodoxies anymore. These changes have had a pretty big financial impact on the recording process. The cost of making records can now be so low, if you don't count the rare transatlantic flights I took for my recent record with Brian Eno, of course, that average musicians can pay for it out of their own pockets. This means that when the time comes to think about a distribution arrangement, you aren't beholden to anyone. You don't come to the table already in debt. In effect, the ease and facility of home recording made me rethink how one might survive in the music business, given the ongoing collapse of the old system. It's sad that just as it has gotten easier for anyone to make a record exactly in the way they envision, the traditional means of selling and distributing music are becoming less viable. Increasingly, recordings are the loss leaders for merchandise, live performance tickets, and licensing opportunities. Recording, which used to be basically the most important thing one did as a professional musician, is increasingly just a part of a larger package. That doesn't mean everyone except a few pop stars will stop recording, but it does mean that the way a musician survives is no longer primarily via sales of recordings. The era when all the various ways in which we hear and enjoy music are secondary to the most well-known recording of that music might be over. We soon might begin to view recordings as they were perceived when they came into being, as fixed versions of compositions, but not as the only or even the primary way the music is supposed to sound. Chapter 6 Collaborations The online music magazine Pitchfork once wrote that I would collaborate with anyone for a bag of Doritos. This wasn't intended as a compliment, though to be honest, it's not that far from the truth. Contrary to their insinuation, I am fairly picky about who I collaborate with, but I'm also willing to work with people you might not expect me to. I'll risk disaster because the creative rewards of a successful collaboration are great. I've been doing it my whole life. I discovered early on that collaborating is a vital part of music's essence and an aid to creativity. Unless you're a solo folk singer or a laptop jockey, live performance usually involves playing with other musicians. A successful ensemble inevitably requires a certain amount of push and pull and creative compromise. Although there's usually a hierarchy and often assigned parts and arrangements, the idiosyncrasies of each player's interpretations make the sound of every group unique. And when an ensemble is also involved in the creation and or recording of a piece of music, those individual expressive tendencies are that much more apparent. Even if I wrote a song myself, then played and sang it for Talking Heads or some other group of musicians on my guitar, their individual interpretations 
abilities, and ensemble skills would make their collective version and performance of that song different from anyone else's. Players inevitably add things that the songwriter might not have thought of, so you often end up with something very different from what a solo musician would have arrived at on his own. Sometimes this new thing is restricted by the player's abilities and sensibilities, but rather than being a liability, these restrictions can actually be liberating. Odd that I'm more focused on the limitations than the fact that some musicians might be able to play something better than anyone else. One adjusts to both the limitations and particular talents of a given set of musicians. Writers and composers learn to anticipate what is and is not likely to happen musically. Over time, you internalize the tendencies and playing approaches of your fellow players, and after a while, you don't even consider writing certain parts or in certain styles, because the musicians you're working with wouldn't naturally go that way. You play to their strengths. You don't try to reverse the river or get it to jump over a mountain. You harness its flow and energy to gently urge that it join up with other tributaries. One might assume that having better players with a higher level of musicianship means that a composer can be more adaptable, free, and wide-ranging in what he writes. One might also assume that this would be a good thing, but the conventional hierarchy of musical skills is deceptive. Classically trained players often can't get the feel of what may seem like a simple pop or funk tune, and a great rock drummer may play in time, but never learn to swing. It's not that technical abilities are beyond some players, it's more the sharpening of the ear and brain that happens over time. We learn to hear, or not hear, certain things, different things. The classical players who think all popular music is simple tend not to hear the nuances involved, so naturally they can't play very well in that style. Simplicity is a kind of transparency in which subtle nuances can have outsized effects. When everything is visible and appears to be dumb, that's when the details take on larger meanings. There's really no hierarchy in music. Good musicians of any given style are no better or worse than good musicians of another. Players should be viewed as existing across a spectrum of styles and approaches, rather than being ranked. If you follow this reasoning to the end, then every musician is great, a virtuoso, a maestro, if only they could find the music that's right for them, their personal slot in the spectrum. I'm not sure I'm actually willing to go that far, but there may be a little bit of truth in the idea. Many songwriters write in teams, Lennon and McCartney, Jagger and Richards, Bacharach and David, Lieber and Stoller, Holland, Dozier, Holland, Jobim and G. Morais, Rogers and Hammerstein. One person might write the words and the other the music, which is the division of labor I've often followed in my own collaborations. But just as often, the division of labor is less clear. Ideas may get passed back and forth. Collaborators may work on specific sections of a song. With some songwriting teams, the equality between the collaborators is less than obvious, and it can seem as though one of the partners was more of an instigator on a particular song than the other. But the fact that there have been so many of these teams, and that they achieved such heights, seems significant. There are obvious benefits to working in a team. Your weaker ideas might get corrected. My original concept for Psycho Killer was to play against type and do it as a ballad, but when the other band members joined in, it took a more energetic direction, which proved to be popular with our audience. There's a good chance you might be inspired by ideas that originate outside yourself. Music written by teams makes the authorship of a piece indistinct. Could it be that when hearing a song written by a team, a listener can sense that they aren't hearing an expression of a solitary individual's pain or joy, but that of a virtual conjoined person? Can we tell that an individual singer might actually represent a collective, that he might have multiple identities? Does that make the sentiments expressed more poetically ambiguous and therefore more potentially universal? Can eliminating some portion of the authorial voice make a piece of music more accessible and the singer more empathetic? Playing well with others Many of my songs were written without songwriting partners. Are they less good than the ones where the job was split, or where a partner modified, added to, or rejected my ideas, or I theirs? I can't answer that. But certainly musical partnerships have often led me to places I might not otherwise have gone. 
With Talking Heads, we always collaborated on the interpretation, realization, and performance of the music, even if I brought a finished song to the table. We all had similar things in our record collections. OJ's, Stooges, James Brown, Roxy Music, Serge Gainsbourg, King Tubby. So regardless of the limitations imposed by our playing abilities, there was another set of limitations. Good ones, we felt, shaped by our collective musical tastes. As much as we wanted to sound like something entirely new, we communicated by referencing music that we all loved. An early Talking Heads song, The Book I Read, had a middle section that to my ears sounded like Casey and the Sunshine Band, whom I liked. So that reference was, for us, a good thing. No one else seemed to hear it, though. Perhaps my yelping vocal and other factors obscured those influences and touchstones? Though we may have combined those influences in a skewed and mangled manner, we could hear bits of the music that had preceded us all over our material. In the absence of any formal training, this mostly unspoken set of references was how we communicated. It's probably what made communication and collaboration possible for us in the first place. After some years of more or less traditional songwriting process, words and music completed by one person, or finished words by one set to music by another, Talking Heads evolved a kind of collaborative music writing system based on collective improvisations. Sometimes these jams would happen in a rehearsal loft. The song Life During Wartime began as a one-chord jam with no lyrics based on a riff I'd brought in, which was wedded to a second chord that became the chorus. Sometimes these improvisations and jams wouldn't happen until we were in a recording studio. In such instances, the writing and recording were simultaneous. Jazz players, of course, respond fluently to one another by improvising in their live performances and in their recordings. We, however, were fairly minimal about what we would contribute. The aim of our improvising, probably inspired by our R&B heroes, was for each person to find a part, a riff, or even just a freaky honking accent, and then stick with it, repeating it over and over. So by improvisation, I don't mean long meandering guitar solos, quite the opposite. Ours were more about hunting and pecking with the aim of finding short, sonic, modular pieces. These pieces were intended to interlock with whatever was already there, so the period of actual improvisation would be short. It would end as soon as a satisfactory segment was found. Then we would shape those accumulated results into something resembling a song structure. In this system, one person's response to another's contribution could shift the whole piece in a radically different direction, harmonically, texturally, or rhythmically. Pleasantly unexpected surprises would occur, but just as often they could seem like rude and arrogant impositions that missed the significance and integrity of the pre-existing material. The guitarist Robert Fripp added a part to the Talking Heads song E. Zimbra, overdubbing a weird harmonic ostinato that he played through the whole song. The whole song. Initially that destroyed the song, and seemed like someone was being willfully perverse. But as it turned out, when used sparingly, it added a little psychedelic swirl to our Afro-pop groove, which put everything in a new perspective. Is this disruption and destruction a risk worth taking? Did the piece just get ruined, or did it really need to get radically rethought in order to go somewhere new and exciting? You can't be too precious in this process. For us, this method resulted in music in which the authorship was to some extent shared among a whole group of people, though I still usually wrote the vocal melody and eventually the words. The musical bed was, in these instances, very much collaborative. Notation and Communication There are not a lot of languages for describing and passing on music outside of traditional notation, and even that method, though almost universally accepted, sacrifices a lot. The same piece of written music can sound completely different depending on who plays it. If Mozart could have described in notation exactly how he intended every aspect of his compositions to sound, there would be no need for multiple interpretations. When musicians play together and record, they come up with terms, real and invented, to try to communicate musical nuance. Funkier, more legato, more holes and spaces, less pretty, spikier, simpler, pushed hard, more laid back. I've said all those things when trying to describe a musical direction, 
or the feel I was looking for. Some composers resort to metaphors and analogies. You could use food, sex, texture, or visual metaphors. I've heard that Joni Mitchell described the kind of playing she wanted by naming colors. Then there's the shorthand of referring to other recordings, as Talking Heads did. So, interpreting a written score, reading music notation, is itself a form of collaboration. The performer is remaking, and in some ways rewriting the piece every time he plays it. The vagueness and ambiguities of notation allow for this, and it's not entirely a bad thing. A lot of music stays relevant thanks to the opportunities for liberal interpretation by new artists. To encourage this kind of collaboration, to make the interpretive aspect more overt, some composers have written their pieces as graphic scores. This is a way of granting a generous degree of freedom in the interpretation of their work, while simultaneously suggesting and delimiting the organization, shape, and texture of their pieces across time. A graphic score may look like nothing more than lines and squiggles on a page, with few reference points on how to interpret it. This approach isn't as crazy as it might seem. While these scores don't specify which notes to play, they do suggest higher or lower pitches as the lines wander up and down, and they visually express how the players are to relate to one another. This type of score views music as a set of organizing principles rather than a strict hierarchy. The latter viewpoint usually ends up with melody at the top of the pile. It's an alternative to the privileged position melody is usually given. It's about texture, patterns, and interrelationships. Robert Ferris Thompson, a professor of art at Yale, pointed out that once you let yourself see things this way, lots of things become musical scores, although they might never have been intended to be played. He argued that in a lot of African weaving, one can sense a rhythm. The repetition in these fabrics doesn't consist of a simple looping of mirror images and patterns. Rather, modular parts recombine, shift position, and interact over and over with one another, aligning in different ways over time, recombinant. They're scores for a funky minimalist symphony. This musical metaphor implies a kind of collaboration as well. While each color module in a quilt or textile is essential, no one part defines the whole the way we might define many Western compositions by their dominant melody. Western compositions can often be picked out, the melodies at least, with one finger on a piano. How would one pick out the score in an African textile in that way? There's no dominant motif or top line, though that doesn't stop it from having a distinct identity. It's a neural network, a personality, a city, the Internet. Think of an African weaving. Think of an American quilt. One was created in the old world, one in the new. There are musical breaks, fugues and stanzas, inversions and recapitulations here. It's not that crazy to believe that some part of the vast African musical sensibility was carried across the oceans and reconstructed using visual means, that these fabrics functioned as a structural mnemonic aid. Perhaps they functioned as metaphors for how music could be organized, which is also a lesson that can be applied to other parts of life. I'm not suggesting that musicians sat down and played a quilt, but some of the organizing sensibility might have been kept alive and transmitted by such means. If music can be regarded as an organizing principle, and in this case one that places equal weight on melody, rhythm, texture, and harmony, then we start to see metaphors everywhere we look. All kinds of natural phenomena are musical, and I don't mean they make sounds, but rather that they organize themselves, and patterns become evident. Forms and themes arise, express themselves, repeat, mutate, and then become submerged again. The daily street ballet that Jane Jacobs wrote about and the hustle and bustle of an outdoor market are each a kind of music. Stars, bugs, running water, the chaotic tangle of vegetation. Musicians playing together find a kind of symbiotic relationship between one another and an interplay between their parts so that the interlocking and interweaving create a sonic fabric. How does this work? Let me share a few very different examples. Standing on the Shoulders of Giants A recent record of mine, Everything That Happens Will Happen Today, was pretty typical as far as the collaborative process goes. Brian Eno, 
whom I hadn't worked with in more than 25 years, had a slew of largely instrumental tracks on his shelf that seemed to want to become songs rather than ambient tracks or film scores, but he was unhappy with his own attempts at completing them. He didn't have much to lose by passing them to me. They were just gathering dust, although I was told one did get passed to Coldplay. So unless I did something horrendous, which we agreed he could veto, it was a win-win situation. As might be obvious by now, most contemporary collaborations, at least the ones I do, don't take place face-to-face -face anymore. They're the result of digital music files being shuttled back and forth via email or other internet-based file transfer formats. Does something get lost when the live aspect of collaboration disappears? Simple miscommunication can certainly spiral out of control without the subtle signals we send through our facial expressions and body language. And the encouragement, coaching, hyping, and prodding that tends to happen in person, why not try this, or that's great, but what if you play it on a different instrument, may not happen, and certainly not as spontaneously. That said, there are big advantages to the new protocol. If I can use a ping-pong analogy, with internet exchanges, one can wait overnight or longer to return the serve, planning out what edition might work best, with no pressure to come up with something brilliant on the spot. The breathing space is a luxury you don't have when your collaborator is looking over your shoulder. From Eno's studio in London, I was sent stereo mixes of his musical ideas, to which I added my vocal melodies and, eventually, lyrics without altering his music beds in the least. Sometimes this made for some odd lyrical structures. On the song The River, Brian had a portion of what became a verse repeat quite a few times, as if the song had gotten stuck and couldn't move on. I accepted the challenge to write without straightening this peculiarity out. I knew that if it could be made to work, this unexpected variation in structure might prevent the song from being too predictable. It worked, and it added a kind of tension as it delayed the musical resolution that came at the ends of verses. But just as often as I slightly restructured his songs to bring them closer to a traditional form, repeating a section to create a place where a second verse could go, or nominating a larger sounding section as a chorus, and then I might copy that too in order to make it recur again later in the song. However, I never even thought about requesting any substantial musical changes in the tracks, like key changes, or changes in groove or instrumentation. The unwritten rule in these remote collaborations is, for me, leave the other person's stuff alone as much as you possibly can. You work with what you're given, and don't try to imagine it as something other than what it is. Accepting that half the creative decision-making has already been done has the effect of bypassing a lot of endless branching, not to mention a lot of waffling and worrying. I didn't ever have to think about what direction to take musically. That train had already left the station, and my job was to see where it wanted to go. This restriction on creative freedom turns out, as usual, to be a great blessing. Complete freedom is as much a curse as boon. Freedom within strict and well-defined confines is, to me, ideal. I listened to Eno's instrumental tracks on and off, trying to get a sense of the story the music was trying to tell. These tracks weren't ambient, as one might have expected from him, and I sensed that song structures might emerge with just a little coaxing. Emergence is a popular term these days, but it almost perfectly evokes how musicians and songwriters cultivate the latent potential of a humble musical kernel. That's why writers and musicians often say they feel only partially responsible for the creation of the works they've nurtured. They claim that the song, painting, dance piece, or words they're working on, tells them what kind of thing it wants to become. But when that thing that's speaking to you originated with someone else, it's sometimes even more of a puzzle. Does it necessarily speak the same language as you? Is it sincere? Could their version be ironic instead? Is that clunky section supposed to be funny, or should I try to fix it? Do they want it to remain as beautiful and pretty as it seems? Or would a little grit help? Well. I didn't exactly know at first what to make of Eno's tracks. Maybe I had some trepidation working in the shadow of Bush of Ghosts, which after thirty years had amassed kind of a weighty reputation. I knew we couldn't let ourselves do a Bush of Ghosts, too. Music history is as much an influence on composition as anything else. After living with the tracks for almost a year, I eventually wrote Eno back. 
I told him the music inspired a sort of folk electronic gospel feeling and suggested that my words and tunes might reflect this, and did that direction seem okay? Brian had discovered his love of gospel music years ago, and as he eventually wrote in the liner notes to Everything That Happens, Surrender to His Will by Reverend Maceo Woods and the Christian Tabernacle Choir was the first gospel song I ever really responded to. I heard it on a distant South American radio station whilst in Compass Point, Nassau, working with Talking Heads on the album more songs about buildings and food. Spending time with them and becoming aware of their musical interests opened my ears to genres and styles I hadn't really noticed up to that point, including gospel. So it's fitting that the circle should close with this record. As a foreigner in New York, where I ended up shortly after recording more songs, I was surprised by how little attention Americans gave to their own great indigenous music. It was even slightly uncool as though the endorsement of gospel necessarily implied support of its associated religious framework. Thanks to Reverend Woods, however, I began to see gospel music as conveying the act of surrender more than the act of worship. And this, of course, intrigued me, and has informed my music ever since. Perhaps it's the reason I use modes and chords that are easy to follow and harmonize with. I want music to be inviting, to offer the listener a place inside it. Though my trajectory as I described it to him was vague, Eno seemed fine with it, so I tacked the first song, which I think he had given the working title, and suddenly. I'd finished reading Dave Egger's book, What is the What?, which is about a young man named Valentino Achak Deng and his hallucinatory and horrific journey from his destroyed village in South Sudan to Atlanta, Georgia, and beyond. Valentino's story was harrowing, but also beautiful, uplifting, and at times even funny, I think I may have been under the spell of his story when I sat down in front of my microphone. The result was one fine day. I sang a few harmonies in the choruses to make it sound fuller and emailed the result to Eno. We were both thrilled. What the song, the whole album, really was to become was fully articulated here in this first piece. The words I had gravitated toward indeed had some biblical allusions. That would be the gospel connection I'd mentioned. But nothing too overt we agreed to continue with the project. I realized that the harmonic foundations of some of the tracks Eno had sent were simple, much like traditional folk, country, or old-school gospel songs, before those styles evolved to become as sophisticated as some are today. Brian's chord structures were, in their apparent musical plainness, unlike anything I would have chosen myself. My music geek side wouldn't have allowed me to write a song with essentially just three major chords in it, not anymore. I thought I was supposed to have outgrown that. However, the fact that this almost naive directness was someone else's idea meant I could excuse myself. I could blame someone else, which made it okay. This pushed me in a new, old direction, which of course was a good thing. The lyrical challenge was more emotional than technical. How to respond to these harmonically simple, though texturally complex foundations, and write heartfelt words without drawing on the clichés that such chords and structures might bring to mind. I was surprised that the results that began to emerge were often hopeful and positive, even though some lyrics describe exploding cars, war, and similarly ominous scenarios. There were some remnants of our previous work in these songs, no surprise there, but something new emerged as well. Where did this new sanguine and heartening tone come from, particularly in those troubled times? Every day, as the songs were emerging, I continued to be appalled by the cynical maneuvers of Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Karl Rove, Tony Blair, and all the rest, as well as the disappointingly compliant manner in which they were reported by the media. By then, McCain was running for president, and his minders had picked Sarah Palin to be his running mate, a move that was taken surprisingly seriously. A black man was running against them, a man who wrote inspiring speeches and held out a tiny bit of hope for some of us, though I think all politicians possess some amount of poison in their system. This was the political context in which I wrote these songs, and I found that my response was similar to that expressed on my previous solo records. Hope and humanity as a force to counter cynicism and greed. Some of the lyrics and the plaintive melodies I came up with were a response to what I sensed was already there, hinted at but buried deep in Eno's music. 
I wanted to find a reason not to be cynical, to have some faith even when nothing around me seemed to justify it. Writing and singing seemed to be an attempt at a kind of musical self-healing. Dream World Red Hot, the AIDS charity organization founded in 1989, produces a series of benefit records in which they initiate collaborations between disparate musicians. Although he's not Portuguese, it was suggested in 1999 that the Brazilian composer and singer Caetano Velazu and I collaborate on a song for their Red Hot in Lisbon collection. I'm a huge fan of Velazu's, and we'd met a few times, so the idea of working together wasn't too insane. I happened to have a song in progress on which I was using a percussion loop taken from one of his songs, an aid in the writing process that I would typically replace with real musicians somewhere down the line. Though some composers appear to be able to write over forms they hear in their heads, I find that when the rhythms I'm writing over are audible and a little complex, when they swing a bit, then actually hearing them keeps me on the rails as far as the metric of potential melodic vocal lines. That I'd been writing over a loop from one of Velazu's songs meant that, in a sense, we'd already started collaborating, and it made Red Hot's invitation seem fortuitous. I already had a structure, too. Guitar chords that had been inspired by a combination of the American standards and Brazilian songs I'd been learning from songbooks. They didn't sound much like rock chords. I also had a melody, but only a few words. The lyric fragments I'd come up with were about a girl who spent all her time in nightclubs and discos, never really connecting with what most of us call daily life. Some called her a bad girl, but the lyrics defended her, saying there was nothing wrong with innocent, sensual pleasure. Some of the lyrics reminded me of Neil Young, at least the way they fit with the melody, though I doubt anyone else noticed that. The piece had shape, but was unfinished when I sent it to Velazu. He bounced back with additional lyrics in Portuguese, but they were about Carmen Miranda. Outside of Brazil, most people think of her as the Brazilian with fruit on her head who went Hollywood. But Miranda was actually Portuguese, not Brazilian, so now we had a little Lisbon, or at least Portugal, connection after all. After Miranda's appearances in so many campy Hollywood movies, some people began to disparage her. She had previously been a respected and popular singer in Brazil. Her Hollywood manifestation was, for them, both something to be proud of and also somewhat dubious and confusing. Furthermore, her stage attire and even the big headdresses alluded to Afro-Brazilian culture. They mimicked, in a way that Brazilians would appreciate, the women of Condomblé, the Afro-Brazilian religion. So she represented more than just samba. There was some deeply profound shit secreted in those headdresses, and Velazu alluded to it obliquely in his lyrics. So we had my words talking about one girl and his referencing another, and they kind of worked together, juxtaposed. I rarely manage to collaborate on lyrics. I tend to mark my boundary as being between words and music, but maybe because we were also intercutting languages, it seemed natural. Starting with words. Other people's words. In 2005, I began working on a disco musical project for the theater, collaborating with Norman Cook, a.k.a. DJ Fatboy Slim, about former First Lady of the Philippines, Imelda Marcos. Since it was based on a historical figure, I tried something I hadn't done in a very long time. I began the writing process with the words. While I was researching the characters in the period, I highlighted noteworthy and memorable passages and then assembled files of anecdotes, quotes from speeches, interviews, and conversations. I began to group these materials into potential episodes and plot points, which would ultimately link up to tell a story. The characters, all real people, and the story had precedence in this project, and each episode and its song had to convey something specific, so prioritizing the text made sense. To begin writing a song, I would lay out all my notes on each scene, the quotes and oral testimony of Imelda Marcos and her family, for example, and simply try singing them, sometimes over chords I played simultaneously on guitar, and sometimes over Cook's grooves. In my notes, I had kept track of the many peculiar, emotionally loaded, alliterative, repetitious, and original phrases that Imelda, her husband Ferdinand, and others were supposed to have said. For a songwriter, these things were a godsend. They were halfway to being lyrics already. 
I couldn't have made them up, and of course they always perfectly encapsulated what the people were thinking and feeling, or at least what they wanted the world to believe that they were thinking and feeling. Reading that Imelda had said she wanted the words, Here Lies Love, inscribed on her tombstone, was like being handed the title of the musical on a platter. Not only did it epitomize the fact that she often viewed herself as having unselfishly offered love and sacrificed herself for the Philippine people, but it gave me an opportunity to have her reflect on her life and accomplishments, along with some subtle reposts she would throw at her detractors. Other people have used such found texts as well. For example, Peter Sellers used congressional testimony as source material for the libretto of John Adams's opera about Robert Oppenheimer and the bomb, Dr. Atomic. Using these texts as source material for lyrics seemed to absolve me, at least in my own mind, of some responsibility for what the characters were saying or singing in this piece. I could use a lyric that was, for example, way more sentimental or corny than anything I would ever have allowed myself to write, and it was okay because it was the character saying it, not me. In the song Here Lies Love, Imelda sings, The most important things are love and beauty, which is a quote from a speech she made. If I sang those lyrics, people would assume I was being ironic, but to have them come out of the character's mouth rings true. I found that the same thing applied musically. There were musical references, disco beats or, to my ears, a Kenny Rogers reference, and other genre quotations that were okay to include because they were what a character would have used as a vehicle for their feelings, if one imagined them being able to express themselves in song. Who wouldn't want to be able to put on the voice of Sharon Jones to express the jaw-dropping decadence, sense of fun and abandon of first visiting a major dance club. Lastly, to me the words just seemed truer knowing that they were what someone actually said, that I didn't put words in their mouths. Was this process of lyric writing a sort of collaboration with the past? Although I reordered most of these found phrases, repeated some, and bent others to help them fit meter and rhyme, I tried to make my own writing embody the intentions of my invisible collaborators. Here Lies Love is a collaboration that is, like the score I did with Twyla Tharp, and like the film music I've done over the years, a collaboration not so much with another musician, but rather with the theatrical form itself, not to diminish Norm's contribution one bit. It's the stage production, not a person that needs my music to accomplish specific dramatic, emotional, or rhythmic ends. There are exigencies and constraints in this kind of collaboration that make it very different from working alone or with another musician. I don't know if stage, TV, and film composers think of themselves as collaborating with the directors, the medium, or the writers, but sometimes music and visuals work together so seamlessly that it's hard to imagine a theatrical work or a film without its score, and vice versa. Some film and stage music evokes the whole story, the characters and the visuals every time one hears them. The constraints in these kinds of collaborations aren't the tastes and proclivities of the other musician or songwriter, but the needs of the larger piece and its characters. A book called People Power, The Philippine Revolution of 1986, an eyewitness history, about the four days of the People Power Revolution, was hugely helpful to me while I was working on Here Lies Love. It included not only testimony from generals, priests, and public figures, but the moving words of ordinary individuals, the real meat and potatoes of that movement. As in Tahrir Square, it was the presence of ordinary folks, manifesting daily, thousands and thousands of them, that tipped the scales in the Philippines. Their words allowed me to view events through their eyes, the mundane mixed with the sublime, and they made it come alive for me. Having visited Manila, I could picture the neighborhoods, the houses and streets these people described, the way their daily lives intersected with historical events. People tended to mention very specific details that swirled around and were folded into the onward rush of history. Joggers out for a morning run as tanks appeared on the streets. Going out for coffee to find hundreds of thousands gathered around the corner from your home. Coincidentally, at this time I was also reading a book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell, about the almost utopian social transformations that sometimes emerge out of disasters and revolutions, citizens spontaneously and selflessly helping one another after traumatic events such as the San Francisco and Mexico earthquakes, the London Blitz, and the 9-11 attacks. 
All these events have in common a magical and all too brief moment when class and other social differences vanish and a common humanity becomes evident. These moments often last only a few days, but they have a profound and lasting impact on the participants who witness a door cracked open a little to reveal a better world, one whose existence they never forget. The Filipino People Power Revolution looked to me like one of those moments, and I hoped that a tiny bit of that feeling could be captured in songs and scenes. A theatrical piece that had previously struck me as a tragedy might also have a kind of happy and even inspirational ending, not simply by describing the overthrow of one dictator and his wife, but because the humanity of a people might allow itself to be revealed. I'm not sure Here Lies Love will be a successful theater piece, creatively or commercially, but being able to write songs in which I function as the conduit for the feelings and thoughts of others was hugely liberating and, well, easier than I thought. It's writing to order, but without too much vagueness in the intention, as the sources, the people, are as real as what happened. Emergent Storytelling Writing words to fit an existing melody and meter, as I did on Everything That Happens and many other records, is something anyone who writes in rhyme does naturally and intuitively. Every rapper improvises or composes to a meter, for example. I had been encouraged to make this process, which is usually internalized, more explicit when I was writing the words for Remain in Light. That was the first time I tackled a whole record of lyrics this way. I found that, remarkably, solving the puzzle of making words and phrases fit existing structures often resulted, somewhat surprisingly, in words that have an emotional consistency, and sometimes even a narrative thread, even though those aspects of the text weren't planned ahead of time. How does this happen? With Remain in Light, and even before that, I would look for words that fit pre-existing melodic fragments that I or others had come up with. After filling lots of pages with non-sequiturs, I would scan them to see if a lyrically resonant group emerged. Phrases that would hint at the beginning of an actual subject often seemed to want to emerge. This might seem magical, claiming that a text wants to come into being, and we've heard this said before, but it's true. When some phrases, even if collected almost at random, begin to resonate together and appear to be talking about the same thing, it's tempting to claim they have a life of their own. The lyrics may have begun as gibberish, but often, though not always, a story in the broadest sense emerges. Emergent storytelling, one might say. But at times, words can be a dangerous addition to music. They can pin it down. Words imply that the music is about what the words say literally, and nothing more. If done poorly, they can destroy the pleasant ambiguity that constitutes much of the reason we love music. That ambiguity allows listeners to psychologically tailor a song to suit their needs, sensibilities, and situations, but words can limit that, too. There are plenty of beautiful pieces of music that I can't listen to because they've been ruined by bad words, my own and others. In Beyoncé's song, Irreplaceable, she rhymes minute with minute, and I cringe every time I hear it, partly because by that point I'm singing along. On my own song, Astronaut, I wrap up with the line, Feel like I'm an astronaut, which seems like the dumbest metaphor for alienation ever. Ugh. So I begin by improvising a melody over the music. I do this by singing nonsense syllables, but with weirdly inappropriate passion, given that I'm not saying anything. Once I have a wordless melody and a vocal arrangement that my collaborators, if there are any, and I like, I'll begin to transcribe that gibberish as if it were real words. I'll listen carefully to the meaningless vowels and consonants on the recording, and I'll try to understand what that guy, me, emoting so forcefully but inscrutably, is actually saying. It's like a forensic exercise. I'll follow the sound of the nonsense syllables as closely as possible. If a melodic phrase of gibberish ends on a high oo sound, then I'll transcribe that, and in selecting actual words, I'll try to choose one that ends in that syllable, or as close to it as I can get. So the transcription process often ends with a page of real words, still fairly random, that sound just like the gibberish. I do that because the difference between an o and an a, ah, and a b and a th sound is, I assume, integral to the emotion that the story wants to express. 
I want to stay true to that unconscious, inarticulate intention. Admittedly, that content has no narrative, or might make no literal sense yet, but it's in there. I can hear it. I can feel it. My job at this stage is to find words that acknowledge and adhere to the sonic and emotional qualities, rather than to ignore and possibly destroy them. Part of what makes words work in a song is how they sound to the ear and feel on the tongue. If they feel right physiologically, if the tongue of the singer and the mirror neurons of the listener resonate with the delicious appropriateness of the words coming out, then that will inevitably trump literal sense, although literal sense doesn't hurt. If recent neurological hypotheses regarding mirror neurons are correct, then one could say that we empathetically sing, with both our minds and the neurons that trigger our vocal and diaphragm muscles, when we hear and see someone else singing. In this sense, Watching a performance and listening to music is always a participatory activity. The act of putting words down on paper is certainly part of songwriting, but the proof is in seeing how it feels when it's sung. If the sound is untrue, the listener can tell. I try not to prejudge anything that occurs to me at this point in the writing process. I never know if something that sounds stupid at first will, in some soon-to-emerge lyrical context, make the whole thing shine. So no matter how many pages get filled up, I try to turn off the internal sensor. Sometimes sitting at a desk trying to force this doesn't work. I never have writer's block exactly, but sometimes things do slow down. At those times I ask myself if my conscious mind might be thinking too much, and it's exactly at this point that I most want and need surprises and weirdness from the depths. Some techniques help in that regard. For instance, I'll carry a micro-recorder and go jogging on the west side, recording phrases that match the song's meter as they occur to me. On the rare occasion that I'm driving a car, I can do the same thing. Are there laws against driving and songwriting? Basically, anything, driving, jogging, swimming, cooking, cycling, that occupies part of the conscious mind and distracts it, works. The idea is to allow the thonic material the freedom it needs to gurgle up, to distract the gatekeepers. Sometimes just a verse, or even a phrase or two, will resonate and be sufficient, and that's enough to unlock the whole thing. From there on, it becomes more like fill-in-the-blank conventional puzzle solving. This particular writing process could also be viewed as a collaboration. A collaboration with oneself, with one's subconscious as well as the collective unconscious, as Jung would put it. As in dreams, it often seems as if a hidden part of oneself... A doppelganger is attempting to communicate, to impart some important information. When we write, we access different aspects of ourselves, different characters, different parts of our brains and hearts. And then, when they've each had their say, we mentally switch hats, step back from accessing our myriad selves, and take a more distanced and critical view of what we've done. Don't we always work by editing and structuring the outpouring of our many selves? Isn't the end product the result of two or more sides of ourselves working with one another? We've often heard this process described by creative folks as channeling, or just as often people refer to themselves as a conduit for some force that speaks through them. I suspect that the outside entity, the god, the alien, the source, is a part of oneself, and that this kind of creation is about learning how to listen to and collaborate with it. Chapter 7 Business and Finances Distribution and Survival Options for Musical Artists After the studio work is finished, after the record has been mixed and pressed, how does a song or album get from the composer or the performer to the listener? How important is that? How important is getting one's work out to the public? Should that even really matter to a creative artist? Would I make music if no one were listening? If I were a hermit and lived on a mountaintop like a bearded guy in a cartoon, would I take the time to write a song? Many visual artists whose work I love, like Henry Darger, Gordon Carter, and James Castle, never shared their art. They worked ceaselessly and hoarded their creations, which were discovered only after they died or moved out of their apartments. Could I do that? Why would I? Don't we want some validation, respect, feedback? Come to think of it, 
I might do it. In fact, I did, when I was in high school puttering around with those tape loops and splicing. I think those experiments were witnessed by exactly one friend. However, an audience of one is not zero. Still, making music is its own reward. It feels good and can be a therapeutic outlet. Maybe that's why so many people work hard in music for no money or public recognition at all. In Ireland and elsewhere, amateurs play well-known songs in pubs, and their ambition doesn't stretch beyond the door. They are getting recognition, or humiliation, within their village, though. In North America, families used to gather around the piano in the parlor. Any monetary remuneration that might have accrued from these concerts was secondary. To be honest, even tooling around with tapes in high school, I think I imagined that someone, somehow, might hear my music one day. Maybe not those particular experiments, but I imagined that they might be the baby steps that would allow my more mature expressions to come into being and eventually reach others. Could I have unconsciously had such a long-range plan? I have continued to make plenty of music, often with no clear goal in sight, but I guess somewhere in the back of my mind, I believe that the aimless wandering down a meandering path will surely lead to some, well-deserved in my mind, reward down the road. There's a kind of unjustified faith involved here. Is the satisfaction that comes from public recognition, however small, however fleeting, a driving force for the creative act? I'm going to assume that most of us who make music or pursue other creative endeavors do indeed dream that someday someone else will hear, see, or read what we've made. Though Darger and some others might seem to be the exceptions, even they may have dreamed of sharing their work. An audience can be your family members or anonymous passers-by on the street. Just because you're not booked in a club or concert hall doesn't mean you're not a musician. Even conceptual artists and musicians who decided to merely think about making something was enough. Yoko Ono, John Cage, and Sol LeWitt all made works that consisted solely of sets of instructions, have almost always documented their acts and presented them to their peers. Many of us who do seek validation dream that we'll not only have that dialogue with our peers and the public, but that we might even be compensated for our creative efforts, which is another kind of validation. We're not talking rich and famous. Making a life with one's work is enough. So let's assume that you want to be a professional and get paid, although most of all you want to get your music to others' ears. Then how does that work? Making great stuff is only half the battle. When I was younger, it appeared to me that the whole process by which music got to my ears happened by magic. I'd hear a new band or a singer who seemed to have come out of nowhere expressly to blow my mind. It seemed to me as if my friends and I had discovered them. I wasn't aware of marketing, at least not the marketing of music. I was aware of celebrities shilling for cigarettes, laundry detergents, and cars on TV and radio, but I didn't know that cool music was being marketed in the same way. I must have felt that there existed a republic of peers and like-minded individuals who somehow got wind of what cool stuff everyone else was up to. Now, everyone has at least some understanding of the fact that they're being marketed to. Sometimes we still believe we have magically discovered something, but more often we are vaguely aware that someone made an effort to bring that artist or music to our attention. When I first noticed these hidden forces at work, I felt a little disillusioned. Realizing that something I really liked had been sold to me felt like some part of my free will had been usurped. I began to question the whole idea of free will and personal agency in my likes and dislikes. Were they all manipulated according to someone else's plan? If we can do the mental gymnastics, separating this pragmatic knowledge from our enjoyment of music, then ideally this awareness of marketing campaigns might not spoil our enthusiasm. My friends and I now have a better understanding of the fact that our tastes are always changing, that some musicians no longer seem relevant while others in retrospect, seem prescient. We realize that there is an ebb and flow to what we are emotionally involved in, that there are no absolutes. But for a while, the music business seemed like a utopian parallel universe. As music fans and bystanders, we saw Elvis riding in a gold Cadillac. We saw Sting recording in a French chateau. We saw the Capitol Records building in L.A. shaped like a Tower of 45s, and we heard the stories of lives lived in excess, drug binges, TVs thrown from hotel balconies, 
embroidered nudie suits, and painted Rolls Royces. We heard stories of Bruce Springsteen laboring in studios for more than a year on Born to Run, or D'Angelo haunting Electric Lady for four years to make voodoo. Pragmatism seemed beside the point. The music world was about other things. Those tales of profligate spending and interminable recording sessions in expensive studios are almost unheard of now for the majority of artists, mainly for budgetary reasons. The music world then seemed glamorous and extravagant, and the practicalities of marketing and distribution seemed beside the point when one thought of the glory and the lifestyle. Much of that has changed. Flaunting a luxurious lifestyle is now mainly the provenance of hip-hop artists, few of whom tour extensively, so someone must be buying some records if that's what pays for those bottles of Cristal, those music videos, those grills and chains. Or else their record companies feel that fronting the money for such things is a wise long-term investment. Many of those artists have cleverly diversified into perfumes, restaurants, shoes and clothing. If music sales decline, if there are less and less profits from CDs, profile and income can presumably be maintained in other ways, like having your own line of perfume. Over the years, I too have increasingly spent time working in forms that are not exclusively musical. Art, books, like this one, films, and DVDs. None of those bring in anywhere near the income that a perfume deal would, or so I imagine. I really miss the boat in that department. With any extra musical pursuit, my general financial rule is simply to try not to lose money. If a project covers costs and expenses, that's acceptable. One project isn't supposed to bankroll another, though that ideal is hard to maintain. For me, diversification is about seeking out ways of stretching creatively. Diversity isn't a business decision. It's a way of staying interested, alert. Though I don't want my creative decisions to be guided by profit and marketing, a motivating criteria that inevitably ends in disaster, I also don't want to be blissfully ignorant of budgets and business. There's an adage often directed at easy-come, easy-go types. The musician who doesn't attend to his or her business pretty soon doesn't have any business. Decades ago, I took that warning to heart, and before signing to a record label, I read books like This Business of Music. My limited research didn't guarantee all that much in the way of wisdom, and the lawyers who were hired to protect our baby band didn't really do much to guarantee us a truly fair deal. Although our initial record contracts weren't so great, to their credit, they did the best they could under the circumstances. At least we didn't do anything truly disastrous. In subsequent years, we made an effort to learn a little each time out and make course corrections. Some business decisions I deeply regret. Though I was never coerced, I was often told a given situation was the best I could hope for at the time. That line has been used to justify a lot of predatory deals, but I got off lightly. I've managed to incrementally improve my legal and contractual situation over the years, to avoid repeating mistakes and to protect myself. I've worked with companies big and small, and I've even owned my own record company. That label, Luaka Bop, still exists, though I'm no longer involved in running it. Our first release was in 1990. I think one year in the early aughts I actually saw some income from the company, but the rest of the time, although it was hugely fun and the music we released was inspirational, it was also a drain on my time and finances. I've also tried working without any record company at all. The Everything That Happens collaboration with Brian Eno was self-released, though various companies were involved in the distribution of the physical CDs. The Here Lies Love two-disc collaboration with Fatboy Slim came out through Nonesuch, a subsidiary of Warner Music Group. I've released music through indie labels like Thrill Jockey, and I've manufactured CDs of remixes and dance scores and sold them on tour at the merch table. I have, at one time or another, tried almost every form of music distribution. These days, I tour every few years, and I no longer see it as simply a loss leader for CD sales. Touring used to be thought of mainly as a type of marketing, a way to get the public to buy more records by generating press and building an audience. It does do that, but it can also be a source of income and a creative endeavor all on its own. We've been told the old lie that losing money on tour is okay because you can make it up in record sales, but that really doesn't hold true for everyone anymore. Performing is psychologically and physically enjoyable for musicians, so cash isn't the sole attraction. 
Sadly, that means it's relatively easy to tempt us to perform for peanuts. Being a musician is a good job, but that doesn't mean it's okay to go broke doing it. I've made money, and I've been ripped off. Well, I've signed lousy contracts. I've had creative freedom, and I've been pressured to make hits. I've dealt with diva behavior from crazy musicians, and I've seen genius records by wonderful artists get completely ignored. I love music. I always will. It saved my life, and I know I'm not the only one who can say that. If you think success in the world of music is determined by the number of records sold, or the size of your house or bank account, then I'm not the expert for you. I'm more interested in how people can manage a whole lifetime in music. Is that possible? And if so, how? What is called the music business today, however, is nothing like what I researched before signing that first contract. In fact, the music business is hardly even in the business of producing music anymore. At some point, it became primarily the business of selling objects, LPs, cassettes, CDs, and plastic cases, and that business will soon be over. Tower Records closed in 2006, and Virgin Megastores shut their doors in 2009. Borders declared bankruptcy in February 2011, and HMV in the UK closed a massive number of branches in 2012. They're not coming back. This isn't a downturn. The few indie stores that have survived have staffs that are knowledgeable, and they love the music and the musicians whose work they sell. I stopped by a record shop in Nashville not too long ago, where the staff picks are all worth considering, and I heard a band play there in the afternoon. Beers were passed out. I bought some records. But even those shops have to sell a critical mass of goods to pay the rent, so who knows how long such wonderful outlets will be around. This changing landscape isn't necessarily bad news for music, and it's not necessarily bad news for musicians either. There have never been more opportunities for a musician to reach an audience, and that's what we have always wanted to do. Music, as far as this book is concerned, is the end. And as we have seen, the devices that deliver it come and go. Almost none of the myriad ways of currently making an audience aware of your work existed when I accidentally found myself with a music career. Though the current situation is rife with new possibilities, the industry itself is less flush with money, so you have to learn how to navigate some treacherous waters. Lenny Warrenker used to run Warner Brothers Records with Mo Austin. I talked to him recently on the phone about their philosophy back when I signed with that label. He said, The music business wasn't as profitable then. It was run by entrepreneurs, and often the records they put out were based on their taste. Ahmet Erdogan was one and Norman Grants, who specialized in jazz, was another. They were proud that the records they put out reflected their own taste. We at Warner had a philosophy. In the late 60s and early 70s, we could see that good songwriters learned as they went. One got a sense of their growth. They might not get it the first time around, but it might happen for them on their next record. So we tried to simply sign what we thought were the best artists, artists who had an aesthetic. We eventually realized that what was important was our roster rather than our records. And sometimes what was right, what clicked, was also a good record. It was a bet, and sometimes you could bet on quality. It was a time of anything goes, artistically. We signed unsuccessful artists who made good records, and we eventually realized that these artists drew other artists, some of whom were successful, to the label. Randy Newman, Rye Cooter, Van Dyke Parks and Van Morrison were on the label, and other artists wanted to be on the label because they were there. I remember Seymour Stein saying that he managed to sign Madonna because Talking Heads were on Sire Records at the time. Those days are gone for major labels, but smaller companies still follow some of that philosophy, though their finances and logistics might be different. CDs were selling nearly $18 billion worth of goods at their peak in the late 90s, now that's down to $3 billion. Some say this picture depicts a dire trend. The fact that Radiohead left EMI not so long ago and debuted its 2007 album In Rainbows online, and that Madonna defected from Warner Brothers to sign with Live Nation, a concert promoter, are said to signal the end of the music business as we know it. Actually, these are just two examples of how musicians are increasingly able to work outside of the traditional label relationship. There's no single way of doing business these days. There are, in fact, six viable models by my count, which I will review in this chapter.
There are probably more, and one can mix and match, but these give a picture of the array of options. Having a variety of business choices is good for artists. It gives us more ways to make a living. And it's good for audiences, too, who will have the opportunity for more and more interesting music to listen to. What is music? First, a definition of terms. What is it we're talking about here? What exactly is being bought and sold? In the past, music was something you heard and experienced. It was as much a social event as an oral one. As I argued earlier in this book, before recording technology existed, you couldn't separate music from its social context. It was pretty much all tied to specific social functions. It was communal and often utilitarian. You couldn't take it home, copy it, sell it as a commodity, except as sheet music, but that's not music, or even hear it again. Music was a singular experience, something connected to a specific time and place. It was part of the continuum, the timeline of your life, not a set of things that lived outside of it. You could pay to hear music by going to a concert or hiring musicians, but after you did, it was just a memory. Or, as many people did, you could make it yourself or with your family or friends. Technology changed all that in the 20th century. Music, or its recorded artifact, came to be regarded as a product, a thing that could be bought, sold, traded, and replayed endlessly in any context. You didn't have to go see a performance to hear music, and you didn't have to perform the music yourself, either. Other people did those jobs. This was, of course, hugely convenient. Most of us grew up in an age when the existence of recorded music was a given. We heard music in other contexts as well, but at least half of what we heard had been pre-recorded or was played on the radio, and much of that was pre-recorded as well. As record companies flourished, singers and songwriters began to earn additional income from the sale of recorded music, beyond their income from concerts. This must have seemed pretty exciting. Though there were lots of small record companies early on, the industry was soon dominated by a handful of large companies that signed artists, all of us were at least given the dignity of being referred to as artists, paid for their recordings to be made, and then promoted the hell out of them, sometimes. These companies would then get the records into any place that sold singles or LPs, and they'd also get them played on the radio. In return for this upfront and sometimes risky capital investment, most traditional record companies kept the lion's share of the income, passing on a relatively small percentage of the sales to the artists. The songwriter, if that person was different from the performer, got paid something too, as composers had with sheet music in the preceding decades. These changes upended the function and use of music, transforming it from something we participated in to something we consumed. But our instincts remain intact. I spend plenty of time as a music consumer, with buds in my ears listening to recorded music, but I'll still go out to stand in a crowd as part of an audience. I also sing to myself, and yes, I perform and play an instrument. Not always well. We'll always want music to be part of our social fabric. We gravitate to concerts and bars even if the sound sucks. We pass music from hand to hand, or via the internet, as a form of social currency. We build temples where only our kind of people can hear our kind of music, opera houses, punk clubs, symphony halls, and we want to know everything about our favorite bards, their love lives, their clothes, their political beliefs. Something about music urges us to engage with its larger context, beyond the piece of plastic it came on. It seems to be part of our genetic makeup that we can be so deeply moved by this art form. Music resonates in so many parts of the brain that we can't conceive of it being an isolated thing. It's whom you were with, how old you were, and what was happening that day. Trying to reduce and package such a changeable and unwieldy entity is ultimately futile. But many try. What do record companies do? Or, more precisely, what did they traditionally do? As I outlined earlier, the record company not only has the capital to fund some of the recording and promoting, they presumably also have some skills, expertise, useful contacts, and access to the latest technology, more than a bank would have, for example. 
A bank would never give a kid with a guitar a loan. The kid has no collateral from a bank's point of view. The idea used to be that the record company A&R folks all had good ears, and, as Lenny Warrinker said, they could sense that these kids and their songs could just maybe become hugely popular and make a pile of money for the record company. At some point in the 80s, these guys with the special ears began to disappear. Most of the major labels began to merge with one another, or even with non-music businesses. Warner Brothers, where I was, got absorbed by Time, Inc. Maybe we'd all get good reviews in time from now on. And then, to make it even more confusing, that entity merged with AOL. The new stockholders and boards soon demanded quarterly accounting, which pressures the labels to produce significant hits on a regular basis. The ears, who spotted and nurtured talent, were well paid. So to pay off the debts accrued by the recent mergers, these guys were let go. Then even the guys who managed and used to own the record labels were paid handsomely to go away. Other guys who didn't have a history of dealing with musicians thought they could do just as well or better by being more ruthless and efficient. Mostly, though, they didn't do any better. The smaller labels that survived still relied on their love of the form and their gut instincts. But because they were actually paying attention, sometimes they hooked a big one. They knew when something moved them, but they didn't have the same financial resources and marketing manpower as the big boys. Turning one's heart, ears, and love into cash could be a sometime thing. Here's the traditional breakdown of what record companies used to do. Fund recording sessions. Manufacture product. Distribute product. Market product. Advance money for expenses. Concert tours, videos, promotional events, hair and makeup. Advise and guide artists on their careers and recordings. Managers are supposed to do this, but record companies do as well. Handle the accounting of all of the above, and eventually funnel some of the leftover cash to the artist. This was the system that evolved in the 20th century to market the product, which is to say the container, vinyl, tape, or disc that carried the music. Can you imagine a business in which most of its investments proved to be bad? That was the record business before the collapse. The few massively successful acts were supporting the many who weren't exactly failures. So, in effect, Robert Palmer's sales funded the Pogues, and Madonna's income funded Randy Newman's idiosyncratic records. This system of corporate arts funding, however wacky, held up until the foundations began to crumble. Since 2000, many forces have conspired to reduce the value of the services those record companies offer to artists. The deals offered are no longer supported by the same a priori assumptions regarding what a label will do for an artist. Here are some of the things that have changed. Change 1. Recording costs began to approach zero. Years ago, most artists simply didn't have the $15,000 minimum to pay for studio time, engineering fees, and mixing and mastering costs, the base investment needed for making a record. But now an album can be made on the same laptop you use to check email. I still utilize proper studios fairly often, but I have come to realize that it isn't an absolute necessity anymore. The cost of a laptop and the gear that went into recording my vocals on Lazy, my collaboration with Express 2, might have come to a few thousand dollars, and though the laptop has been retired, it was also used for other recordings, as well as email and lots of other functions. Microphones, speakers, and other gear used for that project are still in use. So that startup cost gets amortized rapidly over a few years. But what if you want to record a large band and not just yourself singing on a laptop? A company called Artist Share, run by Brian Camilio, offers a new approach to funding recordings that require capital investment. I heard about them when an Artist Share record by jazz composer Maria Schneider won a Grammy. That put the lie to the argument that semi-self-funded recordings should be looked down on as vanity projects. Schneider works with modest size orchestras, a bit like Gil Evans did some decades ago. The cost of rehearsing with these ensembles and recording them is considerable, way beyond what would normally be available to jazz artists whose record companies anticipate fairly modest sales and adjust their funding accordingly. Camilio tried to solve this problem by initiating fan-funded recordings. 
Fans of Schneider's give money to artist share before the record is made. An act of faith that won't necessarily work for everyone. The fans who can give just a little get a CD when it's done. And those who give a lot can get thanked on the CD, given free concert tickets, backstage passes, and all the rest. Kickstarter campaigns work in a similar way. Neither is a conventional investment, because the fans don't get a percentage of sales, but they are an investment in keeping artists working and recording at a high level. One might say these models facilitate investment in the continuation of our own culture. So one way or another, it's sometimes feasible for a musician to find a way to record without going into serious debt, if they are careful. Change 2. Manufacturing and distribution costs are approaching zero. There used to be a break-even sales point below which it was impractical to distribute a recording. With LPs and CDs, there were base manufacturing costs, printing costs, shipping, warehousing of stock, and so on. It was essential to sell in volume, because that's how those costs got amortized. The costs per record came down the more records were pressed and potentially sold. If you sold less than a few thousand LPs or CDs, the initial costs of not only the recording, but of pressing the vinyl or CDs and making the covers and shipping to warehouses and record stores couldn't get paid back, so the record company would inevitably lose money. This meant that marginal music tended to remain marginal because of economics and technology, rather than the quality of the music. This also meant that for a record that only sold a few thousand copies, the percentage of each record sale that went back to the artist was lower than for those that sold millions, for which the percentage of the recording cost that is paid back by each record sold approaches zero. Records that sold well not only brought in more profit per copy sold, but a larger percentage of those profits per copy went to the record companies and the artists. Popular records could therefore be sold at a discount, which would undercut the little guys, while still bringing in more money than the records the little guys put out. The music business was like Walmart that way. No more. Digital distribution is pretty close to being free. Digitally, it's no more expensive to distribute a million copies than a hundred. Well, one needs to use the services of a heftier server if larger quantities of music files are being downloaded at once and more credit card payments are processed. But there are no more warehouses, trucks, damaged goods being returned, and pressing plants that consume natural resources. The big stores where digital downloads are available are few. iTunes, Amazon, and eMusic in the United States. And they do take a percentage of the digital sales, around 30%, which some people, including me, regard as unreasonable. So, to be fair, the distribution isn't really free. That percentage is often less than what old-school record stores took in as their percentage of the retail price. Though sometimes, surprise, it works out the same for the artist in the end. So, although distribution costs have dropped precipitously, there are still corporate gatekeepers who charge hefty tolls. The savings aren't passed on as fairly as one might hope in most cases, although, as we'll see, there are workarounds. Change 3. Artists no longer get big advances. Due to the large percentage of each record sale kept, the record companies often broke even way before the artists began to see their own shares trickle in. Many bands lived off the money given them in advance of the estimated sales of their upcoming records, and these amounts were often based on an RNA person listening to rough demos or seeing a live show featuring new material. Most artists, however, never saw a cent from record sales after they got their advances. Their percentage of each record was still being used to pay off the recording and marketing costs and advances loaned to them by the record companies. The artists would then be obliged to write more songs in order to get an advance for another record. They'd be living record to record, advance to advance. The artists essentially went into debt, willingly, following the carrot of fame dangled before them. Making music and performing it is hugely enjoyable, so a reward was built in that the record companies didn't have to pay for. Artists would be having a pretty good time writing and playing music, making a name for themselves, but they'd be quietly getting deeper and deeper in debt. Most artists accumulated a debt that was hard to dig out of, unless they managed to have record sales that stayed consistently high. 
The list of successful artists who at some point in their career went completely broke is astounding. TLC, The Ramones, Terence Trent Darby, Seal, Ron Wood, Meatloaf, MC Hammer, Michael Jackson, Sly Stone, and Tony Braxton, just to name a few. Some of these artists simply didn't manage their finances well and spent their money on drugs or limos, but some did nothing wrong. They were just part of a business that wasn't designed to sustain them over the long term. In 2011, the New York Times ran a story about the economic realities facing the musician Teddy Thompson. Mr. Thompson, who has been struggling to succeed for more than a decade, he turns 35 on February 19th, has enjoyed only marginal success in the United States. His average record sales are 21,000, and is acutely aware of his dwindling shelf life in a business with a rapid turnover of talent. If his fifth album, Bella, to be released Tuesday on Verve Forecast, doesn't break through, how many more chances will he get? My goal when I started out was to get to the point where I could tour a lot and make a living, which means getting paid enough to hire my own band, travel, and end up with a bit of money. But I'm still nowhere near that point, he said. Because I didn't have a band and fan base when I started, I did everything backward. I've ended up making five reasonably expensive records and not having a commensurate fan base. In another Times article about singer-songwriter Nicole Atkins, Ben Cesario writes, She was signed by Columbia Records and got the full star-in-the-making treatment, with a spread in Rolling Stone and even an American Express commercial in anticipation of her debut album, Neptune City. Critics began to fall for her darkly laced, almost surrealistic songs and her soaring, dramatically powerful voice. Shortly before its release, however, the album was delayed, to be remixed by the label's new co-chairman, Rick Rubin, and when it came out, months later, its promotional momentum had evaporated. Neptune City sold a disappointing 32,000 copies, according to Nielsen's SoundScan, and by 2009, Ms. Atkins and her label had divorced, as she once put it. It's important to keep in mind that the sales numbers described here as disappointing might have actually been okay if these artists could have held on to a larger percentage of that income. I know both these artists. Their records are good, and they are plugging away, gigging around town and elsewhere, and I feel optimistic that the changes in the music distribution landscape will help them find a way to make a life in music. In the last decade, things have changed. The big record companies have cut back, and they rarely offer generous advances to artists anymore. I've been paid sizable advances by none such, and though I could have tried to make a cheaper recording on my last record with them, and thereby pocketed the change, almost all of the money I received went into production costs. That was my choice. I did okay, but I don't recommend that to everyone. As the advances and marketing expenditures that record companies commit to projects continue to shrink, artists have naturally begun to seek other ways of funding their recordings, paying the rent, and marketing their music. Change 4. Performing is now viewed as a source of income. Live performances by artists were traditionally seen by record companies as a way to publicize their new releases, as a means to an end and not an end in itself. Bands would therefore ask for and often receive advances from record companies, called tour support, specifically to cover their touring losses, the cost of hiring musicians, hotel rooms, van rental, gas, and meals in strange cities. Bands would anticipate that they'd recover that advance from the record company, which they'd have to pay back later, through a subsequent increase in record sales. Sometimes the record sales would indeed increase as the result of a tour, and after a long time those loans could be paid off, but often they would not. This, to be blunt, is all wrong. It's backward. First off, performing is a distinct skill, different from writing songs, singing, or making recordings. And for those who can do it, performing can be a good way to make a living. There are acts out there who don't sell all that many records, but whose excellent live performances can fill sizable halls. They don't need a record label's help to do that either. Not everyone agrees with me. I spoke with Mac McCann, who co-runs the independent label Merge. He sees a continued value in bands touring to support their records. As he put it, The most old-fashioned way of doing things is still the best, 
which is touring. That really sells records more than anything else, it really does work. Most of what Merge puts out only gets played on college radio, non-commercial radio, KCRW, places like that. And that's great, but by the time you get to a record store two days later, you've kind of maybe forgotten what you heard. But if you see a band live, that stays with you. It's so memorable and it's so immediate. That, more than anything else, is going to stay in your mind. And you can actually make money touring if you can keep your budgets down. So given all these changes, what's the purpose of record labels? Do they still have a place in this new world? Can we redefine what it is? Some will survive. None Such, which has distributed several of my albums, has thrived under Warner Music Group ownership by operating with a relatively lean staff of 12 and staying focused on talent. Artists like Wilco, Philip Glass, Katie Lang and others have sold more here than when they were at so-called major labels, even during a time of decline, Bob Hurwitz, president of None Such, told me. The label has had some unexpected successes recently, like Buena Vista Social Club and the Black Keys. Such successes, Hurwitz says, happen about 5% of the time. He says that things do a little better than hoped for about 10% of the time, exactly as expected about 60% of the time, and not as well as was hoped about 25% of the time. Without knowing how much each record costs to make and market, it becomes a little hard to know just how devastating the not-as-well-as-hoped records would be financially for that company. A successful record is only a financial success if it didn't cost an arm and leg in recording and marketing to make it happen. Hurwitz claims that none such, though prestigious, isn't a vanity label for Warner Brothers. Distribution Models A quote by Mac McCon. Do people need labels? Some bands don't, but some bands do just because they don't want to worry about what we do. They don't want to do what we do. They just want to make music and play shows and make records and write songs. They don't want to have to worry about finding a distributor and calling record stores and making sure they're stocking the record when they're coming through town. Some big labels have disappeared as these roles that Mac mentions get chopped up and delivered by more thrifty independent vendors. Brian Eno, who now produces Coldplay and is co-writing songs with U2, recently told me he was enthusiastic about I Think Music, an online network of indie bands, fans, and stores, and pessimistic about the future of traditional labels. Structurally, they're much too large, he said, and they're entirely on the defensive now. The only idea they have is that they can give you a big advance, which is still attractive to a lot of young bands just starting out. But that's all they represent now. Capital. So where do artists fit into this changing landscape? Where there used to be one model, now I see six, ranging from the artists who put themselves entirely in the hands of the label, to the artists who do nearly everything themselves. There could be more delineation along this spectrum, but the following will suffice for now. Not surprisingly, the more involved the artist is, the more likely it is that he or she will retain a bigger slice of the pie per unit sold. The totally DIY model is certainly not for everyone, but the point is that there are options. Six distribution models with different levels of artist control. 1. The 360-degree deal. At one end of the spectrum is the 360-degree, or equity, deal, where every aspect of an artist's career is handled by producers, promoters, marketing people, lawyers, accountants, and managers. Woof! The idea behind this model is that an artist can achieve wide saturation and massive sales because you are being boosted by a powerful machine working every angle, and they stand to profit from everything you do. That means, in some cases, they keep a major piece of every t-shirt, every bottle of perfume, every concert ticket, and, of course, every record sold. The artist in this model becomes a brand, owned and operated by the corporation, and in theory, this encourages the company to adopt the long view because of enlightened self-interest. The company should have a strong incentive to nurture that artist's career because every aspect of it that makes money benefits them, too. Pussycat Dolls, Korn, and Robbie Williams have made arrangements like this, selling equity in everything they touch. Jay-Z did a 360-degree deal as well, 
and one would assume that an astute, street-smart man like him wouldn't get ripped off. It does vary, though. U2 did a deal with Live Nation in 2008 that lumped a percentage of their merchandise sales in with the concert income, but their CD and download sales weren't included. The artist often gets a lot of money up front in these deals. A lot. However, there's a trade-off. I doubt that every significant creative decision is left in the artist's hands. Too much is at stake. For an artist, kicking back and not promoting your product wouldn't be an option. Making arty experimental records would be discouraged. As a general rule, as the cash comes in, creative control goes out. Madonna just made a 360-degree deal with Live Nation. For a reported $120 million, the company, which until now has mainly produced and promoted concerts, will get a piece of both her concert revenue and her music sales. The following details were reported. $17.5 million, a general advance, money Madonna gets just for being Madonna. $50 to $60 million, advances for up to three new albums. As with a regular record deal, this money only gets handed over when Madonna delivers the music for each record. So it's possible that the company won't have to pay this out entirely. The material girl may not be moved to record another 36 to 45 more songs, which is what it would take to fulfill that contract and get the entire advance. $50 million in cash and stock for the right to promote Madonna's concerts and license her name. Note that Live Nation still has to share concert and licensing revenue, which will give her 90% of concert sales, probably net, and 50% of the licensing money it collects. I, for one, wouldn't want to be beholden to Live Nation. They're a spin-off of Clear Channel, the radio conglomerate that turned much of the U.S. radio spectrum into pabulum. But Madge is a smart cookie. She's always been adept at controlling her own stuff, so we'll see. According to my manager, David Whitehead, a new band, now at EMI, signed a deal like that. They didn't have a track record. No one had heard of them, so they had no negotiating leverage. EMI presumably negotiated a nice portion of album sales, merch, and a cut of touring. One can see the logic in this model as record sales decline, and the profits from downloads don't offset the loss. Record companies, and even concert promoters, feel that since they are the ones who helped create a popular artist-slash-brand, they should naturally see a percentage of the profits from all possible revenue streams. And that seems fair especially when the upfront investment is so high. If I'd spent millions bankrolling Lady Gaga's records, producing those elaborate videos and marketing plans, and I know nothing of her finances, she may have bankrolled it all herself, I'd sure want a piece of her live shows and any other lucrative sources of revenue that might come down the road. All the major labels these days tend to want to sign artists to 360-degree deals. The question is whether the deal is passive or active, in a passive deal, the label skims off some percentage of sales from the licensing income, but isn't involved in an artist's business in other ways. As long as the label gets their money when they come around asking, they won't be telling the artist how to run her career. Labels, however, tend to prefer an active deal. For example, since all the majors have affiliated publishing divisions, they solicit interest in the artist from them and the publishers, then make a separate offer to the songwriters alongside the record deal. If the artist resists and wants to retain their publishing rights, the label will accept a passive participation in the publishing income and counter this less lucrative, for them, deal by offering lower rates on mechanical income as a tool to drive the artist to agree to the deal with their affiliated publisher. Mechanical licenses, a mandatory requirement for any record deal, grant the right to mechanically reproduce a recording. This generally runs as high as 9.1 cents per song. The writer of a song, who isn't necessarily the performer, receives that 9.1 cents per track for songs under five minutes, in addition to the royalties, if they are also the recording artist. Typically, these songwriting cuts are negotiated, in favor of the record company, to be limited to 10 tracks. Even if there are 12 or more songs on a CD, they agree to pay only on 10 of them. Skits like the short dramatic or comedic interludes on hip-hop records, don't count. If the artist writes his own songs, he has the option to negotiate this mechanical percentage, and often, as a result, it gets lowered to 7.1 cents. 
Mechanicals are an important source of income, as I'll discuss later. Back to the active deal. If the company can manage to own a portion of the publishing of a song, then the label stands to reap additional income if that song is licensed by an ad or covered by another act. Typically, the label will try to get a 10% passive participation in the publishing income if they're not able to get an affiliated, active publishing deal, which will therefore mean that they also get a piece of the mechanicals they are paying to the songwriter. Touring is, of course, a big topic in these all-inclusive deals. Normally, touring falls under passive participation. The label doesn't actively promote the tours or help organize them. It's too much work. They just take a piece of the profit, although some labels try to exert more control and actually make deals directly with concert promoters. The tour participation in 360-degree deals are all over the place, ranging from those that take 5 to 15% of gross tour income to even higher amounts of net income. Shelters are often built into the deals so that the label only starts to participate above a certain net income threshold. If, for example, you aren't netting more than a certain amount on your tour, if you're only playing clubs, for example, the label won't be terribly interested and won't commission your income. This benign neglect can be contractually formalized, and the artist is therefore sheltered somewhat. Understandably, labels don't want to be stuck with the short dollars, meaning the debt or losses that the artist might incur while on tour, which will only increase the artist's tour support demands. To get their act into the venues that will pull in serious money, and therefore be worth commissioning, the labels that sign artists to 360-degree deals aim for blockbuster hits, just like movie studios. If a song is a hit, then the performance venues tend to increase in size, and the act will actually make money on the tour, which will then be commissioned by the label. Labels offering 360-degree deals also like to participate in sponsorship and endorsement deals, whether tour-related or not. Sometimes those deals can be limited to ones brought to the table by the label, but often not. Again, the company's commission on these deals ranges from 15 to 20 percent of net income. Labels are bolstering their staffs in this area, since they believe relationships with advertisers and corporate sponsors will be key to future profitability. Needless to say, this means artists signed to these deals will be pressured into associating themselves with sponsors and the products they're selling. The line between music as a creative act and music as a means of getting you to buy something will become even fuzzier. As more artists sign these deals, we'll have a hard time knowing whether or not we are listening to a song or a commercial, or whether there's any difference between the two. 2. Standard Royalty Deal This is more or less what I lived with for many years as a member of Talking Heads, and even as recently as 2004, when I released Grown Backwards with None Such. In this model, the record company bankrolls the recording and handles the manufacturing, distribution, press, and promotion. The artist gets a percentage of record sales. The label doesn't have a financial stake in live shows, t-shirts, or endorsements. In a typical deal of this type, the record label owns the copyright to the recording. Forever. This doesn't mean they own the song, though. This distinction is confusing for most people. We tend to think of a recording as being the same as the song. However, the song itself and the version that the artist recorded aren't always the same thing. It could be someone else's song, for example. In that case, the song copyright is shared by the writer or writers and the publisher or publishers of the song. This goes back to the era before recordings, when sheet music was the published version of a song. With the advent of the recording industry, sheet music now brings in a minuscule amount of income, but the recording of a song, particularly one that becomes a hit, is a valuable commodity. Since the record company in this model typically finances the recording, they claim 100% ownership of it, with an agreed-upon percentage of record sales going to the artist. Obviously, the cost of all the services a record company provides, along with their overhead, accounts for a big part of the price of a CD. You, the buyer, are paying for all those trucks, all those CD pressing plants, all those warehouses, and all that plastic. Only a small percent of the retail price is for the music. Theoretically, 
As digital distribution increases and much of that overhead goes away, those costs should no longer be passed along to the consumer or to the artist. Theoretically. Much of the income for songwriters like myself doesn't come from record sales, though we do get the mechanical and publishing income before expenses like video budgets, recording costs, and tour support are repaid. However, I'm going to focus on sales of recordings for now, because the other sources of income, like touring and licensing songs to films or commercials, are optional. I could make a lot more money if I decided to license songs to commercials. Here's the breakdown of how I did on a record that was made under a more or less standard distribution deal. Talking Heads spent many years with Warner Brothers, and in 2004 I released Grown Backwards through their boutique Nonesuch label. Part of the attraction of Nonesuch was that we felt in good company with their eclectic roster of acts, like John Adams, The Black Keys, Laurie Anderson, Kaitanu Velasu, Wilco, until they left to start their own label, DBPM Records, Buena Vista Social Club, and the Magnetic Fields. Like the Warner Brothers of old and indie labels today, like Warp, 4AD, Tom Lab, Daptone, and Thrill Jockey, none such as taste is reflected in their roster of artists. If you like one record on the label, you just might like another. Trusting that I'd sell some records, none such offered me an advance of $225,000. If I had recorded with just myself and a few other musicians, my expenses would have been lower and I could have pocketed the leftover money. Instead, after my recording studio and musician costs, all that was left over was about $7,000. Was I crazy? That's not much to live on for all the time that writing and recording takes, which in this case amounted to almost a year, though not of continuous work. That record did cost a significant amount to make, because I mixed a rhythm section with strings, winds, and horns on a lot of the tracks. There were lots of arrangements, players, and big studios for recording them. When you do a record like that with a corporate-owned label, you have to pay at least union rates for musicians. Though high, those rates are generally fair. In this case, recording costs, all the musicians, studio time, technicians, and arrangements, were $218,000, which seems like a sizable sum. I was glad none such was covering those expenses with their advance, but still, what was I to live on? Was I being foolish and naive? Presumably they didn't give me that advance knowing or even caring what the record would cost. Rather, for them, the amount was based on projected sales. Needless to say, this loan would need to be paid off. It wasn't a gift for signing with them. I would begin to see income from my record only after that sizable sum was repaid. There are two ways of handling a royalty deal, but they both come out more or less the same for the artist. In one form of accounting, the artist gets their percentage only after a lot of others get to the feed trough first. The other standard model involves the retailer and record company taking a lump sum off the top, with the artist receiving a fixed royalty on what's left. I'm going to focus on the first form of accounting, since it's more transparent. A big chunk of the price a consumer pays goes to the retailer, either the physical store, those that are left, or to iTunes or Amazon. Then the record's producer gets some percentage. 3% is common. Any tour support the record company advanced to the artist gets paid back, as do video costs, which can be as high as the cost of making a record and are often higher, like a million dollars for a really big budget video. Then promotional costs are shared, including payola, which is essentially bribes of one form or another to radio stations. So half of what the record company pays to get your record played and marketed is your own money. You just don't have to front it. To be fair, they usually ask at each step along the way. It goes on and on. Returns? meaning the records that are pressed and shipped out but remain unsold and need to be returned. Limos, those dinners they bought you that you thought were such a nice gesture. This all gets deducted before the artist's percentage kicks in. A lot of accounting work is required if an artist decides he or she wants to actually investigate where all that money went. Here are the figures that show the cost of making my Grown Backwards record versus the advance I got from Nonesuch. I was given a $225,000 advance. 
I spent 38% of that on musicians' fees and 24% on studio expenses. 17% went to the engineer mixing fees and 7% to the arranger and copyist. 11% got split between things like travel and meals, rehearsal space, instrument and equipment rentals, and freight. I had 3% left in my pocket when I was done. $6,750. This was an expensive and therefore risky record to make in the current economic climate. The record business was heading down a slippery slope, so betting that I'd make that hefty advance back was in no way a sure thing. I felt lucky just to be able to make a record with strings, winds, and the host of great musicians I loved, and I was prepared not to reap much in the way of profits as a result. We all knew that records were costing more, but relative to what my record sales were at that time, this was really pushing it a bit. I've talked recently to some emerging musicians who are still watching the industry tank, and when I asked them why they even wanted to make a record, their feeling was, I want to do it while they still exist. I may have been operating under a similar impulse. Let me sneak under the wire before the whole game is over. How many copies of that record would I have to sell to actually make money? The record retailed for $18.00 before inevitable discounts, but for the sake of this exercise, let's use the full price. Eight dollars of that goes straight to the retail store selling physical CDs, which leaves ten dollars. If my royalty percentage were a not uncommon fourteen percent, I'd get one dollar and forty cents from that wholesale price. If my royalty rate were a fairly high nineteen percent, I'd get one dollar and ninety cents per CD sold. If I had a big-name producer on the record, then I'd typically be obliged to give 3% to him or her, because producers get paid off the top, not after I go into profit. Really big producers get advances, too. T-Bone Burnett often gets an advance in the six figures, which comes off the artist's royalty share, though many artists would say that he's worth the price. Some producers also demand a share of the publishing, essentially claiming they co-wrote the songs. This might in fact be the case at times, the beats and sounds they contribute are often so integral to the success of the song that they could legitimately be classified as composition. There's no law that says beats are composition, though, so this demand is completely negotiable. This isn't a new situation. One could argue that a song produced by Phil Spector back in his 60s heyday is almost a different song from a version he had no hand in. More recently, a song with beats not words or melody, by Timbaland is identifiable and sometimes catchier because of his unique way with samples. Are these guys then automatically co-writers of the songs? Technically and legally, no. But either the producer demands credit or the artist, recognizing the value of the producer's contribution, gives it. In a typical situation, I might be paying off my recording debt and tour support money if I took any with that $1.40 per record, minus the 30 cents the producer would be getting from the very first record sold. So I'm left with $1.10 per record sold. Foreign sales work a little differently. My royalty in this deal was 75% of the U.S. dealer price in Europe and 50% in the rest of the world. So even if I were hugely popular in Japan, it would take me twice as long to recoup my recording costs using those record sales as it would in the United States. This seems completely arbitrary and unfair to me, especially when downloads are increasingly the way folks buy music. But this is the standard offer on such deals. If I wrote every song on a CD, which I didn't on Grown Backwards, I would get, from the mechanical income mentioned above, 91 cents, 9.1 cents per song multiplied by the 10 songs the labels usually limit those mechanicals to, in addition to the sales royalty percentage and my publishing income. If my sales royalty was 14% of the $10 dealer price, and I wrote all the songs, then I would get $1.40 plus 91 cents, equaling $2.31 per record sold. Things are looking a little better. I believe it was the Beatles and other singer-songwriters of the 60s who realized that recording your own songs was far more lucrative than doing record after record covering other people's songs, as had often been the norm in pop music. This incentivized songwriting, and it was partly due to this insight that there was suddenly an explosion of creativity and innovation in pop music in the 60s. 
but it also made a few too many musicians feel more or less obliged to consider themselves songwriters. I'm as guilty as many others in feeling that I, or my bandmates, had to write every last song on a record, even though covering an underappreciated gem might have been a better choice than recording one of our not-so-stellar writing efforts. However, even not-so-good songs generate income from album sales, as long as there are a couple of hits on there that motivate folks to buy the whole album. The filler goes along for the ride, and still generates money for the artists and publishers. In the case of my none such record, the math is pretty simple. If I had written all the songs on that record, then I would have had to sell almost 100,000 records to break even on that $225,000 advance. But remember, if I had recorded that album for a fraction of the actual cost, I would essentially have had that advance as income. That might not have seemed a huge number of records to sell back in the day for a popular act, but it's far more than most records sell now. Few acts sell millions of copies anymore, and the artists who do tend to have more debts to pay off than just the recording costs, massive promotional budgets, percentages to managers and video producers. Say a top pop act does a video that costs half a million dollars, which is not unusual. They've then got to sell way more than my 100,000 records to break even. They've got to sell more like 750,000. Not all do, of course, and their debts begin to mount up quickly. Here are some sobering facts from SoundScan via Billboard. Only 35 albums released in 2006 sold more than 1 million copies within the calendar year. 27 in 2007, 22 in 2008, 12 in 2009, and 10 in 2010. Only 2,050 of the 97,751 albums released in 2009, or 2.1%, sold over 5,000 copies. That sort of puts a different spin on the dream of living large off of record sales. If that hypothetical record with its expensive video isn't successful, the artist is suddenly about a million dollars in the hole. The pressure to have a hit with the next record is then immense. What about downloads? Aren't they picking up some of the slack as CD sales dwindle? Nope. Typically, an album downloads for $10, and Apple's iTunes store, for example, takes 30% of every sale. The record label applies the artist's royalty percentage to that $10 retail price. So if the artist is getting the traditional 14%, he or she is left with $1.40 per album download. So an artist isn't better off, especially when you think about the way people buy music online. They tend to buy songs, not entire albums. Artists are understandably trying to negotiate better royalty percentages for downloads, arguing that the record companies don't have the same overhead and expenses, and nor do the stores. Therefore, the royalty given to artists should be higher. But there is, of course, a lot of resistance from the record companies. In the end, how did I end up doing on that record? I asked my business manager, who had this to say. With Grown Backwards, you have, as of 2010, sold approximately 127,000 physical albums, 53,000 digital singles, and 8,000 digital albums, for total revenues to you of approximately $276,000, which does include some licensing money. This was a straight-up master deal. Total revenues of 276000 less the cost of making the record, which was 218000 means you have made $58,000 on the record deal. However, this amount doesn't include your publishing income, mechanicals, and performance royalties. Now, $58,000 doesn't sound too bad. That's what an elementary school teacher makes in New Jersey. But you also have to factor in the time it takes to write the songs, the time it takes to record them, and the lag before any of that money comes in. What's more, those figures my business folks provided are for six years' worth of sales. Six years. It would be pretty tough to live on $58,000 for six years. I would be out of house and home and looking for other employment if I was hoping to rely on record sales to live. And that record sold okay. Luckily, I work on more than one project or record sequentially, so while I'm waiting for possible income from one project, I'm already working on the next one. I might spend, on a record I have high hopes for, a couple of years on writing, recording, and performing. 
That's not six years, but it's a long time to hang on before the check comes in. Of course, if I'd sold millions of records, I would have made more money. My income per record sold would have increased. My debt to the record company would have been easily paid back early on, and then I could have pocketed nearly all the royalty income, rather than having to pay back the advance and other costs. Note that none such didn't make a whole pile on this record either, though they did go into profit. I don't know their overhead costs, so I can't factor those in. I'm happy to be able to make the records I want to make, and I realize that those records don't always sell in the millions, though sometimes we are pleasantly surprised. That lazy single I co-wrote and sang sold a lot. My point is that you have to sell an awful lot of records to expect to live off record sales alone, and maybe you shouldn't count on that happening. However, if you keep the recording and marketing costs down, you might squeak by. So how is a mid-level artist, someone who sells more than 5,000 copies of a record but less than a million, supposed to live given this scenario? Naturally, some of our records sell better than others. Our careers have hills and valleys. But how can you sustain a career over time? The answer seems to be by supplementing your royalty income with other sources, or by looking at the other distribution options I'll discuss next. For decades, the standard royalty model made a lot of money for the record companies, and for a few artists. When sales were good, everyone was satisfied, and the artists didn't feel they had to concern themselves with business matters too much. But that very lack of concern might explain why this model also led many artists to go bankrupt. Like real estate and home loans, it only works well when sales are booming, and growth looks like it will continue upward forever. Over the last decade, many of the services traditionally provided by record labels under the standard deal began to be farmed out. Press and publicity, digital marketing, graphic design, all are now often handled by independent firms. Even record companies that used to have departments dedicated to that stuff no longer provide such services in-house. It became cheaper to hire a graphic designer working out of her apartment in Brooklyn than to have a slew of designers taking a precious office real estate. However, record companies still try to make the same kinds of deals with the artists, as if they were still incurring all those expenses. The record companies still cover the payment and supervise these services, and he who pays the piper calls the tune. If the record company pays those subcontractors, then that company ultimately decides which artists have priority. If they don't hear a single, they can tell you that your record isn't coming out. Or maybe they'll say it can come out, if you insist, but it won't get any promotion or publicity, which amounts to the same thing as not coming out at all. So what happens when online sales eliminate many of these collateral expenses? Look at iTunes. $10 for an album download reflects the cost savings of digital distribution, which seems fair, at first. It's certainly better for consumers. But after Apple takes its 30%, often the same old royalty percentage is applied, and the artist is no better off, and maybe even worse. I smell another revolution in the works. Not coincidentally, these issues regarding the royalty rates for downloads are similar to those raised in the Hollywood writers' strike of 2007 to 2008. Would recording artists ever band together and go on strike like the writers who provide the content for films and TV shows did? Will book authors do the same when the majority of books are purchased via ebook downloads and publishers can no longer claim many of their costs as deductions? As these factors converge, things are going to get very interesting. 3. License Deal The license deal is similar to the standard deal, except that in this case, the artist retains the copyright and ownership of the master recording. The right to exploit the recording is licensed to the label for a limited period of time, usually seven years. After that, the rights and income from licensing those masters to TV shows, commercials, and the like revert to the artist. During the period of the license, income from those sources is split between the artist and the record company. If the members of Talking Heads held the master rights to our catalog today, we'd be earning twice as much from licensing songs to movies and TV shows as we do now. I'm doing fine as it is, but for emerging artists, this can make a huge difference. 
If artists can make a record by themselves and don't need creative or financial help doing so, then this model is worth looking at. A band that has a licensing deal is expected to pay their own recording costs. They're expected to deliver a finished product, more or less. Not being in debt to the record company right off the bat allows for a little more creative freedom, since you get less interference from the guys in suits when the music is being created. They might not even be around. The advance from the record company is necessarily lower because the company won't end up with the rights to the master recording in perpetuity. The income from this model is more or less structured the same as the royalty deal discussed previously, but the artist may see significantly more income down the line because they will retain ownership of their masters. The downside to this model is that the label may have less incentive to spend money to ensure that the record is a success. They're being asked to take a risk without having as many guaranteed sources of income. So they have to feel quite strongly about the recording to go this route, or they will temper their offer accordingly. If the artistic freedom that the artist gains here results in a more difficult record, then the odds of it being licensed by a film for a hefty chunk of change might be lower too. Basically, you can be radical, you can be wild and free, but it will probably cost you. With the right label, the license deal can be a great way to go. Arcade Fire has a license deal with Merge Records, an indie label that's done great for its bands by avoiding the big spending, big label approach. Mac McCon explained this approach to me. Part of it is just being realistic and not putting yourself in the hole. The bands we work with, we never recommend that they make videos. I like videos, but they don't sell a lot of records. A company like ADA, Alternative Distribution Alliance, really changed the landscape for indie labels. It meant that we can get our records anywhere that Warner Brothers can get their records. That's huge. It presents its own issues, though. If you're going to want your record in a Target, they're going to want $25,000 from you. What Mac is referring to is a kind of legalized bribery that the big chains, Target, Walmart, Best Buy, all participate in. They require a record label to pony up a flat fee in order to be featured in a given program. A program might imply that the record will be included in an in-store display, or it might mean the record will be placed at the end of a rack. Yes, those CDs are not there by accident. Every position is paid for listed in their flyers, or included in their print ads. But the fact is, they charge the labels even if the records aren't going to be included in one of these programs. This flat fee is not refundable. Even if the record isn't successful, you still have to pay to get your record into their store in order to find out if they will sell serious numbers or not. Not only that, but those stores have price ceilings. They force the label to sell records to them for less than they would to the record store on Main Street. Hence, the mom and pop stores go out of business, and the record labels get squeezed even harder. Big labels can afford this shakedown, because a hit record, one that sells in massive numbers and basically starts promoting itself, cancels out the losses incurred by the ones that don't sell. ADA, which Max says is leveling the playing field, is an indie distribution network, it and others like it, Red is another, won't, one hopes, go bankrupt like some of the other small distribution services have in the past. When those businesses go bankrupt, they don't return your stock. Your records are stuck in their warehouses. In a weird arrangement that only the record business could get used to, though, ADA is owned by Warner Brothers, and Red is owned by Sony. How indie can they really be? Says Mac. If we'd done Funeral, Arcade Fire's first record, 15 years ago, I don't know that we could have handled the next record. But we've grown. When Merge started out, it was just Laura and me in her bedroom. There are 12 people who work here now, but that growth happened over a long period of time. We've always been super conservative about the way we spend money. We work with artists who are living in the real world. We do deals and advances and marketing budgets based on reality, not based on I wish. It would be great if your next record sold five times as many as your last, but if it doesn't, we try to do things so that no one is in the poorhouse. We try to operate so that if someone does sell 5,000 copies, they do make a little money off that. 4. Profit Share Deal 
The profit-sharing deal often comes in the form of a 50-50 shared ownership of the master recording. Unlike the licensing deal, everything is shared. All the costs and expenses of producing an album are divided between the artist and the label. The mechanical royalties are considered part of the artist's profit under this deal, so they aren't paid off the top. One advantage of this deal is that when the profits do come in, they are shared 50-50 as well, which may be higher than the standard percentage in the previous deals. I did something like this with my soundtrack album, Lead Us Not Into Temptation, which was the score for the 2003 film Young Adam. I got a minimal advance from the label Thrill Jockey. This modest amount made sense partly because of the kind of record it was, it had only two vocal tracks, partly because the label was small, and partly because we were evenly dividing the income. I retained ownership of the masters. The recording costs were covered by the soundtrack budget. Part of the deal with the movie's producer was that I got to walk away with the music in return for taking a low fee. And Thrill Jockey and I shared the profits from day one. In a profit-sharing deal, the mechanicals come out of the artist's share, which makes some sense because the artist owns the master recordings and will stand to see additional income from possible licensing fees down the line. The artist retains ownership of the master in a license deal too, but profits from co-ownership with the label flow from day one. Thrill Jockey does do some marketing, promo, and press, and they have a staff to handle the day-to-day -day eventualities around a release. Because they are a small company, I may not have sold as many records as I would have through a larger company with more marketing muscle, but in the end, I took home a greater share of each unit sold. And besides, I didn't think it was the kind of record that Walmart customers would be drawn to. I didn't expect that particular recording to sell massively, so having a sensitive company like Thrill Jockey handle it, which could target the folks who might actually like that record, was appropriate. An expensive promotional push from a larger company probably wouldn't have resulted in a huge increase in sales anyway. 5. P&D or M&D deal In the manufacturing and distribution M&D deal, also known as a production and distribution deal or P&D, the artist does everything except, well, manufacture and distribute the product. The artist pays for the recording, ads, marketing and promotion. The record label or distribution entity isn't expected to pay for any of that. The companies that do these kinds of deals often offer other services, like marketing. But given the numbers, they don't stand to make as much, so their incentive to do a lot of extra work is limited. Big record labels traditionally don't make P&D deals. In this scenario, the artist gets absolute creative control. But it's a bigger gamble. Getting the public to know about your record is almost entirely up to you. Amy Mann does this, and it works really well for her. Mann's manager, Michael Hausman, told me, a lot of artists don't realize how much more money they could make by retaining ownership and licensing directly. If it's done properly, you get paid quickly, and you get paid again and again. That's a great source of income. This arrangement is different than a profit-sharing deal because the label is essentially relegated to being a vendor, and the artist either pays them a flat fee or offers them a fixed, modest percentage of the income. A commission in exchange for what will be more limited services. Hausman and Mann started off trying to do it all by themselves, a final option that I'll discuss next. But they found they needed help with physical distribution. As Hausman explains, We can sell the album online through the website and send an email to everybody letting them know that it's out and we'll do the fulfillment, getting physical records to buyers somehow. Amy told me, if I can just have one place where my fans can get it, they'll go there. And I said, that's not really going to sell a lot of records, but it's certainly a start. So we put it up on the website, and we sent around an email, and we started selling records. And in the back of my mind, I knew getting it into some real retail outlets was the key. And also in the back of my mind were conversations we had with the director Paul Thomas Anderson, who was putting a bunch of her songs in the movie Magnolia, and I suspected that was going to be kind of a big deal. We had some stuff going on, but the movie deal gave us the confidence to do it ourselves. I think we sold about 20,000 copies just off of the website ourselves before we got the record into traditional retail. 
To do that, we hired a traditional distributor and paid them a percentage in order to get the CDs into regular retail outlets, Tower Records, Best Buy, etc. We also did a deal with Artist Direct to fulfill the orders from Amy's website instead of us continuing to do it ourselves. This also enabled fans to purchase the CDs with a credit card. We didn't have that function at the beginning, believe it or not. PayPal was either not invented or not in common use at the time. My manager, David Whitehead, on P&D deals. Mac touches on it, but the P&D model really fails when you aim to put records into not just Target, but also into the remaining chains, like Barnes & Noble, Best Buy, Transworld, Walmart. The costs of buying into these stores for a CD that may sell anything between 2 and 10,000 CDs can be very prohibitive, between $1 and $2.50 per CD. So you never reach the tipping point where your costs are recouped and you start to earn back at the full margin level, between $4 and $5 per CD, which is what they would hope to get on one of these kinds of deals. And while digital sales help offset this disadvantage to some degree, physical is still the high-volume format. This sounds like one of the ways to go if you don't hope or expect to sell too much of a given record. But you will see much more income from those units sold than you would from larger-scale distribution deals. Sometimes, then, this is the most practical and profitable choice. 6. Self-Distribution Finally, at the far end of the scale, is the self-distribution model, where the music is self-written, self-played, self-produced, and self-marketed. Do it yourself all the way. Well, you don't necessarily have to play every instrument yourself and design the cover graphics, but everything after that stays under the artist's control. In its humblest form, self-distribution means CDs are pressed in limited numbers and then sold at gigs and often through a website. Promotion in this model is sometimes a MySpace or Bandcamp page, and the band buys or leases a server to handle download sales. Within the limits of what can be afforded, the artists have complete and absolute creative control, not just of their music, but of how it is sold. For emerging artists, this can mean freedom, nice, but without much in the way of resources. So it's a pretty abstract sort of independence. What good is freedom, many argue, if no one gets to hear your music because you can't afford to market it? For those who plan to take their material on the road and play it live, the financial constraints involved in DIY cut even deeper, depending on how elaborate the show is. Backup singers, musical gear, vans, it all costs money. Obviously, though, of all the models we've discussed, the profit percentage in self-distribution is the most favorable to the artist. Though I've painted it as rather homemade and self-limiting in scale, this approach doesn't exclude cobbling together the DIY approach with other deals, doing a P&D or something similar to get the physical CDs out, for example but handling digital yourself. You can mix and match. That combo platter concept is one of the best things about the current environment. Radiohead adopted a DIY model to sell their record in rainbows online, and then they went a step further by letting fans name their own price for the download. They weren't the first to do this. Issa, now known once again as Jane Seabury, pioneered the pay-what-you-will model in 2005, but Radiohead's move was much higher profile. It may have been less risky for them than it was for her, because they have a huge pre-existing fan base that knows their music and is excited about their output. One of their managers pointed out to me that it wasn't entirely the altruistic gesture it may have seemed. So many of their fans were sharing files of their records immediately upon release, or sometimes even before, that they couldn't do worse than the pay-what-you-wish plan. If there were going to be so many illegal downloads, this option might generate at least some income from people who had previously paid nothing. As one of Radiohead's managers, Bryce Edge, told me, The industry reacted like the end was nigh. They've devalued music, giving it away for nothing. Which wasn't true. We asked people to value it, which is very different semantics to me. Obviously, not every artist can risk this approach. Even Radiohead's subsequent record went back to having fixed pricing, but they're still partly going it alone. They do a P&D deal for distribution of physical CDs. For artists who aren't so well known, however, there's a chance that without marketing and promotion, no one will ever know they exist. 
Others will not find the DIY route attractive because they don't have the time or inclination to get involved in all aspects of the business. It isn't for everyone. However, within this model are sub-models. DIY can be done on a relatively small scale. A local band can have their own CDs pressed, sell their downloads, and market themselves via their live shows. A larger percentage of fewer sales is a likely but not inevitable result. Artists doing it for themselves can actually make more money than the massive pop stars with a standard royalty deal, even though the sales numbers may seem minuscule by comparison. The debts accumulated paying off label advances and promotional expenses aren't there in the DIY model, for starters. Of course, not everyone is as smart as those radio head boys. Many new companies have emerged to play various roles in this new DIY universe. Bandcamp, Top Spin, and CD Baby all allow unsigned artists to sell their songs as downloads in ways that are less financially onerous than using iTunes or Amazon, both of which charge hefty percentages and have lots of rules. Top Spin, which I have worked with, can also sell physical CDs and other things online. They're not the megastore that iTunes is, so fewer customers are randomly wandering around the shop. But with the help of links from music blogs, reviews, and elsewhere, fans do find their way to buy through these sites. I know I do. Amanda Palmer of the band Dresden Dolls made a record on which she covered Radiohead songs on her ukulele. She released it on Bandcamp and made $15,000 in a few minutes. In 2012, Palmer raised money for her new orchestral recording project via the crowdfunding website Kickstarter and has raised over $800,000. That's a lot of money. Way more than was needed for the actual recording. So much of it will go toward touring, distribution, and special packaging expenses. Her video on the website claims, This is the future of music. Sufjan Stevens' Bandcamp release got him onto the Billboard chart of top-selling albums. So DIY can be profitable and can move numbers of recordings as well. When Brian Eno and I were nearing completion of our collaboration, Everything That Happens Will Happen Today in 2009, we decided to give this DIY model a try, though we didn't go as far as the pay-what-you-wish plan. We'd both been mouthing off about all the new opportunities for artists, and here, we thought, was a chance to find out the truth for ourselves. We had some things working in our favor. 1. The recording and mixing of our record didn't cost all that much for a typical pop record, if one could call it that. Besides, we had already covered those costs ourselves, so we didn't owe anyone anything. 2. We have established names and reputations, and we assumed that some folks who like what we've done previously might like this record as well. Our sales probably wouldn't be zero. Beyond that, the curious might even seek out news of the project without us having to pay for a huge marketing and promotional budget. I was curious about what would happen if there were almost no ads or marketing at all. I hoped the magic of the web would take care of spreading the news all by itself. 3. Lastly, I've been frustrated by the increasingly long time that record companies say they need to set up a record release, the time between delivery of the finished mixes and the time the album lands in stores. This time lag is at least three months, often four. I understand that you gotta prime the pump for ages for a blockbuster movie, because if it doesn't do amazing business in the first weekend, it will get pulled from the theaters. But records don't work like that anymore. With digital distribution, one can, if one desires, have the record out almost as soon as it's done. The artist doesn't have to worry quite as much whether or not the distributor actually has the records in the stores. You don't have to wait for the trucks and the advance copies to arrive. There's always stock available in the digital store, and shipping is instant. Our DIY experiments sort of worked. When we had nearly finished the record, I decided that I wanted to do a tour during which I'd perform some of the material. This might draw some attention to the record, as Mac pointed out, but I didn't think of the tour as a sales tool. I did it because I wanted to have the experience of singing the songs again. Singing them was, to some extent, its own reward. As it turned out, the tour made money. We had to hire other companies to handle some of the ancillary work, Saxon Company in North America and Gareth Davis at Chapel Davis in the UK did publicity. Topspin built the web pages to sell the tracks online in various configurations. 
TuneCore handled administration when the digital files went to iTunes. RedEye handled Amazon and other digital download vendors in North America, as well as physical CDs. Essential pressed and sold physical CDs to shops, chains, and online merchants in Europe. That's a lot of vendors to keep track of. You can see how it might be daunting to an emerging artist. David Whitehead explained his philosophy towards some of these vendors. I prefer to get accounted to monthly by TuneCore, as opposed to quarterly by Red Eye, and for a one-time flat fee of $25 rather than paying 10% monthly fees. The big advantage for anyone supplying the digital service providers, download stores like Amazon and iTunes, direct, or via TuneCore, is you get paid monthly. Over the last 12 months, we've averaged over $3,000 per month in income from iTunes sales on that record. Within three weeks of the digital files being available online on our own websites, we sold enough to cover our recording costs, which added up to $49,000, and included travel, the mixing engineer, graphic design, flights, and extra musicians. Based on my own experience, that seemed amazing to me. With a standard record deal, it would normally have taken six months to a year to recoup those costs. And then there would have been other miscellaneous costs to recoup. The music video, there wasn't one. That open bar after the concert. The car service to the airport. Although Red Eye sold 41% of the total units, the income generated from those sales was only 19% of the total pie, which illustrates how expensive it is to sell records in stores. Conversely, Top Spin sold only 14% of the total units, but they generated 29% of the total income, largely due to the fact that we were selling deluxe edition packages direct to consumers without having to give a percentage to retailers. The $59,850 cost of making this record was only part of what it cost to prepare it for market. All told, the total costs to self-release the album were $315,000, building the website, paying for servers, design fees, promotion, manufacturing, etc. That's a lot more than any indie band could ever afford. We wound up generating $964,000 in total income. So minus the $315,000 in expenses, that left us with $649,000, 50% of which went to Eno, leaving me with $324,500. Since we were the record company, we paid our own mechanicals out of our profit. I was elated. Here, finally, was the future. I made $324,500 on this self-distributed record, compared to the $58,000 I made on the standard royalty deal record grown backwards, and the two sold nearly the same number of copies, $140,000 for grown backwards and $160,000 for everything that happens. Wow, the writing is on the wall here. Well, that enthusiasm might be justified if you can afford the $315,000 that we paid to assemble the apparatus needed to make, sell, and market a record. It should be pointed out that some of those costs were startup, learning-as-you-go costs. Presumably they wouldn't be as high down the road as the infrastructure has been built. Whenever I get too excited about these figures... I need to remind myself that I splurged on the grown backwards recording costs, which came in at $218,000. I didn't have to front that money. It came out of the advance from none such. The recording costs for everything that happens were $49,000, so if I had kept the costs similarly low for grown backwards, then, redoing the math, I could have made $167,000 more than I ended up making on that album. My net for Grown Backwards would then have been about $225,000. So in this hypothetical scenario in which the recording costs were equal, I actually would have made only about $89,000 more on the somewhat self-distributed Everything That Happens. That's still quite nice, and if you amortize that $323,000 over the two years of writing and recording, it's a salary of about one hundred and sixty dollars a year. Way better than an elementary school teacher in New Jersey. For the record, I think most teachers are woefully underpaid. But if everything that happens had been a real solo record, if it had been just me like it was on Grown Backwards, then I would have walked home with the full $626,000 as my net income. Now we're talking. That's nearly three times what I made with Grown Backwards, even assuming that that record could have been made equally cheaply.
Of course, Grown Backwards would have been a completely different record had I chosen to record with fewer musicians, and everything that happens wouldn't have been the same without the Eno collaboration. It's really hard to compare records, given all the variables, but you get my point. With this particular situation, one could indeed imagine living off sales of one's recordings via self-distribution. It's even enough income to allow time for writing, or the occasional flop. Can this distribution model eventually net enough so that even an emerging artist could live on their own music sales, excluding live performing income? Could more musicians and composers have a life in music this way? There are no guarantees. But if you don't need a huge recording budget, tour support, and a big marketing effort, then this approach is worth exploring. Self-distributing didn't work as well for me in Europe and in the UK as it did domestically. We didn't do extensive marketing. I did press, and we gave a free advance copy of one song as an exclusive to some music blogs, but there weren't the traditional ads and paid radio promotions. In North America, music blogs are replacing print music journalism. They respond faster to breaking news and to feedback from their readers, and they can link to video clips, streaming music, and websites provided by the artist. Music fans get more and more of their information from the Internet in North America, so there was a little bit of a viral effect that happened here, without us having the usual expense of ads and conventional marketing. The Europeans in general aren't buying or reading as much stuff online as North Americans do. Digital sales are generally lower there, and they seem still to look to print as their main source of news. There are lots of countries with varying musical tastes and different languages, so one campaign can't blanket the whole region, as it can in North America. I toured for about a year after Everything That Happens came out, on and off through 2008 and 2009. The shows were super well received. We all had a wonderful time performing. I made some money from the tour as well, but it was expensive to mount. I examined the receipts when it was done, and if most shows hadn't sold out, I would have lost money. That's not a good omen for anyone who isn't sure they can fill seats. I'm still not convinced the tour really helped sell records. Maybe it helped a little. But not, for example, like getting wide radio play would have. Some songs were played on NPR and on indie and college stations, but the larger, more commercial stations never jumped on board. That's not a surprise. The record is what it is. However, well after the record came out, another way of getting the songs in front of people presented itself. And this opportunity highlights a few of the advantages of retaining some ownership and publishing rights. Licensing Another source of income for recording artists is licensing. That means letting a movie, TV show, or commercial use your song in exchange for cash. I don't license songs to commercials, but I still see more money from licensing songs to films and TV than I do in actual record sales. Those who allow their songs to be used in ads can become instantly familiar to a wide audience overnight, or at least that one song does. This too is a form of marketing, one that is usually completely separate from and unreliant on the record company. A few years after Everything That Happens came out, Oliver Stone included a substantial number of songs from it in his movie Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps. A fair number of people commented on the fine songs we'd written for that film, not realizing that the record they appeared on had been out for quite some time. That confirmed for me that while distribution is moving online relatively quickly, getting the word out still requires some traditional marketing effort and muscle, and money. For artists without recognizable names, that would have been even more true. Eno and I might be exceptions, but films will often license a song from a record or band that isn't that well known. I suspect that there's a cool factor at work. Many film directors are covert music geeks. The late singer-songwriter Nick Drake didn't sell a lot of records and wasn't that well-known, but whoever handles his publishing is doing okay. His songs have been used more than once in big ad campaigns, movies, and TV shows. If you hold on to the rights and your song is sampled, that too becomes a source of income. If a song is sampled by another artist, it's usually because of a musical or sonic quality, not because it was already a hit. In fact, sampling a hit is anathema, so the obscure artist has a better shot. 
Even a relative unknown can sometimes find himself with a surprise source of income if his song is sampled. But that income is always more significant for the writer if he has held on to a good percentage of those publishing rights. The more a writer or band holds on to their publishing, or even, when possible, their master recording rights, the more they will benefit from income sources like these, though it might take a while. One licensing deal can provide more income than a whole tour, and certainly more than royalties from CD sales through a label. Often a band or songwriter will feel it's necessary to give away some of their publishing for the cash in hand that will get them through their struggling years. But if you can hold on to that stuff, it turns out much better for you pretty quickly. Musicians often don't have pension plans, sad to say, so planning ahead can be critical. Some decades ago, when MTV was doing well, pulling in viewers and making money, the big record labels decided that the commonly held idea that MTV was providing free exposure for the label's acts wasn't acceptable anymore. They began to see MTV reaping profits while the record labels were providing all the network's content for free. So the labels made deals with MTV to continue providing music videos, but now for a flat fee. The labels said that they would then funnel some of that considerable income back to their artists. But I don't think they ever did. Eventually, MTV played fewer and fewer music videos, turning instead to cheap reality shows, which they could own and syndicate. Part of that change had to be motivated by not wanting to pay the record labels for content. A similar situation is now developed on the Internet. Lots of websites and apps such as Pandora and Spotify have emerged that stream music to their customers. This isn't about giving you access to songs you have previously purchased, but rather about hearing music you don't physically or digitally own. Spotify has reached agreements with the major labels, just as MTV did before them. And just as before, the artist, who should be entitled to a share of that equity, is missing from the equation. Maybe this time around that will get fixed, and if it does, then streaming will be an additional source of income for artists, especially if the artists hold on to the rights to their songwriting and recordings. But that remains to be seen. Freedom versus Pragmatism The models I've outlined aren't absolute. They can morph and evolve. Amy Mann and her manager initially went the 100% DIY route, but they eventually made deals with various distributors to get their records into retail outlets. In the future, we will see more artists mix and match elements of the models I've described to create hybrid deals. The business is more flexible than it used to be, which is a good thing for both veteran and emerging artists. We read over and over that the music business is going down the drain, but this is actually a great time to be making music, full of possibility. A life in music, which is what we're actually talking about, not just fame and glory, is indeed still possible. The wealth of options can be paralyzing, though. Many who take a good amount of cash up front will never know the benefits of long-range thinking. Hanging on to more rights in exchange for less money is usually the wiser course of action. Mega pop artists will still need that mighty push and marketing effort for their new releases, and that's something that only traditional record companies, or record companies in combination with concert promoters, can provide. For others, what we now call a record label could be replaced by a new entity. A small company that essentially funnels the income and invoices from the various entities and vendors, and keeps all the different accounts in order. A consortium of mid-level artists who share the services of such an entity could make that model work. A kind of music business co-op. United Musicians, the company that Michael Hausman founded, is one such example. He mentioned to me that there's a scale below which such an organization cannot support itself. One needs to have a number of artists on board to amortize the costs of staff, publicists, administration, and rent. But since most artists aren't in sync, one is often writing while another is recording, this can work. The administrative staff doesn't suddenly find itself without work or the business without a steady income when one artist decides that he or she needs to hole up to write new material. No single model will work for everyone. There's room for all of us. Like a lot of people, I like Rihanna's Umbrella and Christina Aguilera's Ain't No Other Man. Sometimes corporate pop is what I want, but I don't want it at the expense of everything else. 
At times it has seemed that we have been offered a Hobson's choice, corporate pop or nothing. But perhaps that's no longer the case. This is exciting. Ultimately, all these scenarios have to satisfy the same human urges. What do we need music to do? How do we visit the land in our head and the place in our heart that music is so good at taking us to? Isn't that what we really want to buy, sell, trade, or download? We can't, though. Not really. No matter what format music is delivered in, the experience we treasure, the thing we value, is still ephemeral and intangible. Advertisers have always tempted us with the idea that the pleasurable sensations, the joy and surprise of music, can be bottled or affixed to some tangible artifact, like perfume, shoes, jeans, or a car. But it can't be. It's a slippery beast, and that's part of its appeal. Chapter 8 How to Make a Scene I'm not referring to how best to insult your host at a dinner party. I'm referring to that special moment when a creative flowering seems to issue forth from a social nexus, a clump of galleries, a neighborhood, or a bar that doubles as a music club. I've often asked myself why such efflorescence happens when and where it does, rather than at some other time, in some other place. The bar and music club CBGB that was located on the Bowery in New York was one such place. Over the years, people have asked me if I sensed that something special was going on there in the mid to late 70s. I did not. It seems to me that there is at least as much musical creativity going on around town now as there was then. It just isn't focused on one particular bar or neighborhood. I remember hanging out at the bar at CBGB watching other bands play, and sure, sometimes I'd think, wow, that band is really good. But just as often I'd think, that band really sucks, too bad they're such nice guys. The exact same thing happens now when I go out and hear music. Sometimes I'm blown away, and other times it's a wasted evening. Back then, my bandmates and I would rehearse in our nearby loft, and then play at CBGB as often as was practical. But that was just what we did. It didn't seem in any way special. We felt like a typical group of artists struggling to survive, as they always have. Our days and even nights were often routine, boring. It wasn't like a movie, where everyone's constantly hopping from one inspirational moment or exciting place to the next and consciously making a revolution. Besides, CBGB was a dump in a part of town that was pretty much ignored, a factor I might have undervalued. I wasn't aware of any revolution in the making, if one could even call it that. But I was conscious that I and many others were rejecting much of the music that had come before us, and that this sentiment was pervasive at that time. But so what? Everyone was doing that in their own way, rejecting things and moving on. It's just a part of discovering who you are, it's nothing special. As I remember it, things kicked in at CBGB in 1974, when Tom Verlaine and a few others persuaded owner Hilly Crystal to allow them to play for the door at what was then a biker bar on the Bowery. Playing for the door meant that the bar charged a small admission fee, which went to the band, and Hilly in turn reaped the money from all the new patrons who had wandered in and were now buying beers. It was an equitable deal. Both sides benefited. The bar hadn't been drawing many customers at the time, so Hilly didn't really have a lot to lose. I will argue in the rest of this chapter that the venue and its policies make a music scene happen as much as the creativity of the musicians. So Tom and Hilly deserve a lot of credit, because with their simple agreement, they opened the door just a crack, and that allowed the emergence of a scene. When my friends and I gravitated to New York City around 1974, I initially slept on the floor of a loft belonging to a painter who happened to live a block from CBGB. Patti Smith and Tom's band, Television, had just started playing there, and my friends and I realized that maybe, possibly, our project, which was about to become Talking Heads, might be able to play there too. That prospect spurred us all on. We began to rehearse in earnest, I was already writing songs and dribs and drabs on my own anyway, and I suspect, despite my wondering in the previous chapter if artists would even create without an outlet, that I would have been doing so with or without CBGB across the street. But knowing there was a possible venue for our songs focused my energies, and I began to churn out more of them, and the band that became Talking Heads eventually began to rehearse them. 
CBGB was, from a structural point of view, a perfect, self-actuating, self-organizing system. A biological system, in a way. A coral reef, a root system, a termite colony, a rhizome, a neural network. An emergent entity governed by a few simple rules that Hilly established at the start. Rules that made it possible for the whole scene to emerge, and subsequently, to flow and flourish with a life all its own. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. It's not like there was a policy statement or flyer with rules on it posted anywhere. Later on, I came to realize that you can sometimes tell in advance whether or not a given situation will develop into a vibrant scene. As I've said, it doesn't depend entirely on the inspiration and creativity of the individuals hanging out there. A confluence of external factors helps encourage the latent talent in a community to flower. In the rest of this chapter, I will elucidate some of those factors. This might not be definitive, but it's a start. 1. There must be a venue that is of appropriate size and location in which to present new material. This sounds kind of obvious, but it's worth saying because not every space works for every kind of music. As I explained in Chapter 1, where music is heard can determine the sort of music created by the artists who perform there. It might seem dispiriting to acknowledge that humble brick and mortar can shape what pours out of a creative soul, but this reality doesn't take anything away from the talent or skill of composers or performers. Their songs and performances will be, one hopes, absolutely heartfelt, passionate, and true. It's just that we channel our ineffable creative urges, sometimes unconsciously, into figuring out what is appropriate for a given situation. The mere existence of CBGB facilitated the creation of the bands and songs that touched our hearts and souls. It was the right size, the right shape, and in the right place. It was fairly intimate, but not quiet. There was always bar chatter and jukebox music, so it didn't have the aura of a concert hall or a vibe like the bottom lines a few blocks away where people felt compelled to sit quietly and listen. The room, its physical and social setting, proposed that if there were to be any theatricality employed by the performers, it would be of a type that used limited technical means. There was no space for elaborate facilities or high-tech creations, and everybody who was in the wings about to go on stage, was in plain view. That meant that no one would even consider staging theatrical spectacles that required elaborate lighting and sets. That sort of stuff just wasn't physically possible there. I've always liked creative restrictions, and here, happily, many were already in place. A show using extremely modest means still left plenty of room for gesture, costume, and sound. Poor theater, as Polish theater innovator Jerzy Grotowski called it. He wrote that theater is about the discarding of masks, the revealing of the real substance, a totality of physical and mental reaction. He went on to write, Here we can see the theater's therapeutic function for people in our present-day civilization. It is true that the actor accomplishes this act, but he can only do so through an encounter with the spectator. Taking Grotowski at his word, I would argue that some of the most innovative and viscerally moving theater in America at that time wasn't being made in proper theaters, but taking place on the stage of this grotty club on the Bowery and in the clubs that imitated it in the years that followed. There were some innovative theater groups that emerged downtown around that same period. The Worcester Group and Mabu Mines come to mind, and they were similarly direct, immediate, and real, despite being in no way naturalistic. But in CBGB, a new theater was emerging that was both naked and confrontational. And you could dance to it, in a manner of speaking. 2. The artists should be allowed to play their own material. This might seem obvious too, but it's important. Hilly was open to original music, and much of what happened there flowed from that stance. There were very few outlets then for bands and musicians who didn't already have record deals, and the promotional and financial support that used to go with them, or who weren't willing to cover other people's songs. There were some folk clubs over on Bleecker Street, but they didn't seem to be interested in rock music as a serious musical form. By serious, I don't mean difficult or virtuosic. Jazz clubs could be found in some nearby lofts and lounges, but they wouldn't work as venues for a rock band either. 
To most club owners, it must have been inconceivable that any sane person would be interested in hearing a band they'd never heard on the radio before, or heard of at all, for that matter. When Hilly and a few others took the tentative step of letting bands play their own material for small groups of friends and beer drinkers, it was therefore a big deal. When Talking Heads eventually made our first record and began playing outside of New York City, no such network of open-minded club owners existed. As a result, we played in whatever ridiculous venue would let us play our own material, like a student center at a university where some kid thought we could amplify our music through his home stereo, a pizza parlor in Pittsburgh, and a kid's birthday party in New Jersey. However, over the course of a few years, a network of small clubs established itself, and bands like ours could connect the dots and play all across North America and Europe. But that came later. The fact that there came into existence a forum within which anyone with a band and some songs could broadcast their insights, fury, and lunacy didn't just get the water flowing, it actually helped bring the water into existence. 3. Performing musicians must get in for free on their off nights, and maybe get free beer too. There wasn't much camaraderie among the bands at CBGB. Not that there was antagonism, but everyone wanted to stake out their own creative territory, and aligning oneself with others might have run the risk of dilution. Nevertheless, Hilly let many musicians in for free once they'd played there, so it soon became a de facto hangout. None of us complained that our fellow musicians weren't paying to see us. We weren't paying to see them either. There were always a few local band members leaning on the bar with a beer in hand, a precursor to the way, years later, club and restaurant owners would ply models with free drinks to get them to linger at downtown lounges and thus draw more, mostly male, customers. At CBGB, this was a more organic process, less calculated and cynical. It also meant that there was always an audience for whatever band was playing. They might not be paying all that much attention, but at least there were bodies there. So even a band that had no following had some folks listening. Sort of. 4. There must be a sense of alienation from the prevailing music scene. A successful scene presents an alternative. Some of us eventually came to realize that we wouldn't feel as comfortable anywhere else, and that the music in other places would probably be terrible. The hangout, then, is the place for the alienated to share their misanthropic feelings about the prevailing musical culture. That didn't mean we all reacted to this alienation in the same way. If you were to believe the press, the CB's scene was only made up of a handful of bands, but that just wasn't true. Despite being lumped under the punk rock moniker, all sorts of bands played there. There were progressive rock bands, jazz fusion acts, jam bands, and folk singers who seemed as if they'd strayed to the wrong end of Bleecker Street. The mumps were power pop, and one might even say that the shirts were the precursors to the musical Rent. We were all disaffected and dissatisfied with the rock dinosaurs who roamed the earth back then. We expressed that disaffection in different ways, but here was a place where we could commiserate and plot a new course. The glam acts that already existed, New York Dolls, Bowie, Lou Reed, and a few others, were considered cool and provocative, but almost everything associated in any way with the mainstream seemed hopelessly irrelevant. The radio was dominated by the Eagles and the California sound, hair bands and disco, all of which seemed to exist in another universe. We liked a lot of disco, but the prevailing rocker attitude was that dance music was manufactured and therefore not authentic or heartfelt. The highest ideals of live performance at the time seemed irrelevant to us as well. Arena rock and the mega R&B ensembles were legendary for their elaborate shows, enormous spectacles with pyrotechnics and spaceships. These shows were light years away from any connection to our reality. They were an escape, a fantasy, and hugely entertaining, but they had no relationship to any sense of what it felt like to be young, energetic, and frustrated. Those artists sure didn't speak to or for any of us, even if they did have some good songs. If we wanted to hear music that spoke directly to us, it was clear that we'd have to make it ourselves. If no one else liked it, well, so be it. But at least we would have some songs that meant something to us. 
Meanwhile, the art world in Soho, just a few blocks west of the Bowery, was dominated by the twin poles of conceptualism and minimalism. Pretty dry stuff, for the most part. But the drones and trance-inducing repetition emanating from the avant-garde composers associated with that scene, such as Philip Glass and Steve Reich, somehow took that minimalist aesthetic and made it engaging, and aspects of it found their way into punk rock. You can trace connections from Tony Conrad's one-note compositions to the Velvet Underground, Noi, and Faust, and from there to bands like Suicide and Onward. The trance sound made its way onto the club stages as well, with the volume and distortion turned way up. Pop art from the 60s lingered on as a movement, mutating and becoming more ironic as it drifted further from its origins. Compared to some of the dour work of the conceptualists and minimalists, one felt that at least these artists had a sense of fun. Warhol, Rauschenberg, Rosenquist, Lichtenstein, and their kin were about embracing, in a peculiar, ironic way, a world with which we were familiar. They accepted that pop culture was the water in which we all swam. I think I can speak for a lot of the musicians in New York at that time and say that we genuinely liked a lot of pop culture and that we appreciated workmen like Songcraft. Talking Heads did covers of 1910 Fruit Gum Company and The Trogs, and Patti Smith famously reworked the uber-primitive song Gloria, as well as the soul song Land of a Thousand Dances. Of course, our cover tunes were very different than those we would have been expected to play if we had been a bar band that played covers. That would have meant Fleetwood Mac, Rod Stewart, Donnie and Marie, Hart, ELO, or Bob Seger. Don't get me wrong, some of them had some great songs, but they sure weren't singing about the world as we were experiencing it. The earlier, more primitive pop hits we'd first heard on the radio as suburban children now seemed like diamonds in the rough to us. To cover those songs was to establish a link between one's earliest experience of pop music and one's present ambitions, to revive that innocent excitement and meaning. If I were to diagram the art-music connections, I might say that the Ramones and Blondie were pop art bands, while Talking Heads were minimalist or conceptual art with an R&B beat. Suicide was minimalism with rockabilly elements. And Patti Smith and Television were romantic expressionists, with a sometimes slightly surrealist slant. Of course, it isn't as simple as that. You can't really align everything and anything with art movements. One thing the bands did have in common was that we were all working within the framework of a popular form we loved and had in recent years become alienated from. As a result, we would all occasionally look for inspiration elsewhere in other mediums like fine art, poetry, art actions, drag performances, and circus sideshows. All served as points of reference for us. Being forced to look outside of music was a good thing. It may have been done out of desperation, but it pushed everyone to make something new. 5. Rent must be low, and it must stay low. CBGB was in a rough neighborhood. Now there are gourmet food shops and fancy restaurants nearby, but at that time, the Lower East Side and the area around the Bowery was in pretty bad shape. Winos were everywhere. It wasn't romantic to see one of them pull down his pants in the associated supermarket and take a dump in the aisle. It was just disgusting and depressing, as was much of what we had to deal with around there. But the rents were cheap. $150 a month for the place that Tina, Chris, and I shared on Christie Street, though there was no toilet, shower, or even heat. You get what you pay for. In the winter, it was sometimes hard to tell whether someone you'd see passed out in the snow was merely drunk or high, or if that comatose body on the sidewalk was a dead person. Our apartment was near an area with the cheapest, skankiest hookers in town. Further east, heroin was sold pretty much openly on the street corners, and the clientele used the abandoned buildings nearby as shooting galleries. Empty glassine envelopes marked with the logos of the various brands could be seen all over the sidewalks. Succeeding in this world, becoming a downtown star wasn't exactly making it in the music business in any conventional sense. We might feel we were making it because we were being accepted by our peers, but all our parents and other outsiders could see was that we were still living in squalor. 
But surviving and creating here meant you were part of a place where you could have a tiny sense of community. Even though by today's standards the rents in the area were insanely cheap, the three of us who began talking heads all shared a loft to save money, like everyone else was doing. The Blondie loft was just a little south of CB's on the Bowery, and Arturo Vega, who guided the Ramones' style, had a place just around the corner. A certain romanticism about the cultural history of the area did linger in our minds. People who were huge inspirations to us were still neighborhood fixtures. William Burroughs lived nearby, as did Allen Ginsberg, and we imagined that we were in some ways continuing their legacy. Though not musicians per se, they were as inspirational as the best music that had come before us. Though neither Ginsberg nor Burroughs could be classified as romantics, they, and their attitude toward life and art, were part of a funky mystique that gave the squalor a kind of glamour in our eyes. Cheap rent allows artists, musicians, and writers to live without much income during their formative years. It gives them time to develop, and it gives creative communities that nurture and support their members time to form. Everybody knows that when these neighborhoods get gentrified, both the locals and the struggling creative types get pushed out. But not every neighborhood with cheap rents gives rise to a scene. I recently lived in the West 30s in Manhattan, where the rents used to be cheap, but no community ever arose there. Affordable rent alone is not enough. 6. Bands must be paid fairly. At CBGB, bands got either the entire door or a pretty good percentage of it, while Hilly continued to get the profits from the bar, which improved considerably as bands began to draw an audience. Talking Heads had day jobs early on, but after about a year we were able to devote ourselves to music full-time. Once we began packing the place, which meant a modest 350 paying customers, that door percentage was enough to pay our bills. Try that policy at a club today. CBGB was our safety net, both creatively and financially. When I later heard about bands actually paying to play in certain clubs, I knew things had been perverted in a terrible way. The desperate, innate desire to create and perform had been exploited rather than supported. It was like taking a basic human need, like wanting to love and be loved, and then finding a way to make money from it. Sick. It was a sign of the times. The me first decade had begun. 7. Social transparency must be encouraged. At CB's, there were small dressing rooms without doors, so any passers-by could watch you unpacking your gear and tuning up. There was no privacy. Annoying sometimes, but maybe a good thing. Junkies and lovers managed to find places to hide elsewhere, but performers had to be transparent. Diva behavior was rendered difficult or impractical, the physical situation would have made it look silly. The performers were obliged to interact and mingle with their audience. There was no VIP area. The toilets were legendarily nasty. I'm pretty sure that for a while they didn't have seats. One might have been smashed. This wasn't a factor that helped the scene. It was not charming or romantic. While being forced to put on a show with limited means and having to mingle might have actually been productive, busted toilets in clubs are just sad and mean. There was always a jukebox playing when the bands weren't. Hilly filled much of it with 45s by the local bands who played there, so if a band had paid for a song to be recorded and pressed up as a 45, you knew at least one jukebox in town where it could find a home. Of course, there were also plenty of talismanic 45s by other inspirational bands on that jukebox. The Stooges, the Mysterians. Lenny Kay's Nuggets compilation could have taken up the whole jukebox, and everyone would have nodded in recognition. Oddly, as musically disparate as the performers of CBGB were, we drew inspiration from a lot of the same songs and bands. Every night we received these oral reminders of where we all came from, where we were at that moment, and where we were going. This insular selection might seem a little dogmatic in retrospect. God forbid someone snuck a jazz or folk 45 in there. But it provided a sense of solidarity, something rare for New Yorkers whose monstrous egos often stood in the way of forging a community. The jukebox was, in a certain way, crowdsourced, and it served as a kind of sonic adhesive, 
a social glue. The jukebox leveled the playing field as much as the lack of privacy in the dressing rooms. Plenty of music clubs are set up like movie theaters. When the show is over, everyone is asked to pay their bar and snack bills and leave. You can't go to most of these clubs just to hang out, because they have a schedule of specific show times. And if you show up before the show you came to see and there's an earlier set, you're not allowed in to see it. Needless to say, no one hangs out at these places. There's no community of musicians, and a scene can't begin to develop. There is, I'm told, a community of waitresses and bartenders, the few people who are allowed to be there all night. Bill Bragan booked a terrific few years at Joe's Pub in New York, but as much as I enjoyed attending those shows, I realized that the evenings were very structured. After a performance, I usually went right home. The music might have been excellent, but there was no possibility for casual or chance encounters. People only saw what they bought a ticket to see. Places like this make more money in the short run because they can charge a separate admission for every show and have two, sometimes three acts a night, each with their own paying crowd. But there's also no loyalty, nor any customers to fall back on who trust the place as much as the music. You know a scene is developing when you hang out at a place and you have no idea who's going to be playing. There are a few places like this in New York still, though they tend to be small, like New Blue in the East Village and Barbès and Zebulon in Williamsburg. By the time this book comes out, they might not be around. 8. It must be possible to ignore the band when necessary. CBGB originally had a long bar, and you had to walk past it and then past the little bandstand in order to reach a pool table located farther back. You could pass the time playing pool while watching the band, sort of, they'd be facing away from you, or while waiting for the next band to go on. CBGB was long and narrow, and only a small group of fans could actually stand in front of the stage. Most of the audience would end up at the bar or hanging around the pool table, and those people behind the bands were often barely paying attention. It doesn't sound ideal, but maybe not having to perform under intense scrutiny, it always seemed as if only the few folks in front were really paying attention, is important, even beneficial. This odd, relaxed, and even somewhat insulting arrangement allowed for more natural, haphazardly creative development. Later, Hilly resituated the stage. I'm avoiding the word remodeled and improved the sound system, which made CBGB one of the best sounding rooms in town. This seems incredibly enlightened, the sound system part anyway. Most club owners are loath to make technical improvements. As long as drinkers are congregating at the bar, why should they? I think Hilly had ulterior motives. I think he pictured a whole series of live recordings being made there that could have been another potential source of income for him. But who knows, maybe he was just being a decent guy. In a way, the casual setup reminded me of busking. When playing on the street, it was never hard to get one or two curious folks to stop and listen, but if you could get the ones who were walking purposely on their way somewhere else to pay attention, then you'd really made a breakthrough. Sometimes the person who seemed to have been playing pool all night was the one who came up to you afterward and said something that proved that they were the one who had really been listening. The Legacy of a Scene after some of the bands that emerged from CBGB were signed, they played there less and less. They went on the road or holed up writing and rehearsing new material, becoming a tiny bit more professional. Talking Heads was one of those bands. I remember writing in my East Village loft in the late 70s and then heading to CBGB's after I'd gotten something down. Going out was some kind of reward for me. CB's even found its way into a song we wrote, Life During Wartime, in which the club was imagined from the point of view of a member of a North American version of the Bader meinhof gang, urban guerrillas who missed being able to go to the clubs where they used to hang. Being out in the world more, we all came to miss hanging out in an old familiar place. I kept returning to the club throughout the following decades. The bands of the post-punk era, which as I write this are being rediscovered, filled the gap left by those of us who were on tour. They pushed their music and performances further, too. Some of them really took the ball and ran with it, making bands like ours seem tame by comparison. DNA, 
Bush Tetris, and the contortions brought newer and sometimes more radical musical approaches to the club. In a way, they kept the promise we had made. They continued to make raw and innovative music, and for years, the club remained a place to catch waves of emerging musicians. As time went on, and you could hear new bands at a variety of venues, CBGB hung in there, and Hilly never entirely renovated or turned the place into a tourist trap, or a theme restaurant, bless his heart. Though there were rumors of a faux East Village to be built in Vegas that would include a recreation of CBs. The place used to shock visitors and tourists who expected some kind of imposing rock palace. CBGB doesn't have grandeur, but it was a place to hear what was bubbling up for quite a while. I remember seeing a wonderful band there in the mid-90s, Chibo Mato, and then a few weeks later seeing chocolate genius Mark Anthony Thompson in the CBGB lounge next door. The club remained a vital place for a surprisingly long time. There was a period after that when I didn't go there much, because the music I was interested in was elsewhere. And then there was the whole transformation of the Bowery and the surrounding area into a chic boho zone. A change that spelled the end of those old places that weren't pulling in lots of cash, except from the souvenir t-shirts. I didn't miss CB's when it shut down. It wasn't a vital place anymore, and the waves of nostalgia that were being whipped up as its closing approached were a little obnoxious. There were other clubs that had also fostered scenes, but that weren't mourned quite as strenuously. The original Knitting Factory, El Mocambo, Area, Don Hills, and Haraz, to name a few. I guess CB's had a grittiness that made for a better story. I tried to help broker a deal between the building's owner, a charity focusing on the homeless, and CB's, but I could sense that nostalgia was overriding reason, and that there would be no compromise. The rules I've enumerated aren't hard and fast. Think of them as guidelines that can steer you away from what might at first seem like obvious or logical moves. One might, for example, think that making patrons pay rapt attention to the bands is key, but maybe it's the exact opposite that fosters devotion to bands and musicians. What's important is that local talent of whatever type is given an outlet. Newer places in the New York area have spawned scenes recently, I don't know if the new venues follow all of my rules, but they are certainly relaxed places. You can hang out, and musicians come to hear other musicians. It's a real testament to how much creativity we all harbor that scenes emerge the way they do. People and neighborhoods that were never suspected of being huge creative hubs, Detroit, Manchester, Sheffield, Seattle, exploded when folks who didn't even know they had it in them suddenly blossomed and inspired everyone else around them. Chapter 9 Amateurs Music is made of sound waves that we encounter at specific times and places. They happen, we sense them, and then they're gone. The music experience isn't just those sound waves, but the context in which they occur as well. Many people believe that there's some mysterious and inherent quality hidden in great art, and that this invisible substance is what causes these works to affect us as deeply as they do. This ineffable thing hasn't yet been isolated, but we do know that social, historical, economic, and psychological forces influence what we respond to, just as much as the work itself. The arts don't exist in isolation. And of all the arts, music, being ephemeral, is the closest to being an experience more than it is a thing. It's yoked to where you heard it, how much you paid for it, and who else was there. The act of making music, clothes, art, or even food has a very different and possibly more beneficial effect on us than simply consuming those things. And yet for a very long time, the attitude of the state toward teaching and funding the arts has been in direct opposition to fostering creativity among the general population. It can often seem that those in power don't want us to enjoy making things for ourselves. They'd prefer to establish a cultural hierarchy that devalues our amateur efforts and encourages consumption rather than creation. This might sound like I believe there is some vast conspiracy at work, which I don't, but the situation we find ourselves in is effectively the same as if there were one. 
The way we are taught about music, and the way it's socially and economically positioned, affect whether it's integrated or not into our lives, and even what kind of music might come into existence in the future. Capitalism tends toward the creation of passive consumers, and in many ways, this tendency is counterproductive. Our innovations and creations, after all, are what keep many seemingly unrelated industries alive. Eating Canned Salmon by a Trout Brook In his book, Capturing Sound, How Technology Has Changed Music, Mark Katz explains that prior to 1900, the aim of music education in America was to teach students how to make music. The advent of the record player and recorded music in the early 20th century changed all that. I know what you must be thinking. I am someone who, to a large extent, has made his living off the sale and dissemination of my recordings. Is it really possible that I believe that the way technology changed how we receive music wasn't entirely a good thing for creative individuals like myself, or for us generally as a culture? Of course, people have always been able to go hear professional musicians performing in big cities. Even in small towns, paid entertainers played at dances and weddings, as they still do in many parts of the world. Not all music was played by amateurs. But a hundred years ago, most people didn't live in big cities. And for them, music was made locally, often by friends and family. Many people likely had never heard an opera or a symphony. Maybe a traveling group would pass through, but for the most part, people outside big cities had to be somewhat self-reliant when it came to musical performance. By the 1920s, a network of 10,000 regional performance centers called Chautauquas had been established to serve as a way for people to hear music and lectures brought in from other places. Alan DeSanayake, a cultural anthropologist and author of Homo Aestheticus, says that early on, she means prehistorically early on, all art forms were communally made, which had the effect of reinforcing a group's cohesion and thereby improving their chances of survival. In other words, writing, storytelling, music, and art had a practical use, from an evolutionary perspective. Maybe, like sports, making music can function as a game. A musical team can do what an individual cannot. Music making imparts lessons that reach well beyond songwriting and jamming. In the modern age, though, people have come to feel that art and music are the product of individual effort, rather than something that emerges from a community. The meme of the solitary genius is powerful and has affected the way we think about how culture came into being. We often think that we can and even must rely on blessed individuals to lead us to some new place, to grace us with their insight and creations, and naturally that person is never us. This isn't entirely a new idea, but the rise of commercially made recordings accelerated a huge shift in attitudes. Their promulgation meant that the more cosmopolitan music of folks who lived in the big cities, the music of professionals, and even the professional musicians in far-off countries could now be heard everywhere. Amateurs and local music makers must have been somewhat intimidated. As explained in Chapter 4, the first record players could record as well as play. So for a short while, every amateur had the possibility of becoming a recording artist. The quality of those recordings wasn't great, so there was a lot of spoken word, a lot of talking into the recorders, audio letters, audio postcards. The rough sounds of local singers and parlor players coexisted for a while with the recordings of professionals that the record player manufacturers were distributing. But fairly soon, the companies realized that more money could be made if the flow of music was one way, so the recording feature was eliminated. Much technology and contemporary culture, in which creative tinkering by non-professionals has been crippled by the efforts of computer and software companies, and by the enforcers and lobbyists behind copyright and intellectual property laws, displays this same tendency. Amateur music makers have had to take a back seat. So much for the market catering to the will of the people. John Philip Sousa felt strongly about the value of amateurs making music. Here's what he wrote in his 1906 essay, The Menace of Mechanical Music. This wide love for the art springs from the singing school, secular or sacred, from the village band, and from the study of those instruments that are nearest the people. 
There are more pianos, violins, guitars, mandolins, and banjos among the working classes of America than in all the rest of the world. But now the automatic music devices are usurping their places. For when music can be heard in the homes without the labor of study and close application, and without the slow process of acquiring a technique, it will be simply a question of time when the amateur disappears entirely. The tide of amateurism cannot but recede, until there will be left only the mechanical device and the professional executants. Then what of the national throat? Will it not weaken? What of the national chest? Will it not shrink? I love those phrases, the national throat, the national chest. They're kind of wit manic. The country dance orchestra of violin, guitar, and melodeon had to rest at times, and the resultant interruption afforded the opportunity for general sociability and rest among the entire company. Now a tireless mechanism can keep everlastingly at it, and much of what made the dance a wholesome recreation is eliminated. This is an interesting point, and it isn't made very often. Sousa is saying that the gaps between performances might in some ways be just as important, socially at least, as the performances themselves. The times when we're not being entertained are as important as the times when we are. Too much music or too much continuous music might not be a good thing. It's a little counterintuitive, but I'd be inclined to agree. To Sousa, the prospect of recorded music was a thought as unhappy and incongruous as eating canned salmon by a trout brook. He might have been a bit alarmist and cranky, but he wasn't entirely wrong about amateur music making. I myself didn't start out as a musical professional. For years, I only had ambitions to be an amateur who made music with friends for fun. Some of the most satisfying music I've made has come about as a result of naive enthusiasm rather than from professional considerations. Music making always involved socializing. So in the process, I've met people I wouldn't have otherwise. Music was a handy cover for my social awkwardness, and I learned a thing or two about getting along. Those are a lot of useful byproducts that have nothing to do with dexterity or virtuosic skills. The don't-give-a-shit attitude of the amateur is another precious commodity. The Spanish film director Fernando Trueba claims that many directors' best films are the ones they didn't care all that much about. These films, he says, have more soul than the films those same directors made when they intentionally set out to create their masterpiece. Amateurism or at least the lack of pretension associated with it, can be liberating. According to Mark Katz, many teachers believed that recorded music would encourage children to take up music. When the phonograph was new and schools were a little leery of adopting it, several prominent pedagogues argued in its favor. J. Lawrence Erb, for one, asserted that the total effect of mechanical players has been to increase interest in music and stimulate a desire to make music on one's own account. But if there was such an increase in the percentage of amateur musicians, it soon subsided. Though what the elite listened to prior to 1900 was certainly different from what the masses enjoyed, there was always some overlap between the two. The catchy tunes that littered popular Italian operas, music that we would consider high art today, were sung by farmers and played by brass bands in town squares. These arias were the pop music of their time. This popularity wasn't a result of capitulation, of ordinary folks being obliged to like music that was endorsed by their betters. It was genuinely popular music. And yet, it's probably true that as long as there has been an aristocracy or an elite, they have promulgated the idea that certain kinds of music and art are somehow better, more refined, more sophisticated, and can only be appreciated by the few. Recordings, however tinny or scratchy, made it possible for everyone to hear these sophisticated and accomplished artistes. Music education boomed, and soon the emphasis shifted. It became about learning and understanding musical forms rather than making them. The new pedagogical goal was to expose students to all kinds of music, in genres that were previously unavailable to them. Not only was the emphasis on listening, the expressed goal was to get the kids to appreciate the superiority of a certain kind of music over what some declared to be coarser, more popular forms. What is music good for? Is some music really better than other music? 
Who decides? What effect does music have on us that might make it good or not so good? Like Alan D. Sinayake, many believe that music must be useful to humanity, even if you can't fix a leaky sink with it. If it wasn't, it wouldn't have survived to play as prominent a role in our lives as it does. Furthermore, it's presumed that certain kinds of music have more beneficial effects than others. Some music can make you a better person, and by extension, other kinds of music might even be detrimental. And they don't mean it will damage your eardrums. Certainly it won't be as morally uplifting. The assumption is that upon hearing good music, you will somehow become a more morally grounded person. How does that work? The background of those defining what is good or bad goes a long way toward explaining this attitude. The use of music to make a connection between a love of high art and economic success and status isn't always subtle. Canadian writer Colin Etock points out that classical music has been piped into 7-Elevens, the London Underground, and the Toronto subways, and the result has been a decrease in robberies, assaults, and vandalism. Wow, powerful stuff. Music can alter behavior after all. This statistic is held up as proof that some music does indeed have magical, morally uplifting properties. What a marketing opportunity. But another view holds that this tactic is a way of making certain people feel unwelcome. They know it's not their music, and they sense that the message is, as Etoc says, move along, this isn't your cultural space. Others have referred to this as musical bug spray. It's a way of using music to create and manage social space. The economist John Maynard Keynes even claimed that many kinds of amateur and popular music do in fact reduce one's moral standing. In general, we are indoctrinated to believe that classical music, and maybe some kinds of jazz, possess a kind of moral medicine, whereas hip-hop, club music, and certainly heavy metal lack anything like a positive moral essence. It all sounds slightly ridiculous when I spell it out like this, but such presumptions continue to inform many decisions regarding the arts and the way they're supported. John Carey, an English literary critic who writes for the Sunday Times, wrote a wonderful book called What Good Are the Arts? that illustrates how officially sanctioned art and music gets privileged. Carey cites the philosopher Immanuel Kant. Now I say the beautiful is the symbol of the morally good, and that it is only in this respect that it gives pleasure. The mind is made conscious of a certain ennoblement and elevation above the mere sensibility to pleasure. So, according to Kant, the reason we find a given work of art beautiful is because we sense, but how do we sense this, I wonder, that some innate, benevolent, moral essence is tucked in there, elevating us, and we like that. In this view, pleasure and moral uplift are linked. Pleasure alone, without this beautiful entanglement, isn't a good thing, but packaged with moral uplift, pleasure is, well, excusable. That might sound pretty mystical and a bit silly, especially if you concede that standards of beauty just might be relative. In Kant's Protestant world, all forms of sensuality inevitably lead to loose morals and eternal damnation. Pleasure needs a moral note to be acceptable. When Goethe visited the Dresden Gallery, he noted the emotion experienced upon entering a house of God. He was referring to positive and uplifting emotions, not fear and trembling at the prospect of encountering the Old Testament God. William Hazlitt, the brilliant 19th century essayist, said that going to the National Gallery on Pall Mall was like making a pilgrimage to the Holy of Holies, an act of devotion performed at the Shrine of Art. Once again it would appear that this God of Art is a benevolent one, who will not strike young William down with a bolt of lightning for an occasional aesthetic sin. If such a punishment sounds like an exaggeration, keep in mind that not too long before Hazlitt's time, one could indeed be burned at the stake for small blasphemies. And if the appreciation of the finer realms of art and music is akin to praying at a shrine, then one must accept that artistic blasphemy also has its consequences. A corollary to the idea that high art is good for you is that it can be prescribed like medicine. Like a kind of inoculation, it can arrest and possibly even begin to reverse our baser tendencies. The romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote that the poor needed art 
to purify their tastes and wean them from their polluting and debasing habits. Charles Kingsley, a 19th century English novelist, was even more explicit. Pictures raise blessed thoughts in me. Why not in you, my brother? Believe it, toil-worn worker, in spite of thy foul alley, thy crowded lodging, thy thin, pale wife, believe it, thou too and thine will some day have your share of beauty. Galleries like Whitechapel in London were opened in working-class neighborhoods so that the downtrodden might have a taste of the finer things in life. Having done a little bit of manual labor myself, I can attest that sometimes beer, music, or TV might be all one is ready for after a long day of physically demanding work. Across the ocean, the titans of American industry continued this trend. They founded the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 1872, filling it with works drawn from their massive European art collections in the hope that the place would act as a unifying force for an increasingly diverse citizenry a matter of some urgency, given the massive number of immigrants who were joining the nation. One of the Met's founders, Joseph Hodges Choate, wrote, Knowledge of art in its higher forms of beauty would tend directly to humanize, to educate, and to refine a practical and laborious people. The late Thomas Hoving, who ran the Met in the 60s and 70s, and his rival, J. Carter Brown, who headed the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., both felt that democratizing art meant getting everyone to like the things that they liked. It meant letting everyone know that here, in their museums, was the good stuff, the important stuff, the stuff with that mystical aura. The Met did a promotion in the 60s in Life magazine offering 24 tiny reproductions of the paintings of Vincent van Gogh for $1.25. The idea was that, even reduced to the size of a postcard, Reproductions of verified masterpieces could still enlighten the American masses, and so cheap. Music was, and is, presented in the same way. The New York Times runs ads today for sets of lectures on how to listen to and understand classical music. It isn't about learning to play for your own enjoyment or self-expression. It's purely about learning to value the classics more than any music you and your pathetic friends might make. It's a little more expensive than the $1.25 the Met was asking for back in the day, but times have changed. The effect, however, is the same. To make you feel anxious and insecure about what you know and might already like, and to show you how to fix the situation. This line of thinking led Hoving and others to create the now ubiquitous Blockbuster Museum Show. The first one famously brought King Tut to the masses, or more precisely, it brought the masses to Tut. These shows reached out and made the Met and other like-minded museums into temples where all were welcome. Hard to remember, but the Met was once a fussy, dusty old place, and that show set it on its way to becoming super popular. Here are some blockbuster exhibit attendance figures from the Met. Treasures of Tutankhamen, 1978-1979, 1,360,957 visitors. The Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci, 1963, 1,077,521 visitors. The Vatican Collections, The Papacy and Art, 1983, 896,743 visitors. Painters in Paris, 1895 to 1950, 2000-2001, 883,620 visitors. Origins of Impressionism, 1994 to 1995. 794,108 visitors. The Horses of San Marco, 1980. 742,221 visitors. Picasso in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 2010. 703,256 visitors. Hoving did ride a bike, so he can't have been all about fancy art. In fact, his stint as Parks Commissioner, before he joined the Met, was incredibly fruitful, and changed the lives of many ordinary New Yorkers. He had been offered the job with no prior experience, so his success belies the idea that we should only put our trust in experts. It was he who closed Central Park to cars on Sundays, and he who established more than 100 pocket parks around the city on vacant lots and in weird, unused parcels of real estate. And now add to the list of blockbusters the 2011 Alexander McQueen Show, which had folks waiting in line in the sweltering heat for hours. 
To be honest, I can understand the McQueen show's popularity. The others are a bit more of a mystery to me. The presentation of the McQueen frocks involved a slightly more transgressive aura. They were presented as if they were part of a sci-fi opera, or a sexier version of a sword and sorcery world like Game of Thrones. The display created a slightly creepy alternative universe. It was much more than a parade of well-designed dresses on mannequins. That freaky other world that was hinted at seems genuinely populist, much more so than, say, the Horses of San Marco. John Kerry pretty much demolishes the idea that appreciating high art, and I'm going to assume we can transfer his arguments concerning fine art to music, is inherently good for you. How, he asks, can anyone believe that art or music encourages moral behavior? He concluded that assigning moral acuity to those who like high art is generally class-based. Meanings, he writes, are not inherent in objects. They are supplied by those who interpret them. High art is that which appeals to the minority whose social rank places them above the struggle for mere survival. The fact that such art has no practical use or none that is acknowledged, heightens its appeal. This line of reasoning leads him to the following conclusion about the art builds character attitude. One is saying, what I feel is more valuable than what you feel. In assuming that high art makes life worth living, there is an inherent arrogance toward the masses of people who don't partake of such forms, and an assumption that their lives are not worth as much, not as full. The religion of art makes people worse, because it encourages contempt for those considered inartistic. Although the idea is continually espoused that art is for all and that all can benefit from it, I wouldn't say that the presentation of art is entirely democratic. Though seemingly benign, too often it's a top-down version of culture. We want you all to look at it and listen to it and appreciate it, but don't even think you can ever make it yourselves. Moreover, what has been deemed real art has nothing in common with the reality of your daily life. 20th century British art critic Clive Bell wrote, To appreciate a work of art, we need to bring with us nothing from life, no knowledge of its ideas and affairs, no familiarity with its emotions. Quality works are said to be timeless and universal. People like Bell think that they would be good in almost any context. The Scottish Enlightenment philosopher David Hume insisted that an unvarying standard exists, and that it has been universally found to please in all countries and in all ages. The implication is that great work should, if it's truly great, not be of its time or place. We shouldn't be aware of how, why, or when it was conceived, received, marketed, or sold. It floats free of this mundane world, transcendent and ethereal. This is absolute nonsense. Few of the works that we now think of as timeless were originally thought of that way. Carey points out that Shakespeare wasn't universally favored. Voltaire and Tolstoy didn't care for him much, and Darwin found him intolerably dull. For many decades, his work was derided as low and popular. The same could be said for a great painter like Vermeer, who was rehabilitated only recently. As a society, we change what we value all the time. When I was working with the UK trip-hop band Morchiba, they extolled the virtues of an American 70s band called Manassas. I had dismissed that band when I was growing up. I thought they were great players, but not in any way relevant to me. But I could see that a younger generation of musicians, without my prejudices, might see them in a different light. I don't think that particular band ever got elevated to the timeless pedestal, but many others have been. I discovered Miles Davis's electric jams from the 70s relatively late. For the most part, they were critically frowned upon when they came out. But there might now be a whole generation who looks on those records as founding gospel, hugely inspirational. The artist Alex Melamede satirized beliefs about the mystical and moral power of art in a slideshow I saw, in which he showed photos of himself holding up reproductions of well-known masterpieces by such artists as Van Gogh and Cezanne in front of folks in rural Thailand. He was proposing, with tongue firmly in cheek, that exposure to these spiritual works would elevate these heathens, and that the artworks might even have some healing properties. It was hilarious, partly because Melamede kept a straight face throughout. 
but the point was clear. Out of context, the great Western masterpieces simply aren't the transformative icons they are considered to be back home. Funding Opera halls, ballets, and large art museums receive more funding, and not all from the government, than do popular art and what might be considered popular music venues. This is because of the edifying value ascribed to such institutions by people of a privileged economic and social class throughout much of the 20th century. This arrangement has become a little hard to parse in America, where much of the sponsorship and audience for these institutions no longer comes from old money. Class and wealth weren't always synonymous here, but maybe now they are becoming so. Joining the club that supports these venues is a way for a Texas oil man or an arms dealer to seem like a more cultured person. The image is so common as to be a cliché. Jet Rink, James Deans' character in the film Giant, starts off as oiled field trash, but when he strikes it big he tries to be a society sophisticate. For the most part, the new rich do try to behave and appreciate the same things as the old rich. Interesting that the titans of tech, the nerdopoly, didn't follow this pattern. They seem to have little interest in joining those clubs. Funding well-established institutions that play quality music isn't only about a search for status. It's also about keeping many kinds of music or art out of the temple, and discouraging amateurism in general. Hazlitt wrote that professional art is a contradiction in terms. Art is genius, and genius cannot belong to a profession. That would seem to imply that no amount of aid or support could possibly do much good. So why fund the arts at all? But I think he means that we should support these geniuses, and let the rest, the ungifted and the unprofessional, fall by the wayside. Marjorie Garber, in her book Patronizing the Arts, responded to this idea, writing, By this logic, arts funding was, in a sense, doomed by paradox. The training, schooling, and fostering of professional artists could only support the wrong artists, the non-geniuses. It's a bit of a catch-22. The work that has been approved and that appears in the institutions must be good because it's already been included in those institutions. Sort of a closed system, but I guess that's the idea. Outside of his work as an economist, Lord Keynes was involved in an organization called the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, SEMA, a government arts funding agency that later morphed into the Arts Council of Great Britain. It was established during World War II to help preserve British culture. Keynes, however, didn't like popular culture, so some things were deemed outside the provenance of the agency's mission. Keynes was not the man for wandering minstrels and amateur theatricals, observed Kenneth Clark, the director of London's National Gallery, and later the host of the popular television series, Civilization. Mary Glasgow, Keynes's longtime assistant, concurred. It was standards that mattered, and the preservation of serious professional enterprise, not obscure concerts in village halls. If we subscribe to the 19th century view that professionally made classical music is good for you and good for the ordinary man, then it follows that supporting it financially is more like funding a public health measure than underwriting entertainment. The funding of quality work is then inevitable, because it's for the good of all, even though we won't all get to see it. The votes came in, and the amateurs lost by a landslide. The Arts Council did, however, modify their brief after Keynes's death. There seemed to be no way, meanwhile, to teach folks how to develop their own talent, Hazlitt, Keynes, and their ilk seem to discount any knock-on effects or benefits that amateur music-making might have. In their way of thinking, we should be happy consumers, content to simply stand back and admire the glorious efforts of the appointed geniuses. How Keynes's friends like Virginia Woolf or his wife, the ballerina Lydia Lopakova, learned their own skills isn't explained. Elitism isn't the sole reason that the temples of quality are lavishly funded. There's also the undeniable glory of seeing your name on a museum or symphony hall. David Geffen may have gotten his start managing popular folk rockers, but now his name is on art museums and AIDS charities. I'm not criticizing this philanthropy, just noting that it's not being done with the aim of building a thriving network of folk rock clubs across the nation. Museums and symphony halls encourage this trend, 
by offering more and even smaller spots on which to chisel your name. I've seen donor names on hallways, cloakrooms, and even on the vestibule as you enter the toilets. Pity the poor donor who proudly points that one out. Soon every chair and doorknob will have someone's name on it. The writer, Alain de Beton, wonders why our residences and offices are often so enervating. I met a lot of people in the property business, developers as they are called in the United States, and asked them why they did what they did. They said it was to make money. I said, don't you want to do something else, build better buildings? Their idea of doing something better for society was to give money to the opera. This kind of compartmentalizing, separating one's livelihood from one's social aspirations, is part of the reason David Koch, the hidden hand behind a lot of ultra-conservatives and, reportedly the Tea Party movement in the United States, transforms himself into a respected arts patron by funding a theater at Lincoln Center. Or why a Swiss bank that helps U.S. depositors avoid paying taxes generously supports symphony halls and the ballet. It's almost as if there are moral scales, and by tossing some loot on one side, you can balance out the precarious situation your reputation might be getting into on the other. Industry titans have long directed a good amount of their wealth to the acquisition of the artifacts of high culture. After accumulating a collection, they need to find somewhere to park it. Henry Clay Frick was a coke and steel manufacturer and railway financier before he became the founder of the Jewel Box Museum on the Upper East Side that bears his name. The core collection of American art at the De Young Museum in San Francisco was donated by John D. Rockefeller III, whose wealth was originally generated by his grandfather, the founder of the energy monopoly Standard Oil. In 1903, Isabella Stewart Gardner used an inherited industrial fortune to build a Renaissance palace in the swamps outside Boston to house her own collection. Referring to oil magnate John Paul Getty, Carey writes, In his view, artworks are superior to people. His art collection was viewed as an external or surrogate soul. These spiritual values attributed to the artworks were transferred to the owner. That owner can be an individual or a nation, it applies to theaters and concert halls as well as paintings. The artworks or performance spaces become like spiritual bullion, underwriting the authority of the possessor. Such industrialists, whose wealth was sometimes brutally obtained, or whose moral judgment was entirely questionable, Getty felt that women on welfare should be denied the right to become parents, thus engaged in a kind of reputation laundering. Someone who supports good music must be a good person, too. I have no idea why the Mafia Dons and the Narco Gangsters haven't wised up to this fact. Wouldn't you love to see the Joey Bananas Opera Hall? Reputation laundering works because it's assumed that the folks who support fine music would be less likely to commit heinous crimes than the human flotsam that frequent a honky-tonk or a techno club. Participating in the scrums and mosh pits at pop concerts must be less morally and psychologically uplifting than sitting stock still in complete silence at the ballet. What if, in an imaginary country, a hypothetical king preferred house music to Mozart? Would that confer high status on raves? Would we then see buckets of funding being allocated for dance venues and witness top-flight architects vying to build pop music clubs out of titanium and imported marble? I don't think so. But seriously, why not? Why does the idea of equal funding for popular music seem ridiculous? Granted, pop music is supposed to stand on its own two feet financially. Pop stands for popular, after all. So by definition, it shouldn't need help. High art music isn't nearly as popular, so it needs financial support to stay afloat, to continue to have a presence in our culture. But there are plenty of innovative musicians who now work in a vaguely pop idiom, though that definition has been stretched a lot lately, who have had as much trouble surviving as symphony orchestras and ballet companies. For years, pop music was considered crassly commercial, a place where most musical choices were made solely in order to pander to the lowest common denominator and rake in more cash. Now, though, many would agree that there's a lot more than money behind all the work and innovation that falls within the increasingly fuzzy boundaries of the form. There's still plenty of soulless work being churned out, but I would argue that for sheer quantity of innovative output, there is more going on within pop music than in any other genre. 
The mere use of electric guitars, laptops, or samples, for example, doesn't mean the intentions of the composer or performer are any less serious than anything traditionally deemed high art. Much of it is done for the joy of it, with no hope of having a commercial hit, though some hit songs can be innovative, too. Why not fund the venues where these young, emerging, and semi-amateur musicians can make and perform their own music? Why not invest in the future of music, instead of building fortresses to preserve its past? Pop Music Capitalist Tool Take pity on popular music. Leftist critics like the late Theodor Adorno felt that popular music worked like a drug pacifying and numbing the masses so that they could be easily manipulated. Adorno felt that the public in general had bad taste, but he generously maintained that it wasn't their fault. It was the wily capitalists and their marketing folks who conspired to keep the plebes stupid by making them like pop music. People liked pop, he believed, because it was cynically tailored to mirror their sad, mass-produced world. The mechanized rhythms of popular music echoed the industrial production process. One can certainly imagine metal or techno evoking an assembly line or a giant pile driver. The feeling of surrendering to a sonic machine might even have a sublime aspect to it as well. Surrendering feels good. But Adorno doesn't credit us with the ability to enjoy industrial-sounding music without actually becoming a cog in the capitalist machine. In his view, Capitalist societies produced both workers and music via a kind of assembly line. That criticism is still levied at a lot of contemporary pop music. It's called cookie cutter now, or formulaic. But did Adorno really think that the music made by the giants of classical music didn't adhere to any tried and true formulas? I hear formulas in almost every genre. It's rare when something really shatters the rules and appears to be completely sui generis. Besides, you can be a headbanger without accepting your horrible factory job. Any kid will tell you that, yes, their music is both an escape and a survival mechanism, and that sometimes the music gives them hope and inspiration. It doesn't just placate and pacify. Adorno's ideal was Beethoven, and he felt that subsequent trends in German music were corrupted. It is this lack of experience of the imagery of real art, he wrote which is at least one of the formative elements of the cynicism that has finally transformed the Germans, Beethoven's people, into Hitler's people. Here we go again, linking music with moral and ethical values. Adorno maintained that such music, the work of corrupted popular composers, no longer attempted to suggest something greater than itself. It was content to be a utilitarian product, a diversion, a hummable tune. God forbid a tune should be hummable. Adorno argued that by reminding the dehumanized masses of their humanity, classical music, classical music, mind you, threatens the capitalist system, and it was therefore this music that was discriminated against and discouraged. But wait, wasn't classical music encouraged by Hitler? And isn't classical music, as evidenced by the symphony halls and opera houses that are proudly displayed in the center of many of the world's cities, fairly well supported by those very same capitalists? If that's discrimination, I'll have some. It's easier to find evidence of the overt persecution of pop music by the totalitarian left. In 1928, the Soviets announced that the playing of American jazz was punishable by six months in jail. Jazz jail. Hip-hop is still an underground phenomenon in Cuba. And until recently, pop music was narrowly circumscribed in China. The government of the former East Germany was worried about the subversive influence of rock and roll, so they attempted to inoculate their populace by introducing a fake popular dance called the Lipsy. These governments view pop, not classical music, as a potentially disruptive force. While Adorno's musical favorites might indeed inspire a transcendent look toward the stars, it's the social aspect of pop in the streets that really frightens totalitarian governments. Even in the United States, popular music has been banned when it seemed to encourage disreputable racial mixing or unwelcome sexuality. The Brazilian composer Tom Zé, who has to some extent bridged the elite world of academic composition and popular music, proposes a theory in which, in a weird nod to Adorno, workers are poorly manufactured by the system. In other words, 
the capitalist project aims to create cogs in the machine. But Zhe says that our manufacture is defective, and that our quirks and our innate humanity make us, in effect, damaged goods. We'll never work the way we were designed to. Our humanity is our saving defect. In a way, he's saying that while Adorno might be right about the system's intention, he's wrong about how things actually work out. Zhe and his music prove that we will always fuck the system up in the most beautiful and unexpected ways. The 2011 annual operating budget for the New York Metropolitan Opera is $325 million. A big chunk of that, $182 million, came from donations from wealthy patrons. That these donors should choose to support this music at this institution is, of course, entirely their business. A 2010 Los Angeles opera production of Wagner's Ring Cycle cost $31 million to produce. Broadway shows don't usually cost that much, unless you're talking about the recent Spider-Man debacle. U2's last concert tour budget might be in that range, but those were stadium shows attracting huge numbers of people. And in those latter two instances, the people who wrote the music are still alive, and presumably they get paid a piece out of every ticket sold, which is part of what keeps those production costs up. Wagner has been dead for a long time, so one assumes it's not his agent who is charging the moon and driving up the cost of these ring productions. Granted, it is a four-part epic. The Los Angeles Opera ended up with a $6 million deficit due to slack demand for expensive tickets. Los Angeles isn't known for its arts funding, public or private. The philanthropist Eli Broad and a few others might be trying to change that, but L.A. thinks of itself as a place that makes its own culture and entertainment. It tends to value things according to how popular they are and how much money they bring in. These values are completely the opposite of those espoused by the supporters of high art music. Status in L.A. comes from having a huge hit, not by being seen at the opera. What makes this institution notable isn't the amount of money. Movies, of course, often cost a lot more than $31 million to produce, but the fact that the audience for this production was, inevitably, fairly small, coupled with the fact that the state ended up footing part of the bill. A $31 million movie, a moderate budget by today's standards, has a chance of making back its investment and more, and there's the possibility that it will be seen by vast numbers of people. A new opera production is by nature limited from the start. Most of the time they are confined to one theater. Alex Ross, the music critic for The New Yorker, observes that some opera in symphony seats cost less than those at Broadway theaters, and less than those for some pop music spectacles as well. So any charge of elitism doesn't hold if one uses ticket prices as a gauge. But in general, cheaper tickets are artificial. They're offered at a loss to support the idea that this good and uplifting medicine should be available to all. Like the early museums that were intended to be free for everyone, Private and state funding, in this business model, is supposed to pick up the shortfall. Even with this aid, they often have a hard time covering the expense of running and maintaining these halls, or mounting their productions, as the Los Angeles Opera Ring production proved. In fact, since many high art productions often lose money for their venues, to extend their runs and thereby increase attendance would be to risk going deeper into debt. Is this any way to run a business? Opera companies have been trying to compensate for these unfortunate financial realities by looking for other income sources. The Met has set up satellite simulcasts in cinemas, live high-definition broadcasts of the productions for those who can't make it to the theater. Peter Gelb at the Met has been fairly successful with this kind of thing. The screenings brought in $11 million last year. That's hardly going to make a dent in that $325 million annual operating budget, but every little bit helps. David Knott, one of their board members, echoes the Victorian sentiments when he endorses the simulcasts. If we can't bring people to the opera, let's bring opera to the people. On an outside wall of the new Frank Gehry designed symphony hall in Miami, a beautiful projection screen faces a park with outdoor seating. This area effectively doubles the hall's size and makes symphony music available to those who can't afford a ticket. But is it even right to think of classical music as a business? Or are we to believe it has a higher civic purpose? Even with all that private and governmental support, a lot of symphonies are struggling to hold on to their audiences and make ends meet. In October of 2010, 
The Detroit Symphony Orchestra wanted to require their players to work for community outreach programs, engagement, education, and chamber music services, among other adaptations to the financial squeeze they found themselves in. This would have brought an unprecedented number of symphony musicians into classrooms and art centers. The contract would also allow for greater accessibility through streaming options, CD releases, and digital downloads. The musicians, however, wanted things to remain pretty much as they were, and they went on strike for 26 weeks. Well, have you seen Detroit in the last couple of decades? The symphony lies on the edge of the center of downtown, beyond which lies a wasteland. From the symphony building, one can see empty lots and crumbling abandoned houses, formerly elegant hotels and boarded-up mansions. More than half the city population is left. Few of those who remain in the city center are symphony patrons. The tax base that would normally fund a symphony hall along with private donors isn't there anymore. In April of 2011, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra musicians agreed to the new terms and ratified the contract. Other cities have followed the same pattern. The Philadelphia Orchestra filed for bankruptcy in the spring of 2011. Joseph Swenson, a violinist and conductor, wrote into the New York Times with his thoughts on this state of affairs. The big orchestras have become symbols not only of Western civilization at its best, but of prosperity and the quality of life in the cities which they serve. But these huge institutional orchestras are like imperialist armies that have overextended themselves. Their musicians are overworked, fanatically dedicated, highly trained, and highly paid people. They are confronted with the realities of absurdly limited rehearsal time, an abysmally limited repertoire, incredibly high expectations for consistent technical perfection, and little possibility for anything one could call personal or individual creativity. And what do you get? Well, in addition to very low job satisfaction, you get performances which inspire the phrase, once you've heard one major American symphony orchestra's Beethoven Five these days, you've pretty much heard them all. In his recent books, Alex Ross has been delicately pointing out that a lot of North American orchestras are indeed stuck in the mud as far as their repertoire goes. His unspoken assumption is that some more adventurous fare might draw a younger generation of listeners and keep some of these places from going under as their subscription audience ages into oblivion. I'm not sure it will work, not in those traditional venues anyway. The venues are physically and acoustically made for a particular kind of music and a very specific way of enjoying it. To this end, the New York City Opera that used to be based in the Coke Theater at Lincoln Center tried doing some wonderful and adventurous programming that I really enjoyed. I saw a John Zorn piece there. But the noble intentions of the director may just be swimming against the tide. The three million dollars generated in ticket sales didn't come anywhere near covering the annual $31 million budget for the opera series in that building. They've moved out now, and are looking for somewhere else to mount their productions. These kinds of venues also have a well-established reputation for being staid and conservative, while the programming of adventurous fair in funkier and smaller venues, like Le Poisson Rouge, Juilliard's Merkin Hall, and elsewhere, have, in a limited way, been more successful as far as getting a new generation in the door, to hear something other than pop songs in a club setting. These programmers feel free to mix and match with complete disregard for any idea of high and low music. I saw Tune Yards do a show at Merkin that consisted of Merrill Garbus accompanied by a ten-piece a cappella group called Roomful of Teeth. The walls really are coming down. A little. The Bilbao Effect New concert halls and museums went up like crazy all around the world during the economic bubble. It wasn't the programming that was drawing audiences in many cases, but the buildings themselves. That's what happened when the Guggenheim Museum opened in Bilbao, Spain. Tourists had a reason to visit a place that many had never heard of before. It was truly amazing to behold how a new museum and a Calatrava bridge could change a whole town. The museum recently had a show of Frank Lloyd Wright's work, which had been previously exhibited in New York's own Guggenheim, along with a permanent collection hodgepodge. Not exactly reasons to make a special trip. But people do. The city was a port and industrial backwater that had seen better days. And now the whole town has enjoyed a revival, thanks to high-end culture. 
Other cities tried to copy this model. If you build it, they will come. Based on the Bilbao experience, one answer to the question, what good are the arts, seems to be, they can revitalize a whole town. LA's Walt Disney Concert Hall looks almost exactly like the Bilbao Guggenheim. New York almost built one in Lower Manhattan, a place that hardly suffers from a shortage of tourists. Everybody wanted one. Famous architects drew up plans for wild new edifices in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Dallas, Fort Worth, and St. Petersburg. Alice Walton, an heiress to the Walmart fortune, just opened a massive museum to show off her collection in Bentonville, Arkansas. And Russian businessman in exile Roman Abramovich has funded his girlfriend Dasha's new contemporary art museum in Moscow. This is all fine. If the oligarchs of the world want to build their own culture palaces, symphony halls, and opera houses, and fund the work that goes in them, great. Who could possibly complain? It's their money, and why shouldn't they spend it on what are largely harmless showcases for their newfound good taste? I was surprised to learn that the amount of state support for a place like Lincoln Center, the whole complex of which has an annual operating budget of close to half a billion dollars, is relatively small. Twenty million or so. The place is open to the public, and there are reasonably priced seats for all, but it's still essentially a massive clubhouse for a certain set. Since the crash, most cities know that their hopes for new culture palaces will have to be deferred. But the ideal of a museum, symphony hall, or similar showcase as a symbol of the soul of a city remains potent and popular. A bunch of L.A. museums were given a bailout by real estate king Eli Broad. But not every city has a Broad who can come to the rescue. Nurturing Amateurs in Guadalajara, Mexico, there's a former movie theater called The Roxy that has just reopened as a combination bar, gallery, and performance space. It's a pretty raw, dusty, bare-bones space, but if the walls could talk, they would speak of some pretty memorable days when Radiohead or local punk bands played there. The culturally dispossessed felt welcome at The Roxy. Rogelio Flores Manriquez, who ran it, wrote in a press release celebrating the reopening of the space, Culture is formed by tortas ahogadas, Mickey Mouse, television, advertising, pop music, opera, and the expressions, traditions, and customs that embody and provide a sense of identity to a given community. This inclusive approach to culture can't only make more people happy than the traditional models, but it can act as an insurance policy against all kinds of alternatives. Kids who have nowhere else to channel their pent-up energy often turn it against their own communities, or even against themselves. If they are culturally excluded and don't feel like a part of society, then why obey its rules? We should broaden our idea of what culture is. In Japan, there used to be no word for art. There, the process of making and drinking a pot of tea evolved into what we in the West might say is an art form. This ritualized performance of a fairly mundane activity embodied a heightened version of a ubiquitous attitude, that utilitarian objects and activities made and performed with integrity, consciously and mindfully, could be art. The Zen philosopher Daisetsu Suzuki said, Who would then deny that when I am sipping tea in my tea room, I am swallowing the whole universe with it, and that this very moment of my lifting the bowl to my lips is eternity itself transcending time and space? That's a lot for a cup of tea, but one can see that elevation of the mundane in a lot of areas and daily activities in the East. The poets, writers, and musicians of the Beat Generation were inspired by this Eastern idea. They too saw the transcendent in the everyday, and saw nobility in the activities of ordinary people. This is an almost Cajun view of the arts, that it's all around you if you merely adjust the way you look and listen. Alan DeSanayake tells us that some African societies have the same word for art and play. Even in English, we play an instrument. This attitude toward art and performance is in complete opposition to the Western idea of monuments and great works. It views culture as ephemeral and fleeting, like music. It's an experience, again like music, not an unchangeable fixed image. Music, in this view, is a way of living a way of being in the world, 
not a thing you hold in your hand and play on a device. D. Sinayake writes that art that engages the mind and hands, that is not just passive connoisseurship, can act as an antidote for our contentious and alienated relationship to our own societies. She sees art making as capable of instilling self-discipline, patience, and the ability to resist immediate gratification. You invest your time and energy in your future. This all reminds me of the recent rise of maker culture. Etsy and a host of other popular companies and fairs around the world that encourage amateur creation. There's a growing movement, a real turning away, not just from the passive absorption of culture, but from art and music as mere vehicles for expressing concepts. The hand has been brought back into the lives of a new generation. The head is still there, but there's an acknowledgement that part of our understanding and experience of the world comes through and from our bodies. In some communities, music and performance have successfully transformed whole neighborhoods as profoundly as the museum did in Bilbao. In Salvador, Brazil, musician Carlinos Brown established several music and culture centers in formerly dangerous neighborhoods. In Condeao, where Brown was born, local kids were encouraged to join drum groups, sing, and compose songs and stage performances in homemade costumes. The kids, energized by these activities, began to turn away from dealing drugs. Being malaudrus was no longer their only life option. Being musicians and playing together in a group looked like more fun and was more satisfying. Little by little, the crime rate dropped in those neighborhoods. The hope returned. And some great music was made, too. A similar thing took place in the Vigariu Gerau favela located near the airport in Rio. It had been the scene of a massacre in which a police helicopter opened fire and killed scores of kids during a drug raid. Life in that favela was about as dead-end as you could get. A cultural center eventually opened up under the direction of Jose Jr. and, possibly inspired by Brown's example, they began to encourage the local kids to stage musical events, some of which dramatized the tragedy that they were still recovering from. The group Afro Reggae emerged out of this effort, and, as with the Brown projects in Salvador, life in the favela improved. The dealers left. Their young recruits were all making music. That, to me, is the power of music, of making music. Music can permanently change people's lives in ways that go far beyond being emotionally or intellectually moved by a specific composition. That happens, too. Then it passes, and often something else lingers. Music is indeed a moral force, but mostly when it's part of the warp and woof of an entire community. I visited José Junior's center, and to be honest, the music I heard was not always among the best stuff I've ever heard in Brazil. That's not the point, though. I worked with Junior recently on music for a documentary about alternatives to the war on drugs. Maybe the specific work, the individual song, isn't always what's most important. Maybe it's not essential that the music is always of the very topmost quality, as Keynes insisted. Music as social glue, as a self-empowering change agent, is maybe more profound than how perfectly a specific song is composed or how immaculately tight a band is. In San Francisco, a former elementary school teacher named David Wish became frustrated when the music curriculum was canceled in some Bay Area schools. He started a program called Little Kids Rock that encourages children to learn how to play songs they already like, usually on the guitar. The first thing I eliminated was the canon, he said. No more following the ingrained program that made kids learn Little Brown Jug before graduating to more complicated, often classical pieces. Only the few kids who had extraordinary abilities and stamina or parental encouragement have persevered with the traditional approach. The rest abandoned learning to play an instrument. Another radical thing Wish did was to eliminate the use of musical notation. I have to admit that I do often wish I could read music way better than I do, but I too was thrilled when I first began to pick out tunes and riffs by ear based on the pop songs I loved. That rapid and profound feedback, hearing myself playing something cool that I loved, was exciting, and it spurred me to continue playing. Wish's next innovation was to add two elements that had never even been considered as part of the music curriculum before, improvisation and composition. The kids were encouraged to make up solos, 
and to eventually write their own songs, sometimes alone and often collaborating. Critics complained that teaching kids simple pop tunes was dumbing down their repertoire and would spell the death of classical music, which they'd never discover otherwise. The justification for this argument is that pop music is everywhere, kids will hear it anyway, and alternatives that they might not otherwise encounter need to be introduced. However, this seems to be a fallacy. As one LKR teacher and classical guitar player in L.A. said, rock music turned me on to classical music, not the other way around. Wish showed that most kids have a vast reservoir of creativity, just waiting for permission to come out, waiting for a forum, a context, just like when someone opens a music club, within which their feelings and ideas can be expressed. It seems to me that here is where funding should go. Maybe the most successful music education program in the world originated in a parking garage in Venezuela in 1975. It's called El Sistema, The System, and it was begun by economist and musician José Antonio Abreu with just 11 kids. Having now produced high-level musicians, 200 youth orchestras, 330,000 players, and quite a few conductors, Gustavo Dudamel was a product of this program, it's being adopted by countries all over the world. When Sir Simon Rattle first witnessed El Sistema, he said, I have seen the future of music. This program starts with kids as young as two or three years old, and though they don't play instruments at that age, they begin to learn rhythm and body coordination. There's no testing or admissions policy. All are welcome. The focus, though, is mainly on kids from disadvantaged backgrounds, 90% of the students in the Venezuelan branch of El Sistema are poor, and the program is entirely free. If the kids get to be really good, to the level where they can play professionally, then they begin to receive a stipend so they don't have to miss classes because of work. Of course, this system has a huge effect on the lives of the kids and their communities, far beyond their enjoyment of music. As Abreu says, essentially, this is a system that fights poverty. A child's physical poverty is overcome by the spiritual richness that music provides. When asked if his music program was a vehicle for social change, he replied, Without a doubt, that's what is happening in Venezuela. The kids who might otherwise feel that their options in life are extremely limited are passionate about the program. From the minute a child is taught how to play an instrument, he is no longer poor. He becomes a child in progress, heading for a professional level, who will later become a citizen. Much of the music the kids learn in El Sistema is classical, so I have to temper my bias toward pop music here, as the program has achieved its goals many times over. In the smaller villages, they might play guitars, drums, and a marimba, so it's not all classics, but it's the classical repertoire, the youth orchestras, that are the main focus of El Sistema. Abreu is now retired, but he guided the system through ten administrations, right and left wing, in Venezuela. I'd venture that this non-partisanship is essential to the survival of these programs, as well as the fact that El Sistema falls under the Ministry of Family, Health and Sports, not the cultural or educational departments. This designation might have helped make the program immune to the arts biases that crop up here and everywhere. I know I have some. Hugo Chavez has increased the funding for this program, and naturally he would like to take some credit for its success. But it started long before he was on the scene. But it was smart of him to invest in the future of his country, rather than cutting it off at the knees, like the No Child Left Behind program did to the arts in U.S. schools. As a result of No Child Left Behind's emphasis on test scores, U.S. schools gutted their arts programs by more than half in most states. If Venezuela can find the means to fund music programs, why can't we? A similar program in the UK is called Youth Music, but the kids learn pop, jazz, and rap, not just the classics. In one depressed district, Morecambe, where there had been territorial gang conflict for years, it was suggested that the kids use rap to express their frustrations and to talk about their situation. A local bricklayer named Jack says, When I was 16, I wrote my own songs about my attitude and gun and knife crime and how to stop it. The neighborhoods eventually declared a kind of truce, though tensions remain. But it's a start. In Liverpool, youth music is associated with the Liverpool Philharmonic, 
and has been adopted by a school called St. Mart of the Angels. Peter Garden, the director of the project, said, The percentage of children who improved their reading by at least two levels in 2008 to 2009 was 36 percent. For 2009-2010, it was 84 percent. The figure for mathematics increased from 35 percent to 75 percent. In Northern Ireland, kids have turned away from joining loyalist or paramilitary groups to play music. The effects of these programs go way beyond music and even beyond improving overall academic achievement. Statistics like these really put an end to the argument questioning the utility of learning to play music, and they make a strong case for the importance of the arts remaining part of a school curriculum. Recent programs that nurture creativity don't all focus exclusively on school kids. A program called The Creators Project is funded by Intel, the computer chip manufacturer, and Vice, a magazine and media company. Intel provides funding and Vice decides who gets it. Their support is sometimes thrown to established artists and musicians to help them manifest or realize a project that otherwise would have been beyond their financial and technical means. I recently saw theatrical pieces by Bjork and Karen O oh that were funded by The Creators Project. They're also seeking out emerging and unknown artists, and their pockets are fairly deep. Their support wide-ranging, with projects in China, Buenos Aires, Lyon, and around the CERN Atom Smasher. Significantly, they are supporting artists and musicians who are working on the fringes of popular culture. So while I might have wondered earlier why Silicon Valley hasn't shown support for the arts, here's a big exception. And they're not funding symphony halls or museums, they're funding live shows in warehouses and in other oddball venues. The Future I have nothing against the music performed in opera houses or much of the art in the spectacular new museums that have been thrown up in the last couple of decades. In fact, I like quite a lot of it. The 1% are certainly entitled to their tasteful shrines. And it's their money, after all, and they do invite us to the party sometimes. I wonder, however, if those places and what they represent, along with their healthy budgets, hint at some skewed priorities that will come back to bite us in the ass before too long. I'm not the only one who believes that future generations will view our present arts budgets with bafflement. The slashing of state and federal budgets for teaching music, dance, theater, and visual arts in grades K-12 through will have a profound effect on the financial and creative future of the United States and other countries that are following our example. In California, the number of students involved in music education dropped by half between 1999 and 2004. Participation in music classes, many of which are now no longer available anyway, dropped 85 percent. The other arts have had similar fates, and the humanities have suffered as well. A study done by the Curb Center at Vanderbilt University found that arts majors developed more creative problem-solving skills than students from almost any other area of study. Mike Curb is, among other things, a songwriter and record producer who dropped Frank Zappa and the Velvets from MCA, claiming they advocated drug use. Risk-taking, dealing with ambiguities, discovering patterns, and the use of analogy and metaphor are skills that aren't just of practical use for artists and musicians. For example, 80% of art students at Vanderbilt say that expressing creativity is part of their courses, while only 3% of biology majors and about 13% of engineers and business majors do. Creative problem solving isn't taught in those other disciplines, but it's an essential survival skill. If one believes, as I do, that creative problem solving can be learned and is something that can be applied across all disciplines, then we're chopping our children's legs off if we slash the budgets for classes in the arts and humanities. There's no way these kids will be able to compete in the world in which they are growing up. In his book, Musicophilia, Oliver Sacks described an interesting experiment conducted by Japanese scientists. They recorded striking changes in the left hemisphere of children who have had only a single year of violin training compared to children with no training. The implication of all this for early education in the arts is clear. Although a teaspoon of Mozart may not make a child a better mathematician, there is little doubt that regular exposure to music, and especially active participation in music, may stimulate development of many different areas of the brain, areas which have to work together to listen to or perform music. 
For the vast majority of students, music can be every bit as important educationally as reading or writing. Roger Grafe, who has written about the effectiveness of arts programs in UK prisons, believes that violence, like art, is actually a form of expression. Prisons, he says, are therefore ideal arenas for art creation and expression. Art can serve as an outlet for the violent feelings of inmates in a way that doesn't harm others and that actually enhances their lives. Making art, Grafe writes, can break the cycle of violence and fear. He claims that the remedy for violence is an agency that will defeat feelings of impotence. Historically, religion has successfully done this, and the rise of fundamentalism might be viewed as a reaction to increasing feelings of alienation and inconsequentiality around the world. Making music might act as an antidote to those feelings too, as those cultural and music centers in the Brazilian favelas attest. In those UK prisons, the quality of the work is beside the point, as it was in Brazil. And, unlike religion, no one has ever gone to war over music. However, grant-giving organizations often take the opposite view. Most arts grants focus on the work, rather than on the process that the work comes out of. The product seems to be more important than the effect its production process has. Sadly, Grafe learned that it's hard for many of the inmates he worked with to continue making art outside of prison. They find the professional art world elitist, and its posh buildings intimidating. Without a support system, and with their work being judged by criteria that are foreign to them, they lose the outlet for frustration that they had discovered. Education advisor Sir Ken Robinson points out, that every educational system on the planet was designed to meet the needs of 19th century industrialization. The idea, as Tom Zett implied, was to manufacture good workers. What the world needs now are more creative thinkers and doers, more of Zez's defective humanoids. But the educational system hasn't evolved to do that. As Robinson writes, I've lost track of the number of brilliant people I've met in all fields who didn't do well at school. Some did, of course, but others only really succeeded and found their real talents in the process once they'd recovered from their education. This is largely because the current systems of public education were never designed to develop everyone's talents. They were intended to promote certain types of ability in the interests of the industrial economies they served. Canadian composer and music teacher R. Murray Schaefer originated the concept of the soundscape. The soundscape, as he defines it, can be thought of as our sonic surroundings and involves the study of how that acoustic environment gives us a sense of place. A soundscape that is out of whack, he says, makes us feel impotent. The soundscape of a bureaucratic office building's lobby tends to make you feel small and insignificant. Schaefer's pedagogy begins with trying to create awareness to help students hear their sonic environment. What was the last sound you heard before I clapped my hands? What was the highest sound you heard in the past ten minutes? What was the loudest? How many airplanes have you heard today? What was the most interesting sound you heard this morning? Make a collection of disappearing or lost sounds, sounds that formed part of the sonic environment but can no longer be heard today. Schaefer writes, For a child of five, art is life and life is art. Experience is a kaleidoscopic and synesthetic experience, but once the child is in school, they get separated. Art becomes art and life becomes life. He proposes a radical solution, that we abolish all study of the arts in a child's first years at school. This seems counterintuitive to me. Isn't that precisely when we're supposed to encourage children's creativity? In their place, he suggests, we substitute subjects that encourage sensitivity and expression. He says that the focus shouldn't be on anything specific, but on general awareness of the world around us. This might be admirable, but it seems unlikely that it would be adopted widely. Funding future creativity is a worthy investment. The dead guys won't write more symphonies. And the output of a creative generation doesn't confine itself to concert houses. It permeates all aspects of a city's life. Creativity is a renewable resource that businesses can and do tap into. By this I don't mean that businesses are looking for painters and composers, 
but that the habit of creative problem-solving translates to any activity we find ourselves engaged in. If the talent and skills aren't there, if they're not nurtured, then businesses will be forced to look elsewhere. The arts are good for the economy, and their presence makes for more interesting living as well. Cutting those school arts budgets makes economic recovery harder, not easier. It will leave us with a generation that isn't as used to thinking creatively or in collaboration with others. In the long run, there's a greater value for humanity in empowering folks to make and create than there is in teaching them the canon of great works. Nothing against those great works, but maybe they've been prioritized out of proportion to their lasting value. I have discovered many of them at various points in my life, and yes, they have had a profound impact. In my opinion, though, it's more important that someone learn to make music, draw, photograph, write, or create in any form, regardless of the quality, than it is for them to understand and appreciate Picasso, Warhol, or Bill Shakespeare, to say nothing of opera as it is today. There are some classical works that I do genuinely enjoy, but I never got Bach, Mozart, or Beethoven, and I don't feel any worse for it. There's plenty left to love and enjoy. I have gradually come to appreciate a wide variety of music that didn't have to be forced on me. I resent the implication that I'm less of a musician and a worse person for not appreciating certain works. Sometimes the newest thing on the block is indeed 500 years old, and sometimes the way forward is through the past, but not always. We certainly don't have to stay back there. By encouraging the creativity of amateurs, rather than telling them that they should passively accept the creativity of designated masters, we help build a social and cultural network that will have profound repercussions. I know it's not exactly the same as learning the skills involved in mounting a multidisciplinary work like opera, but I would say, show someone three chords on the guitar, show them how to program beats, how to play a keyboard, and if you don't expect virtuosity right away, you might get something moving and affecting. You as a listener, or as a creator, might be touched in a way that is every bit as deep as you would be by something that demands a more complicated skill set. Everyone knows you can make a song with almost nothing, with really limited skills. The beginner can enjoy that. It's a source of instant positive feedback, and they don't feel inadequate because they're not Mozart. I wish I'd learned to play a keyboard, but I gravitated to where my interests and abilities took me. I didn't take guitar lessons. Over time, a lot of time, I learned a lot more chords, and I began to be able to hear harmonies and tonal relationships. And, of course, I learned a lot more grooves over the years, and how to instinctively feel and enjoy them. I learned these things. I wasn't born knowing them. But even at first, playing only a few notes... I found I could express something, or at least have fun using my extremely limited means and abilities. When I made something, even something crude, I would momentarily discredit and ignore the nagging feeling that said that if I couldn't match the classical or high-quality model, then I was somehow less of an artist. My gut was telling me that what I was doing was just fine. Chapter 10 Harmonia Mundi A quote from T.S. Eliot You are the music while the music lasts. So far, we've covered how music is distributed, how it's affected by architecture, and a lot more. But why do we need music? Does it even matter? Where did it come from? Far from being merely entertainment, music, I would argue, is a part of what makes us human. Its practical value is maybe a little harder to pin down, at least in our present way of thinking, than mathematics or medicine. But many would agree that a life without music, for a hearing person, is a life significantly diminished. Everything started with a sound. In the beginning was the Word, the Bible tells us. We are told that it was the sound of God's voice that caused the nothing to become something. I'm not given to being literal about such things. I doubt that word here means a syllable or an actual utterance. I can more easily picture this word, this sonic event, referring to a celestial vibration than to an actual word. Maybe we could go a step further and imagine that this ancient metaphor reflects some kind of intuition regarding the Big Bang, which one can view as a kind of really, really big sound, 
one that still radiates out from its theoretical beginning, and from which we made our world and all the others. If that was the word God was shouting, then we're all in agreement. At any rate, it seems significant that the chosen metaphor was a word and not a drawing, a text, or even a dance. Though sound could conceivably be, in this scenario, the key to creation, the Big Bang wasn't exactly music. Lots of theories attempt to explain how music first came into being. Some say music originated with the nonverbal sounds mothers make to their children, while others connect music to sounds in nature or animal utterances, or as a means of inducing warriors into a trance state. The musicologist Joseph Jordania suggests that complete silence is often perceived as a sign of danger, so humming and whistling were used to fill those scary empty spaces. The jury's still out on which of these theories is correct, but all agree that music emerged at the same time people did. The earliest evidence we have of early man actually making music dates back about 45,000 years. Neanderthals and other cave dwellers were playing flutes that seem to have been based around what we now call diatonic scales. The diatonic scale is the musical scale familiar to most of us today. Seven notes, the eighth note being the octave of the first one. If you play the white notes of a piano from C to C, you are playing a diatonic scale. One of these flutes was found in Duya Babe, in what is now Slovenia. A Canadian musicologist, Robert Fink, proposes that the notes produced by the holes in this bone flute are the start of a diatonic scale, Do, Re, Mi, Fa. Fink suggests that if one imagines an extended version of the flute, then the rest of the diatonic scale we use could be played on it. Not everyone buys this, but there's strong evidence that the Sumerians, circa 3100 to 2000 BCE, and the Babylonians, circa 2000 to 1600 BCE, used this same scale. A diatonic scale on cuneiform tablets found in Nippur, present-day Iraq, dates back from 2000 BCE. Musical instruments have been found at Mesopotamian burial sites, and pictures of musicians at ceremonies playing lyres, drums, and flutes are on a mural in the tomb of the harpists in Egypt that dates back to 1200 BCE. The prevalence of relationships and intervals between notes that produce fifths, fourths, and sixths on these instruments correspond to consonant harmonies we still recognize. Consonant, in this case, means harmonies that are felt to be stable and settled, while dissonant harmonies are felt to be unstable, temporary, and want to move on to something else. Consonant, according to these discoveries, is what we as humans generally find harmonically comfortable to listen to. And this has led scientists to believe that we might have an innate biological predisposition towards certain musical relationships. The oldest bit of complete written music comes from a tablet found in Ugarit, present-day Syria, from 1400 BCE. It's described as a hymn to Nikal, the goddess of orchards. There are instructions for the singer and for the accompaniment music to be played on a lyre. Other cuneiform fragments describe how to tune the lyre, which is how we know they were using a diatonic scale. To my surprise, some of these hymns even cite the name of the composer. Already some individuals were recognized as being good at this thing called music. What did ancient music sound like? Though we can figure out the notes that the flutes and lyres played, we can either play them or reconstruct them, it's a little harder to know what singers sounded like, or how their songs were structured. Did the singers holler or whisper? Did they sing with chest tones or whine through their noses? Musicologist Peter von der Merva suggests that Mesopotamian singers sang with intense but inwardly directed emotion, somewhat like contemporary Assyrian musicians do. They sing as if listening to themselves. It's a gesture that conveys intensity and implies that you're communicating with your interior feelings, as if the song were a message from someplace deep inside, rather than simply being the manifestation of the ego of the person performing. The implication is that the singer isn't so much a performer as a conduit, a vehicle. There's a pretty direct connection between this kind of singing and contemporary flamenco vocalizing. Not much has changed. There are 9,000-year-old flutes in China that can play scales very similar to these Mesopotamian ones, which begs the question, did we evolve to prefer certain notes more than others?
Have we developed a neurological ear that's predisposed to enjoy the structured sounds that humanity has come to call music? Even infants prefer the harmonies we think of as consonant, and they can distinguish different scales. Infants can also hear what are called relational pitches, which means that you can sing happy birthday to a baby, starting on any note you choose, and if the child knows the song, there's a good chance she will still recognize it. That might not sound so special, but it's actually quite difficult, because the absolute notes will change completely if the singer starts on a different key. The third note in the melody will no longer be A, for example, but what we think of and recognize as a melody will be the same. Machines can't do this yet. They can only compare melodies to an absolute reference. To present-day machines, a song that starts in the key of C is different from one that starts in B, even though the melody might be identical. We have evolved many extremely specialized skills, physical and neurological, that seem to be related to music making. It's something that must be important to our being homo sapiens, and despite cultural differences, musical forms and structures are often shared. We've been asking ourselves why we have this special relationship for a long, long time. What larger patterns in the universe make us gravitate to specific musical relationships and forms? The Music of the Spheres The followers of Pythagoras, around 590 BC, were called acousmatics because they listened to his talks while he remained hidden behind a curtain. Maybe this was intended to help them focus on his words rather than on what might have been distracting gestures. Pythagoras surmised that there might be a divine reason behind our tendency to find specific harmonies and note intervals more pleasant to the ear than others. He pointed out that there were mathematical congruencies behind these notes, a phenomenon he first observed when he passed by a blacksmith shop and noticed that the pings of the various hammers fell along common musical intervals. Why? It was the proportions of the varying weights of the hammers. A 12-pound hammer and a 6-pound hammer produced pings an octave apart. Similarly, a string stopped at three-quarters of its length produces a note that is one-quarter above the octave, the sound of the full-length string. This fourth harmony is extremely common, and we find it pleasant. If the stop is two-thirds the length of the string, then the note is a perfect fifth. A stop at half the length produces a note that is an exact octave higher than the full length of the string. Needless to say, this is somewhat uncanny, spooky even. Why should this be? Pythagoras surmised that the gods generally prefer small numbers, such as occur in these fractions, because simplicity is always more profoundly elegant. Pythagoras was a bit of a numbers nut, so the fact that there were mathematic underpinnings to the most common musical harmonies was very exciting for him. It was like unlocking a key to the universe. He further identified three kinds of music, instrumental, human, and celestial. Music played on instruments by mortals was viewed as a pale echo of the original celestial music, an idea that seems to presage Plato's shadows in the cave metaphor. The celestial music, the music we attempt to imitate, where the divine harmonies emanate from, actually does exist, Pythagoras said, and this music has its source in the spheres that hold the planets. He believed that the planets were attached to revolving crystal spheres. How else could they stay up? And that each planet, along with its crystal sphere, produced its own unique tone as it whistled through the cosmic ether. Hence, the music of the spheres. The distances between the spheres and their planets were, of course, based on a series of relationships that followed these same harmonic and mathematical ratios, or relatively simple combinations of them. So the whole universe, or what was known of it at the time, the stars were thought to lie on these crystal spheres as well, was like a giant mechanical instrument producing a shifting and ever morphing chord as the spheres creaked through the ether. The implication was that all earthly harmonies, the harmonies of all things dead and alive, both inside and out, were all based on those same ratios. This idea lingers still, NASA recorded inaudible electromagnetic signals, not even what we would call sound waves, as the probes Voyager and Cassini passed by a number of planets. Then these signals were processed and converted into sonic vibrations that fell within the range of human hearing. A collection of these sounds was released as an album with the title Symphony of the Planets. It's basically a collection of ambient drones, 
Quite nice ones, too, though Mercury is a little scary-sounding. One online reviewer of these recordings credits the solar system with being a composer of ambient trance music, as if creation were performing for you, he wrote. Not surprisingly, these notes, as Pythagoras conceived them, produced the most divine harmony imaginable, a great cosmic chord that created us and everything else. The sound was so perfect, he said, that ordinary people like you and me couldn't hear it. Pythagoras could hear it, though. It was claimed by his followers that Adam and Eve heard it, too, as God imparted to them the means to hear this perfect chord. Like links in a mystic chain, the Zoroastrians then passed the way of listening down to their disciples. It was said that Moses also heard it when he received the tablets of the Ten Commandments. According to St. Augustine, around 400 CE, all men would hear this sound just before they died, at which point the secret of the cosmos would be revealed, which is very exciting, although just a little late to be of much use. This secret was passed down through the ages from prophet to prophet, although at some point, according to Renaissance philosophers, it was lost. Oops. Pythagoras was convinced that each musical scale, the varieties of that cosmic mode, have profound, specific, and unique effects on people. The hypophrygian mode is one of the many variations of the diatonic scale, where the intervals between notes have been altered. For example, a C scale, all white keys, and a C minor scale are two different modes. According to Pythagoras, a tune in the hypophrygian mode could totally sober up a drunk young man. In his day, the power of music was commonly accepted, and there were music-based healing centers throughout Greece. The notes of the basic scale were associated with the muses, and each tone had its own attributes and temperament. The seven planets that the Greeks could see had associations with the seven vowel sounds of classical Greek, which were also considered sacred. The various names of God were formed out of recombinations of these vowels and harmonies, like Ho Theos, or God, Ho Kyrios, or Lord, and Despotes, which means master and is the root for our word despot. The cosmic harmonies informed every aspect of life, our speech, our bodies, and our state of mind. The weather, the cycles of crops, disease and health. These musical and mathematical correspondences among all things were out there, and the idea was that we needed only to discover them. God, or the gods, put them there, and in the emerging Western tradition, the goal of science and the arts was to decode what the gods had written. The belief that the goal of science is to unearth pre-existing patterns forms the basis of much of scientific practice today. Even in the periodic table of the elements, where all the materials that make up our world are ordered according to atomic weight, there are harmonies. John Newlands, who worked on the table, discovered in 1865 that, at every eighth element, a distinct repetition of properties occurs, a pattern which he called the law of octaves. Newlands was ridiculed, and his paper on the subject wasn't accepted. But when his prediction that missing elements should therefore exist was later proven to be true, he was recognized as the discoverer of the periodic law. Musical relationships, it seems, are still viewed as governing the physical world. The music of the spheres idea is, in slightly altered form, still with us. The astronomer and astrologer Johannes Kepler published his book, Harmonices Mundi in 1619. In it, he proposed that it was the Creator who decorated the whole world, using mathematical and musical harmonic proportions. The spiritual and the physical are united. In a search for these proportions, Kepler first suggested that the varieties of polyhedral shapes, three-dimensional figures made of pentagons, octagons, etc., and each nested inside a sphere and inside each other, might have guided the Creator's plan. Kepler wasn't satisfied with its accuracy, so he looked at the musical and mathematical harmonic proportions. He wrote, The earth sings me, fa, me, so that even from the syllable you may guess that, in this home of ours, misery and famine hold sway. His calculations seemed to imply that the orbits of the planets had some wobble in them, and the resulting vibrato was sometimes unsettling and even discordant. This wasn't good. However, it did seem that they sometimes fell into perfect harmony. And one of these moments, he believed, was the moment of creation. 
Stanley's History of Philosophy, published in the 1600s, shows the musical intervals that would naturally occur on an imaginary string stretched from the highest heaven, through Earth, and via the orbits of the various planets, which included the sun in the midst of the others rather than at the center, as that was where we, on Terra, were thought to reside. The great 17th-century alchemist and scientist Robert Flood made further elaborate renderings. He called the imaginary string the mundane monochord. Mundane refers to the whole world in this case, not to something banal and ordinary. At the top in his drawing, God's hand is reaching in to tune the universe. In both Flood and Stanley's view, seven musical modes, which are sort of the equivalent of scales, correspond to the seven planets. Each planetary orbit and its mode had a character, such as Saturnine, gloomy, or Mercurial, fickle. Each musical key, as it were, was therefore associated with personality traits we might find in our fellow humans. Astrology, the influence of the heavens on our personalities, was in this way being given some scientific basis. This idea of a universe ordered according to musical harmony fell into disrepute and was more or less forgotten for hundreds of years, but recently it has been picked up by, of all people, the movie editor and sound designer Walter Murch. I saw Murch give a talk, and though he did discuss sound in films and his thoughts on editing, what he was really excited about was reviving the idea of cosmic ratios. Murch wondered why Copernicus, who gets credit for proposing the sun-centric solar system, would make such an unintuitive and dangerous statement. A heliocentric system was unintuitive because, from our point of view, it really does seem like the stars and sun revolve around us. It was dangerous because it was assumed that God made the universe the way the church said he made it, earth-centric, and to question God's plan and wisdom was heresy. Murch theorized that the explanation might lie in the fact that Copernicus knew about a Greek astronomer named Aristarchus of Samos, circa 310 to circa 230 BCE, who had proposed his own sun-centric system. Aristarchus even suggested that the moon revolved around the earth, but by Copernicus's time, his theories had been forgotten. Here is Murch's theory of how Copernicus revived Aristarchus's idea. Copernicus visited Rome after completing his studies, where he surely went to see the Dome of the Pantheon, which was one of the wonders of the age. Inside, the Pantheon's ceiling consists of rising concentric circles of concrete coffers surrounding an oculus in the center, open to the sky, and providing the only light. At times, the globe of the sun sits exactly in the oculus, and the five rings of the coffers are inscribed in perfect circles around it. Murch suggests that upon viewing that ceiling, Copernicus put two and two together and sensed that here, in this architecture, was encoded the secret order of the solar system. This sounds very Da Vinci Code, but read on. When Murch superimposed Copernicus's drawing of his sun-centric system over the concentric circles of the Pantheon's dome, it was pretty much an exact match. In the sun-centric system, the ratios, the distances between the planetary orbits, are still not absolutely correct, so we're not in perfect celestial harmony just yet. In the 1760s, the director of the Berlin Observatory, Johann Daniel Titius, published a paper that contained what came to be known as Bode's Law. It proposed some mathematical formulas and constants that, Titius claimed, not only described where the orbits of the planets were relative to the Sun, but also predicted where new planets would be found, and therefore where the next harmony should be. Shades of the Periodic Table One can predict musical overtones in much the same way. It all worked fine until the discovery of Neptune, which didn't fit the pattern. In 1846, Boda's law was therefore abruptly abandoned and thrown into the pile of discarded and lost science. Murch said, So it seemed more logical, to me, to abandon the astronomical unit and just concentrate on the ratios. Once you do that, the formula gets much simpler. It doesn't have to do two things at once. This new formula isn't only simpler, but it's also lost its Earth centricity. Now you can apply it equally to other orbital systems, the miniature solar systems of the moons around Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, for instance, and you find the same set of ratios cropping up. Underlying all the orbits of these moons and planets, there's a pattern of ratios, like the musical ratios underlying a keyboard. 
Just as you are restricted to playing certain musical ratios on many instruments, so it seems to be with the arrangements of these moons. Some systems play or occupy certain orbits, while others are left blank. By playing different orbits, these systems generate a variety of chords. Chords we recognize. If I wrote the simplified Boda formula down on a piece of paper and showed it to music theorists, they would ask, why are you showing us the formula of the overtone series? In other words, Boda's law gives a series of orbital ratios, which are mathematically identical to the common intervals in musical theory. They're primarily variations on what we call the seventh chord, C, E, G, B flat. You might say that the universe plays the blues. We've come back around to Pythagoras and the other music of the spheres and universal harmony proponents. Pythagoras's computations were slightly off and didn't quite match true musical ratios. It was Galileo's dad, Vincenzo Galilei, who figured out the formula that generates a musical scale as we know it. The Renaissance architect, Leone Battista Alberti, said, I am every day more and more convinced of the truth of Pythagoras's saying, that nature is sure to act consistently. I conclude that the same numbers by means of which the agreement of sounds affect our ears with delight are the very same which please our eyes and our minds. We shall therefore borrow all our rules for the finishing of our proportions from the musicians, and from those things wherein nature shows herself most excellent and complete. Alberti went on to develop the formula for perspective in painting, a way of mathematically organizing our vision. Andrea Palladio, another and rather more famous Renaissance architect, used these same ratios in the buildings that he built in the 16th century, which have been emulated all over the world as designed of harmonic, visual, and spatial relationships that are pleasing to the eye. Jefferson's Monticello, hundreds of museums and monuments all over the world, they all owe their proportions to Palladio and to the cosmic musical ratios that he and others believed gave structure to all things. Vitruvius was a Roman engineer and writer, born 70 BCE, whose ideas were revived during the Renaissance, particularly by Daniele Barbaro, who was also Palladio's patron. Vitruvius espoused the ideas of symmetria, symmetric objective beauty, and eurythmia, which is more about arrangement and is subjective and experiential. It was to illustrate a reappraisal of Vitruvius's book, On Architecture, that Michelangelo drew his famous Vitruvian Man, two male figures superimposed upon each other with arms and legs apart, drawn within a circle and a square, elucidating the divine proportions of the human body. Barbaro wrote that what harmony is for the ear, beauty is for the eye, and this was made explicit in Palladio's work. In the Villa Malcontenta, who would give such a name to their house? There's a room that he describes as the most beautiful and proportionate, which is musically a major sixth. This room can be subdivided into smaller rooms, which work out to be a fourth and a major third. The East In the ancient Far East, it was also thought that sound played an essential role in the formation of the universe. In Tantric Buddhism, there's a sonorifice ether called the Akasha, and from that ether flows the primordial vibrations. The Akasha is self-generative, it didn't come from something else, it made itself. But according to Tantric philosophy, this cosmic sound, which is sometimes referred to as Nada Brahman, actually comes from the vibrations that emanate when Shiva and Shakti have sex. It's referred to as the cosmic orgasm, and from it the entire material universe was formed. A little more than a hundred years ago, Madame Blavatsky, who developed a mystical system called Theosophy that was for a while very popular, referred to this nada as the soundless sound, or the voice of silence. Discreet, silent, true, esoteric, and momentous. The idea that vibrations permeate everything is indisputable. You don't have to be a tantric Buddhist or an acousmatic to accept it. The Venn diagrams that contain spiritualist ideas, religious myths, and what we consider scientific fact do indeed overlap. Molecules vibrate at 100 times per second, atoms faster than that. These vibrations produce what could be considered sound, albeit sound that we cannot hear. The composer John Cage said, Look at this ashtray. 
it's in a state of vibration. We're sure of that, and the physicist can prove it to us. But we can't hear those vibrations. It would be extremely interesting to place it in a little anechoic chamber and listen to it through a suitable sound system. Object would become process. We would discover the meaning of nature through the music of objects. None of these divine or ancient scientific theories really explains the why part, why we gravitate to the specific harmonies we do, unless you accept God made it that way end of discussion as an explanation. However, in our world of little faith, we ask for proof. Biology and the Neurological Basis for Music The question then is not only why do we like the harmonies we do, but also does our enjoyment of music, our ability to find a sequence of sounds emotionally affecting, have some neurological basis? From an evolutionary standpoint, does enjoying music provide any advantage? Is music of any truly practical use, or is it simply baggage that got carried along as we evolved other more obviously useful adaptations? Paleontologists Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton wrote a paper in 1979 claiming that some of our skills and abilities might be like spandrels, the architectural negative spaces above the curve of the arches of buildings, details that weren't originally designed as autonomous entities, but that came into being as a result of other, more practical elements around them. The linguist Noam Chomsky proposed that language itself might be an evolutionary spandrel, that the ability to form sentences might not have evolved directly, but might be the byproduct of some other, more pragmatic evolutionary development. In this view, many of the arts got a free ride along with the development of other, more prosaic qualities and cognitive abilities. Dale Purvis, a professor at Duke University, studied this question with his colleagues David Schwartz and Catherine Howe, and they think they might have some answers. First, they describe the lay of the land. Pretty much every culture uses notes selected from among the twelve that we typically use. From one A to another A, an octave above it, there are usually twelve notes. This isn't a scale, but there are twelve available notes, which on a piano would be all the black and white keys in one octave. Scales are generally a smaller number of notes chosen from within those twelve. There are billions of possible ways to divide the increments from A to A, yet twelve gives us a good start. Traditional Chinese music and American folk music usually employs five notes selected from among those twelve to create their scales. Arabic music works within these parameters too. Western classical music uses seven of the twelve available notes. The eighth note of the Western scale is the octave. In 1921, the composer Arnold Schoenberg proposed a system that would democratize musical composition. In this twelve-tone music, no note is considered to be more important than any other. That does indeed seem like a fair and democratic approach, yet people often call music using that system dissonant, difficult, and abrasive. Dissonant sounds can be moving, either used for a creepy effect or employed to evoke cosmic or dark forces, as in the works of Messian, his quartet for the end of time, or Ligeti, his composition Atmospheres is used in the trippy Stargate sequence of the movie 2001. But generally, these twelve-tone acts of musical liberation weren't all that popular, and neither was free jazz, the improvisational equivalent pioneered by Ornette Coleman and John Coltrane in his later years. This liberation became, for many composers, a dogma, just a new, fancier kind of prison. Very few cultures use all twelve available notes, most adhere to the usual harmonies and scales, but there are some notable exceptions. Javanese gamelan music, produced mainly by orchestras consisting of groups of gong-like instruments, often have scales of five notes, but the five notes are more or less evenly spread between the octave notes. The intervals between the notes are different than a five-note Chinese or folk music scale. It's surmised that one reason for this is that gongs produce odd, unharmonic resonances and overtones, and to make those aspects of the notes sound pleasant when played together, the Javanese adjusted their scales to account for the unpleasantly interacting harmonics. Harmonics are the incidental notes that most instruments produce above and below the principal, or fundamental note being played. These ghost notes are quieter than the main tone, and their number and variety are what gives each instrument its characteristic sound. The harmonics of a clarinet, 
whose vibrations result from a reed and a column of air, are different from those of a violin, whose vibrations result from a vibrating string. Hermann von Helmholtz, the 18th-century German physicist, proposed that it's qualities inherent in these harmonics and overtones that lead us to line up notes along common intervals in our scales. He noticed that when notes aren't in tune, you can hear beating, pulsing, or roughness if they're played at the same time. You can hear this beating if you play the same note on more than one instrument, and if they are ever so slightly different, if they aren't exactly the same note, you'll hear a throbbing or beating that varies in speed depending on how similar they are. An instrument that's out of tune produces beating tones when the octaves and harmonics don't line up. Helmholtz maintained that we find this beating, which is a physical phenomenon and not just an aesthetic one, disturbing. The natural harmonics of primary notes create their own sets of beats, and only by placing and choosing notes from the intervals that occur among the usual and familiar scales can we resolve and lessen this ugly effect. Like the ancients, he was claiming that we have an inherent attraction to mathematical proportions. When a scale is made up of fifths and fourths that resonate perfectly and mathematically, this is referred to as just intonation, all is well unless you want to change key to modulate. If, for example, the key or new scale you want to move to in your tune begins with the fourth harmony note of your original key, a typical choice for a contemporary pop tune, you will find that the notes on the new key don't quite line up in a pleasant-sounding way anymore. Not if you're using this heavenly and mathematical intonation. Some will sound fine, but others will sound markedly sour. Andreas Werkmeister proposed a workaround for this problem in the mid-1600s. Church organs can't be retuned, so they presented a real difficulty when it came to playing in different keys. He suggested tempering, or slightly adjusting the fifths, and thus all the other notes in a scale, so that one could shift to other keys and it wouldn't sound bad. It was a compromise. The perfect mathematical harmonies based on physical vibrations were now being abandoned ever so slightly, so that another kind of math the math of counterpoint, and the excitement of jumping around from key to key could be given precedence. Werkmeister, like Johannes Kepler, Barbaro, and others at the time, believed in the idea of divine harmonic proportion described in Kepler's Harmonia Mundi, even while, or so it seems to me, he was in some ways abandoning or adjusting God's work. Bach was a follower of Werkmeister's innovations and used them to great effect modulating all over the keyboard in many keys. His music is a veritable tech demo of what this new tuning system could do. We've gotten used to this tempered tuning despite its cosmic imperfections. When we hear music that's played in just intonation today, it sounds out of tune to us, though that could be because the players might insist on changing keys. Purvis's group at Duke discovered that the sonic range that matters and interests us the most is identical to the range of sounds we ourselves produce. Our ears and our brains have evolved to catch subtle nuances mainly within that range, and we hear less, or often nothing at all, outside of it. We can't hear what bats hear, or the subharmonic sound that whales use. For the most part, music also falls into the range of what we can hear. Though some of the harmonics that give voices and instruments their characteristic sounds are beyond our hearing range, the effects they produce are not. The part of our brain that analyzes sounds in those musical frequencies that overlap with the sounds we ourselves make is larger and more developed, just as the visual analysis of faces is a specialty of another highly developed part of the brain. The Purvis group also added to this the assumption that periodic sounds, sounds that repeat regularly, are generally indicative of living things, and are therefore more interesting to us. A sound that occurs over and over could be something to be wary of, or it could lead to a friend, or a source of food or water. We can see how these parameters and regions of interest narrow down toward an area of sounds similar to what we call music. Purvis surmised that it would seem natural that human speech therefore influenced the evolution of the human auditory system, as well as the part of the brain that processes those audio signals. Our vocalizations and our ability to perceive their nuances and subtlety co-evolved. It was further assumed that our musical preferences evolved along the way as well. Having thus stated what might seem obvious, the group began their examination to determine if there was indeed any biological rationale for musical scales. 
The group recorded 10 to 20 second sentences by 600 speakers of English and other languages, Mandarin notably, and broke those into 100,000 sound segments. Then they digitally eliminated from those recordings all the elements of speech that are unique to various cultures. They performed a kind of language and culture extraction. They sucked all of it right out, leaving only the sounds that are common to us all. It turns out that, sonically, much of the material that was irrelevant to their study were the consonants we use as part of our languages, the sounds we make with our lips, tongues, and teeth. This left only the vowel sounds, which are made with our vocal cords, as the pitched vocal sounds that are common among humanity. No consonants are made using the vocal cords. They eliminated all the S sounds, the percussive sounds from the P's, and the clicks from the K's. They proposed that they would be left with universal tones and notes common, having stripped away enough extraneous information so that everyone's utterances would now be some kind of proto-singing, the vocal melodies that are embedded in talking. These notes, the ones we sing when we talk, were then plotted on a graph representing how often each note occurred, and sure enough, the peaks, the loudest and most prominent notes, pretty much all fell along the twelve notes of the chromatic scale. In speech and normal singing, these notes or tones are further modified by our tongues and palates to produce a variety of particular harmonics and overtones. A pinched sound, an open sound. The folds in the vocal cords produce characteristic overtones too. These and the others are what help identify the sounds we make as recognizably human, as well as contributing to how each individual's voice sounds. When the Duke group investigated what these overtones and harmonics were, they found that these additional pitches fell in line with what we think of as pleasing musical harmonies. Seventy percent were bang-on musical intervals, he continued. All the major harmonic intervals were represented, octaves, fifths, fourths, major thirds, and a major sixth. There's a biological basis for music, and that biological basis is the similarity between music and speech, said Purvis. That's the reason we like music. Music is far more complex than the ratios of Pythagoras. The reason doesn't have to do with mathematics. It has to do with biology. I might temper this a little bit by saying that the harmonics our palates and vocal cords create might come into prominence because, like Archimedes' vibrating string, any sound-producing object tends to privilege that hierarchy of pitches. That math applies to our bodies and vocal cords as well as strings, though Purvis would seem to have a point when he says that we have tuned our mental radios to the pitches and overtones that we produce in both speech and music. Music and Emotion Purvis took his interpretation of the data his team gathered one step further. In a 2009 study, they attempted to see if happy, excited as they call it, speech results in vowels whose pitches tend to fall along major scales, while sad, subdued speech produces notes that tend to fall along minor scales. Bold statement. I would have thought that such major minor emotional connotations must be culturally determined, given the variety of music around the world. I remember during one tour, when I was playing music that incorporated a lot of Latin rhythms, some mainly Anglo-Saxon audiences and critics thought it was all happy music because of the lively rhythms. There may also have been an insinuation that the music was therefore more lightweight, but we'll leave that bias aside. Many of the songs I was singing were in minor keys, and to me they had a slightly melancholy vibe, albeit offset by those lively syncopated rhythms. Did the happiness of the rhythms override the melancholy melodies for those particular listeners? Apparently so, as many of the lyrics of salsa and flamenco songs, for example, are tragic. This wasn't the first time this major, happy, minor, sad correspondence had been proposed. According to the science writer Philip Ball, when it was pointed out to musicologist Derek Cook that Slavic and much Spanish music use minor keys for happy music, he claimed that their lives were so hard that they didn't really know what happiness was anyway. In 1999, musical psychologists Ball, Quill, and Thompson conducted an experiment at York University that attempted to test how culturally specific these emotional cues might be. 
They asked Western listeners to evaluate Navajo and Hindustani music and say whether it was happy or sad, and the results were pretty accurate. However, as Ball points out, there were other clues, like tempo in timber, that could have been giveaways. He also says that prior to the Renaissance in Europe, there was no connection between sadness and minor keys, implying that cultural factors can override what might be somewhat weak, though real, biological correlations. It does seem likely that we would have evolved to be able to encode emotional information into our speech in nonverbal ways. We can instantly tell from the tone of someone's voice whether he or she is angry, happy, sad, or putting up a front. A lot of the information we get comes from emphasized pitches, which might imply minor or major scales, spoken melodies, and the harmonics and timbre of the voice. We get emotional clues from these qualities just as much as from the words spoken. That those vocal sounds might correspond to musical scales and intervals, and that we might have developed melodies that have roots in those speaking variations, doesn't seem much of a leap. You feel me? In a UCLA study, neurologists Ishtvan molnar Sokach and Katie Overy watched brain scans to see which neurons fired while people in monkeys observed other people in monkeys perform specific actions or experience specific emotions. They determined that a set of neurons in the observer mirrors what they saw happening in the observed. If you're watching an athlete, for example, the neurons that are associated with the same muscles the athlete is using will fire. Our muscles don't move, and sadly there's no virtual workout or health benefit from watching other people exert themselves, but the neurons do act as if we are mimicking the observed. This mirror effect goes for emotional signals as well. When we see someone frown or smile, the neurons associated with those facial muscles will fire. But, and here's the significant part, the emotional neurons associated with those feelings fire as well. Visual and auditory clues trigger empathetic neurons. Corny but true. If you smile, you will make other people happy. We feel what the other is feeling. Maybe not as strongly or as profoundly, but empathy seems to be built into our neurology. It has been proposed that this shared representation, as neuroscientists call it, is essential for any type of communication. The ability to experience a shared representation is how we know what the other person is getting at, what they're talking about. If we didn't have this means of sharing common references, we wouldn't be able to communicate. It's sort of stupidly obvious. Of course we feel what others are feeling, at least to some extent. If we didn't, then why would we ever cry at the movies or smile when we heard a love song? The border between what you feel and what I feel is porous. That we are social animals is deeply ingrained and makes us what we are. We think of ourselves as individuals, but to some extent, we aren't. Our very cells are joined to the group by these evolved empathic reactions to others. This mirroring isn't just emotional, it's social and physical too. When someone gets hurt, we feel their pain, though we don't collapse in agony. And when a singer throws back his head and lets loose, we understand that as well. We have an interior image of what he's going through when his body assumes that shape. We anthropomorphize abstract sounds too. We can read emotions when we hear someone's footsteps. Simple feelings, sadness, happiness, and anger are pretty easily detected. Footsteps might seem an obvious example, but it shows that we connect all sorts of sounds to our assumptions about what emotion, feeling, or sensation generated that sound. The UCLA study proposed that our appreciation and feeling for music is deeply dependent on mirror neurons. When you watch, or even just hear, someone play an instrument, the neurons associated with the muscles required to play that instrument fire. Listening to a piano, we feel those hand and arm movements, and as any air guitarist will tell you, when you hear or see a scorching solo, you are playing it too. Do you have to know how to play the piano to be able to mirror a piano player? Dr. Edward W. Large at Florida Atlantic University scanned the brains of people with and without music experience as they listened to Chopin. As you might guess, the mirror neuron system lit up in the musicians who were tested, but somewhat surprisingly, they flashed in non-musicians as well. So, playing air guitar isn't as weird as it sometimes seems. 
The UCLA group contends that all of our means of communication, auditory, musical, linguistic, visual, have motor and muscular activities at their root. By reading and intuiting the intentions behind those motor activities, we connect with the underlying emotions. Our physical state and our emotional state are inseparable. By perceiving one, an observer can deduce the other. People dance to music as well, and neurological mirroring might explain why hearing rhythmic music inspires us to move, and to move in very specific ways. Music, more than many of the arts, triggers a whole host of neurons. Multiple regions of the brain fire upon hearing music, muscular, auditory, visual, linguistic. That's why some folks who have completely lost their language abilities can articulate a text when it's sung. Oliver Sacks wrote about a brain-damaged man who discovered that he could sing his way through his mundane daily routines, and only by doing so could he remember how to complete simple tasks, like getting dressed. Melodic intonation therapy is the name for a group of therapeutic techniques that were based on this discovery. Mirror neurons are also predictive. When we observe an action, posture, gesture, or a facial expression, we have a good idea, based on our past experience, what's coming next. Some on the Asperger spectrum might not intuit all those meanings as easily as others, and I'm sure I'm not alone in having been accused of missing what friends thought were obvious cues or signals. But most folks catch at least a large percentage of them. Maybe our innate love of narrative has some predictive, neurological basis. We have developed the ability to be able to feel where a story might be going. Ditto with a melody. We might sense the emotionally resonant rise and fall of a melody, a repetition, a musical build, and we have expectations, based on experience, about where those actions are leading. Expectations that will be confirmed or slightly redirected, depending on the composer or performer. As cognitive scientist Daniel Levitin points out, too much confirmation, when something happens exactly as it did before, causes us to get bored and to tune out. Little variations keep us alert, as well as serving to draw attention to musical moments that are critical to the narrative. These emotional connections might help explain why music has such a profound effect on our psychological well-being. We can use music, or for better or worse, others can use it, to regulate our emotions. We can pump ourselves or others up, or calm others or ourselves down. We can use music to help integrate ourselves with a team, to act in concord with a group. Music is social glue. It holds families, nations, cultures, and communities together. But it can tear them apart as well. As much as music sometimes seems to be a force for good, it can be harnessed to swell nationalistic pride and stoke belligerent warmongering too. Beyond these applications for communities and nations, it's also a cosmic telegraph that links us to a world beyond ourselves to an invisible realm of spirits, gods, and maybe even to the world of the dead. It can make us physically well or horribly ill. It does so many things to us that one can't simply say, as many do, Oh, I love all kinds of music. Really? But some forms of music are diametrically opposed to one another. You can't love them all. Not all the time, anyway. Music and Ritual Music features in most religious and social ceremonies around the world. Ethnomusicologist Alan P. Merriam points out that social organization is marked at almost every point in the lives of communities by song. Birth songs, lullabies, naming songs, toilet training songs, I want to hear those, puberty songs, greeting songs, love songs, marriage songs, clan songs, funeral songs. A Sia Indian who lives in a pueblo in northern New Mexico said, My friend, without songs you cannot do anything. Without music, the social fabric itself would be rent, and the links between us would crumble. Ritualistic music has to be repeated in the same way, in more or less identical circumstances every time that ritual is performed. If you get it right, you are, it is assumed, in accordance with the patterns and order of the universe, but woe unto you if you screw it up. According to Hindu scripture, the inaccurate singing of a raga can be fatal to the singer. Apache shamans ran the same risk if they sang off-key. 
In Polynesia, a careless performer might be executed. In the context of a ritual, there's no concept of an original creation of a piece of music, a composer, or a first performance. Such music is thought to have always been there, that it exists outside history, like a myth. Our task as performers and participants is simply to keep it alive. In this sense, music and the rituals it is part of keep the world going. The urge to notate music, especially music that was going to be used in rituals, emerged naturally from a need to get it absolutely right before performing for the gods. The music being played had to be correct, and the same each time. Written music is thus a useful means of maintaining continuity, but it can also stifle change and innovation. The strict ordering of music was originally a byproduct of theocratic and even political control. Written notation is fairly accurate, but it's also imperfect. It's not an exact recording of a piece of music. Lots of expressive, textural, and emotional nuances are lost with any kind of notation. They simply aren't transcribable. However, as long as the written symbols and notes are accompanied by oral instruction and some modeling and physical demonstrations, one can imagine that this ritual music would stay the same and get passed on largely intact. It's presumed to be healing. Spiritual and social agency would be maintained. But if that instructional thread gets broken, if all that's left is the written music, then there will be a lot of guesswork involved and what gets passed down might bear little resemblance to the original. This inaccuracy isn't all that bad for music, but it's not good for serving the interests of the powers that be. For all we know, the sound of a performance of Mozart's music in his time might be somewhat intolerable to our own ears. We can play the same notes, but we have modernized his pieces and many other musical forms so that they are palatable to contemporary sensibilities. Even the instruments themselves have changed. And in many ways, that's what has allowed the music to stay alive and somewhat popular. Similarly, moving liturgical music away from its original Latin, a language almost no one understands anymore, diminishes some of its power and mystery. The church inevitably loses some of its deep cosmic power when the hymns are written in languages everyone speaks. The Great Disenchantment Penelope Goke of the University of Manchester wrote a wonderful essay called Raising Spirits and Restoring Souls, Early Modern Medical Explanations for Music's Effects. By early modern, she means the late 17th century. At that time, a more modern scientific conception of the universe was beginning to take hold. The scientific method, with its experiments and proofs, had, or so they claimed, no place for the music of the spheres and ethereal harmonic spirits. Music was now to be explained by science. It was a symptom of something greater, something scientific that would describe how the physical world works. Music was no longer viewed as the motor that drives everything. It was the physics of the universe that drove music. The universe was no longer enchanted, and music's all-powerful place was usurped by science. Those religious rituals that had provided a reason for music to be written down in the first place began to be looked down on too. The Protestant ethic and the Enlightenment viewed ritual, both social and religious, as superfluous. A lot of rituals were therefore tossed out, and much music went with them. But people like and even need rituals. Humanity's unmet needs demanded satisfaction and people eventually found an outlet in newly emerging secular and social rituals that also involved music. The first public concert was in London in 1672. It was organized by a composer and violinist named John Bannister, shortly after he was fired from the royal band. The price was one shilling, and the audience could make requests. Who could say that music performances, in opera halls, cabaret bars, rock clubs, and outdoor festivals, are not rituals? They all have their own very special sets of prescribed behaviors associated with them. They heal and consecrate community bonds. The ritual was preserved under another name. Visual Culture versus Acoustic Culture Marshall McLuhan famously proposed that after the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, we shifted from an acoustic culture to a visual one. 
He said that in acoustic culture, the world, like sound, is all around you and comes at you from all directions at once. It's multi-layered and non-hierarchical. It has no center or focal point. Visual culture has perspective, a vanishing point, a direction. In visual culture, an image is in one very specific fixed spot. It's in front of you. It isn't everywhere at once. McLuhan claims that our visual sense began to get increasingly bombarded by all the stuff we were producing. It began to take precedence over our auditory sense. And he said that the way we think and view the world changed as a result. In an acoustic universe, one senses essence, whereas in a visual universe, one sees categories and hierarchies. He claims that in a visual universe, one begins to think in a linear fashion, one thing following another along a timeline, rather than everything existing right now, everywhere, in the moment. By blocking your sight, a wall can erase the existence of a man shouting on the other side, but you can hear things happening all around you, left, right, front, and back, even things that are happening behind the wall, like that shouting man. We tend to downplay the influence of some of our senses, especially our sense of smell, partly because it can work on us subconsciously, and partly because we don't have the words to describe the myriad smells that affect us every day. The way we imagine what our senses do is affected by our cultural biases, as well as by the way our language limits our perception. What we refer to simply as the sense of touch actually includes separate sensors for vibration, texture, temperature, and movement, each of which could have qualified as a separate sense, should our culture have deemed them important. The Hausa in Africa identify only two senses, seeing and experiencing. The experiencing sense includes intuition. Why don't we include that as a sense? Emotion, smell, touch, and hearing. The Ivalic Inuit, who live in Northeast Labrador, don't think of space in visual terms the way we do, possibly because their visual environment is almost devoid of features and landmarks. They think of space by referencing their other senses. I read a short piece in the New York Times recently about a nine-year-old named Matthew Whitaker, who was born 23 weeks premature, weighing just under two pounds. He has never been able to see. Every Saturday, he travels to New York from his home in Hackensack, New Jersey, for a full day of music lessons. He plays seven instruments. He hears everything as music, said his father, Moses Whitaker. The fax machine sounds like an A. The copy machine is a B-flat. The jackhammers are making the drum beats that he likes. When the subway rumbles, Matthew taps his cane on the ground to recreate the noise. He hums along with the city, the fast cars and fast talkers. When asked to describe New York, he stands and pivots a full 360 degrees, pointing his fingers in front of him. New York City is a circle of sounds, he says. There is music everywhere. Everybody has a smile on their face. It's musical. It's dark and so beautiful. What Matthew describes is a kind of re-enchantment of the world. Of course, those magical and unexplainable parts of the world didn't just go away. As both Freud and Jung argued, they burrowed into our unconscious, knocking around in there and affecting everything we do, and they emerge from time to time in different forms. This might happen via urban myths, goth-inspired fashion shoots, folk tales, horror movies, Japanese anime monsters, experimental music, or the power of pop songs and the somewhat theatrical and ritualized ways that singers perform them. We're fascinated and drawn to stuff that science can't explain. The transcendent, the uncanny, things that affect us without words. And music both touches on and emanates from those mysteries. It reconnects us to that lost time of enchantment. I think that this semi-mystical sense of the world has also begun to re-emerge explicitly as music over the last 50 years or so. A lot of post-war musicians and composers began to think of music in completely new, or maybe in completely old, ways. John Cage is maybe the most famous of them. He likened his view of music to what was then contemporary architecture. Those modern buildings and houses had lots of massive glass walls and windows, and in Cage's view, this meant that the outside world was being allowed in, was being considered part and parcel of the architecture, instead of being shut out. Compartmentalization, 
the difference between inside and outside, between the environment and oneself, was breaking down. Art, too, was being made of junk from the street. Cage's friends, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, were making art out of everyday stuff, as did Duchamp before them. Couldn't music, Cage reasoned, be similarly inclusive? He answered the question in a fairly literal way, by including street sounds, speech, accidents, and thumps into his compositions. This might not have been what Pythagoras had in mind, but still, Cage was inviting the universe in. Eric Satie might have been one of the earliest to imagine that music could be something more than what it had been relegated to in Western culture. We must bring about a music which is like furniture, a music which will be part of the noises of the environment, softening the noises of the knives and forks, not dominating them, not imposing itself. He wrote some pieces that he referred to as furniture music, which weren't exactly the proto-ambient music you might imagine, but they're pleasant, if fairly repetitious, and soon, as he hoped, one begins to ignore them. This was a radical idea, that you would write music with the idea that some of it might not be heard. But things went further than that. Bing Musio, his real name, of the Muzak Corporation, said that the music his company produced should be heard, but not listened to. At one point, Muzak was the largest music network in the world. It had at least 100 million listeners, or non-listeners if you prefer. Though we don't have traditional Muzak to complain about anymore, its concept was ingenious. Its inventors noted that the efficiency experts who had insinuated themselves into the American workplace were concerned that workers were alert at some points in their workday and, typically, had an energy slump in the mid to late afternoon. The bosses wanted a flat graph, constant and efficient workflow all day long. This brings us back to Ken Robinson and Tom Zez's idea of industrial capitalism as a producer of human machines. The technologists at Muzak thought they had a solution to this productivity problem. They would smooth out those curves using music. Calm music would be played during energetic hours, and slightly more energetic music was programmed later to pull workers out of a slump. People believed it worked. Rather than licensing existing recordings to play in shops and workplaces that subscribe to their service, as is usually done now, Muzak hired musicians to replay familiar songs and instrumental pieces in ways so that the music intentionally wouldn't be listened to. The dynamics, the changes in volume level, and even the higher and lower pitches were ironed out. It seemed as if Muzak had sucked the soul out of the songs, but in fact, they had created something entirely new, something close to what Satie imagined. Furniture music. Music that was clearly a useful and to their subscribers, functional part of the environment, there to induce calm and tranquility in their shops and offices. Why is it that Satie's compositions, Brian Eno's ambient music, or the minimal spaced outwork of Morton Feldman all seem fairly cool, while Muzak is deemed abhorrent? Is it simply because Muzak alters songs that are already familiar to everyone? I think it's something else. The problem is that this music is intended to dull your awareness, like being force-fed tranquilizers. Of course, not everyone objected. Annunzio Paolo Montavani recorded a series of lush, string-heavy albums billed as beautiful music, and he was the first artist to sell a million stereo records. The concept of a musical soporific doesn't work across the board, though. Not every activity is improved by adding a soundtrack. I can't listen to music while I write this, Though I have friends who have music playing constantly in their studios while they paint, do Photoshop work, or design web pages. But my attention is always drawn to music. One recent study claims that analytical work is hindered by music, while creative work can get a boost. I guess it depends on the creative work, and on what kind of music you're talking about. No music. In 1969, UNESCO passed a resolution outlining a human right that doesn't get talked about much. The right to silence. I think they're referring to what happens if a noisy factory gets built beside your house, or a shooting range, or if a disco opens downstairs. They don't mean you can demand that a restaurant turn off the classic rock tunes they're playing, or that you can muzzle the guy next to you on the train yelling into his cell phone. 
It's a nice thought, though. Despite our innate dread of absolute silence, we should have the right to take an occasional oral break, to experience, however briefly, a moment or two of sonic, fresh air. To have a meditative moment. A head-clearing space is a nice idea for a human right. Cage wrote a book called, somewhat ironically, Silence. Ironic because he was increasingly becoming notorious for noise and chaos in his compositions. He once claimed that silence doesn't exist for us. In a quest to experience it, he went into an anechoic chamber at Bell Labs, which was a room isolated from all outside sounds, with walls designed to inhibit the reflection of sounds. A dead space, acoustically. After a few moments, he heard a thumping and whooshing, and was informed those sounds were his own heartbeat, and the sound of his blood rushing through his veins and arteries. They were louder than he might have expected, but okay. After a while, he heard another sound, a high whine, and was informed that this was his nervous system. He realized then that for human beings there was no such thing as true silence, and this anecdote became a way of explaining that he decided that rather than fighting to shut out the sounds of the world, to compartmentalize music as something outside of the noisy, uncontrollable world of sounds, he'd let them in. Let sounds be themselves, rather than vehicles for man-made theories or expressions of human sentiments. Conceptually, at least, the entire world now became music. Others used length and duration to create music that more closely resembled phenomena in the world. In the mid-1980s, Morton Feldman wrote a string quartet that lasts six hours. My whole generation was hung up on the 20 to 25 minute piece. It was our clock. We all got to know it and how to handle it. Before, my pieces were like objects. Now they're like evolving things. Music, in this way of thinking, became a space you inhabited rather than a discrete object. There's a similarity here to the Chinese musical tradition that sees each tone as a musical entity in itself. This is a very different approach from the classical Western view, which says that music is about relationships between pitches and notes, rather than about the sound of the notes themselves. Chinese composer Zhou Wenjun wrote an essay in 1971 in which he seems to agree when McLuhan says that in the West, how things are organized is more important than what those things are. Newer Western composers seem to be moving towards some meeting place in the middle. Their compositions ask us to see music and notes as form, as things, as an environment and a place of deep listening. In a way, this is reminiscent of the cosmic monochord. They have heightened their work by making very little happen. Nothing goes on or changes, often for very long periods of time. The repetition and stasis force you if you don't turn off your stereo or leave the performance, to sink deeper into the piece. It becomes a part of your surroundings, or similar to a natural sound like waves or wind. Things change just like they do in the natural world, but very slowly. In 1977, composer Alvin Lussier made a piece using one string, a monochord. By listening and focusing on different parts of it as it vibrated, one could hear a whole range of sounds when these overtones were amplified via microphonic pickups. Like Lucier, composer Ellen Fullman also works with long, strung wires as her instruments, turning the entire interior of a building into an instrument by running the strings from one side to the other. As with Lucier's piece, she lets the natural overtones determine what the mode or scale will be. In 2005, I, too, turned a building into an instrument by using an old pump organ's keys essentially as a set of switches that activated machines clamped to various parts of a big old industrial space. Motors would vibrate girders, which would resonate according to their length. Little hammers would strike hollow cast-iron columns, and they'd act like xylophones or gongs. Skinny air tubes would blow into the plumbing, which would become like lovely resonant alto flutes. You'd think it would be noisy and industrial, but it was actually quite musical. The general public was invited to play the building via this contraption. Everyone got a chance to sit at the organ and do whatever they wanted. Was this a piece of music? A composition? Who knows? What was more important to me was that this device democratized music. Given that this wasn't an instrument on which anyone could be a virtuoso, the playing field was leveled. Kids who played it were technically as good as trained and experienced composers, 
and even as good as the musicians who sometimes sat at the thing and knew it instinctively. The kid's usual fear and trepidation about playing an unfamiliar instrument in front of others vanished. Like Lucier's wire and Fulman's strings, there was no composition involved in the creation of this music. The music was absolutely determined by its environment and by the players. A lot of this cosmic music has no beginning and no end. It's music that proposes that it exists, like myriad other elements that surround us, as a constant element in the world, rather than as a finite recording or performance. Last year, I saw a performance by composer John Luther Adams. It took place at the cavernous 67th Street Armory in Manhattan and featured, for more than an hour, at least 60 percussionists playing mallet instruments like xylophones and wind effect machines. There was a score of sorts. I looked at one that was resting on a music stand and saw that it consisted of a series of short, unconnected two- or three-note phrases. The idea was to play a phrase, not necessarily in unison with the other players, and then gradually the players would move on to the next phrase. One by one, the players would begin playing the next group of notes on their charts on whatever instrument it was written for. And so on, until everyone reached the end, which was when everyone had exhausted all the little parts. It took about an hour. The result was textural, a landscape, and not melodic. A wash of one kind of sound would surround you, its nature specific to whatever instruments were being played, and then slowly the sound environment would segue into a new texture, as players here and there decided to move on. The audience was free to wander around, and the players were spread all over. There was no stage, and therefore no central focus. I'd compare the experience to watching weather, to seeing clouds build up on the horizon, come closer, and gradually grow darker, take on an ominous texture, and then burst, releasing a torrent of water, and then just as quickly they would move on, and the sky would become clear again. It wasn't like Cage, but it was also a way of sensing and experiencing that the world is music, a composition of sorts, and not a predetermined one. In the 60s, Composer Terry Riley used to give all-night concerts in which he'd create sonic environments by improvising, within strict parameters, to tape loops. The audiences would often bring sleeping bags and doze through parts of the concert. Shades of Bing Musio and Satie with their ignorable music. When Riley needed a bathroom break, he'd let the loops continue without him. Reese Chatham and Glenn Branca created similar soundscapes for massed guitars, Wonderful experiences that evoke the thrum of a highway overpass or a steel foundry. In 2006, I saw the band Sun, who theatricalized this experience. They played a concert in a former church. Their music consists of monstrously loud drones that swell and roll over the audience while the performers stand with their guitars in front of a wall of stacked guitar amps, dressed as a group of hooded druids. There are no drums and no songs, not as we know them. Ritual was back, or maybe it never went away. The sound of sun is amazing. The beautiful dark side of ambience. Self-organizing music. Maybe there's a logical end to the path I'm going down here. If music is inherent in all things and places, then why not let music play itself? The composer, in the traditional sense, might no longer be necessary. Let the planets and spheres spin. Musician Bernie Krauss has just come out with a book about biophony, the world of music and sounds made by animals, insects, and the non-human environment. Music made by self-organizing systems means that anyone or anything can make it, and anyone can walk away from it. Cage said the contemporary composer resembles the maker of a camera who allows someone else to take the picture. That's sort of the elimination of authorship, at least in the accepted sense. He felt that traditional music, with its scores that instruct which notes should be played and when, are not reflections of the processes and algorithms that activate and create the world around us. The world indeed offers us restricted possibilities and opportunities, but there are always options, and more than one way for things to turn out. He and others wondered if maybe music might partake of this emergent process. A small device made in China takes this idea one step further. 
The Buddha machine is a music player that uses random algorithms to organize a series of soothing tones and thereby create never-ending, non-repeating melodies. The programmer who made the device and organized its sounds replaces the composer, effectively leaving no performer. The composer, the instrument, and the performer are all one machine. These aren't very sophisticated devices, though one can envision a day when all types of music might be machine-generated. The basic, commonly used patterns that occur in various genres could become the algorithms that guide the manufacture of sounds. One might view much of corporate pop and hip-hop as being machine-made. Their formulas are well-established, and one need only choose from a variety of available hooks and beats, and an endless recombinant stream of radio-friendly music emerges. Though this industrial approach is often frowned on, its machine-made nature could just as well be a compliment. It returns musical authorship to the ether. All these developments imply that we've come full circle. We've returned to the idea that our universe might be permeated with music. I welcome the liberation of music from the prison of melody, rigid structure, and harmony. Why not? But I also listen to music that does adhere to those guidelines. Listening to the music of the spheres might be glorious, but I crave a concise song now and then, a narrative or a snapshot more than a whole universe. I can enjoy a movie or read a book in which nothing much happens, but I'm deeply conservative as well. If a song establishes itself within the pop genre, then I listen with certain expectations. I can become bored more easily by a pop song that doesn't play by its own rules than by a contemporary composition that is repetitive and static. I like a good story, and I also like staring at the sea. Do I have to choose between the two? The End You've been listening to How Music Works by David Byrne, narrated by Andrew Garman, with an introduction narrated by the author and directed by Teresa Buchheister. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends The One, The Life and Music of James Brown by R.J. Smith, narrated by Kevin R. Free. Playing 350 shows a year at his peak with more than 40 billboard hits, James Brown was a dazzling showman who transformed American music. His life offstage was just as vibrant, but until now no biographer has delivered a complete profile. The One draws on interviews with more than a hundred people who knew Brown personally or played with him professionally. Using these sources, award-winning writer R.J. Smith draws a portrait of a man whose twisted and amazing life helps us to understand the music he made. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So visit us at recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.